period, Minister for Primary Industry from 1975 to 1979, Minister for Special Trade Representations in 1980, Minister for Communications from 1980 to 1982, and Minister for Defence, and a very good Minister for Defence, as well as his Thanks, husbandry of the other portfolios in uh, 82 and 83. That is an extraordinary ministerial record. It means that uh, not only does the new speaker have an encyclopedic knowledge of the process of government, he certainly does of the process of this parliament. And that is why I have absolute confidence in his capability of carrying forward the challenges faced as the new speaker. I uh, believe that uh, uh, it will be in a way which will see uh, the uh, electorate of New England fully covered uh, uh, as it stretches from Tamworth to Tetterfield and beyond, uh, as well as carrying out these duties uh, as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Let me just say one other thing, uh, Mr Speaker. The business of government, of course, does go on. And so about 12 noon today, I will trade, uh, table the trade outcomes and objective statement, the second of those statements, uh, which is done in the first parliamentary sitting week of each year. And I have every confidence that under your stewardship, the business of the House of Representatives, including question time, will uh, flow forward in, under your capable uh, jurisdiction as the new Speaker of this House of Representatives. I convey congratulations to Rosemary and to members of the family uh, present here today. I convey congratulations to the National Party branches throughout uh, Northern New South Wales, who I know will be particularly delighted this day with this decision of the House of Representatives, and we wish you well, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I call on uh, Mr Jenkins, the Honourable Member for Scullin. Mr Speaker, Sinclair. As the defeated candidate, can I congratulate you? May I say that the result of the ballot was not unexpected. <laughs> One of your predecessors, who I have from time to time had conversations about the role of Speaker, has reminded me that the Speakership can be a very lonely job. And I can assure you that he was of the belief that it was now one against 147. So I hope that the 87 who voted for you might give you some cooperation. It has also been alluded that uh, you, because of your vast experience in this place, uh, not only in government but in opposition, know most of the tricks of the trade. So for us that uh, perhaps are trying to give you a headache or to test you, we will be, uh, have to be on our mettle to get around your knowledge. Can I also say that it uh, will be my pleasure to serve you as I've served others as the second deputy speaker. And I hope that you will excuse me in making some comments about the Honourable Member for Casey. The Honourable Member for Casey, as Speaker Halverson, brought his own personal style and great dignity to the office of Speaker. For that, he has my great admiration, and it was my pleasure to be able to serve him as the second Deputy Speaker, and I wish him all the best in the future. But to you, Ian, I think that you have the respect of the whole of this chamber. But that respect, you will understand, will often be tested in the hurly-burly of debate, and I know that you will allow that debate to continue within the standing orders, but in a robust manner. The Honourable the, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, for the great and enormous pleasure that I address you for the first time as Mr Speaker. I just wanted to say to you congratulations. It's a very high office. I'm very delighted that you will have question time today, after yesterday, <laughs> and I have to also say that, uh, like Second Deputy Speaker Jenkins, I have uh, enjoyed serving with the former Speaker, Member for Casey, Speaker Halverson. We had a, a very good relationship. I know that relationship will extend between you and me, Harry Jenkins, and the other members of the Speaker's panel. I'm delighted that you are sitting in that chair. Wish you well and congratulations. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the House. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I add my words of congratulation to your election today? Um, you are a person of very great merit, and your appointment reflects the high regard in which you are held by uh, members of the parliament. I first met you uh, when I was a new member, you and Rosemary, on a trip to Israel, of all places, when we went round in a bus for 10 days. And, um, I suppose then that was my first real personal experience of someone who had such a wide understanding and experience of government. And 
I'd have to say I, 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 I remember some of the appointments and as a new member I was keen and eager to understand the diplomatic subtleties and niceties of the issues. Um, I'd have to say, Mr Speaker, I don't think you read any of the minutes, any of the briefing notes, but you would handle those meetings with such a plomb, with such experience and such a tremendous knowledge of the, the politics, the economics uh, and the broader issues that uh, from that moment on I knew that uh, you were a person of uh, tremendous stature and someone, as all new members uh, to you, as they all are in this House, have uh, learnt by experience. So I congratulate you uh, on, that, uh, on the appointment, on the election, and look forward uh, to your speakership. Mr uh, Speaker, I was also at that function, that uh, celebration of your, what, 30 years, and it is true that the Leader of the Opposition gave a good speech. But I have to say that I qualified my remarks uh, in as much as he gave a good speech because he thought you were definitely going. <laughs> and that, that, is, you know, that is the fact. And, and even today, whilst uh, they laud your election, uh, the, the reality is, Mr Speaker, they also, they, also qualify, they also qualify their remarks by saying that they will keep you, keep you, on, uh, you know, on notice. And, Mr Speaker, that is no surprise because uh, whilst many uh, positive things are said, I'd have to say, in respect of the Labor Party, uh, these are occasions where uh, words of commendation are made, but I must say, for one, I, don't I do not allow the past to be forgotten. And I'd have to say, I'd have to say Mr Speaker, I hear, I hear the Labor Party, I hear the Labor Party say positive things. But in the time that I was first here, Mr. Speaker, they pursued you. They pursued you, and there is a stain of slander still on the hands of the Labor Party. And your and their words today uh, should be taken uh, with a memory of what they have on the public record in the past. And, Mr. Speaker, when the Labor Party talks about uh, a, the nomination of uh, the member for Scullin and uh, suggest that they would support a speaker of the independence of Betty Boothroyd, I must say that is a sick joke coming from the Labor Party. I mean, sitting on the back benches is none other than Leo McClay, a former speaker. You only have to say the name to remind people of the depths to which you know, parliamentary standards fell when he was uh, speaker. And further, further, Mr Speaker, uh, in all of these, uh, in all the appointments of Speaker in the time that I've been here, when Labor was, uh, when Labor had the numbers, it was always put on the basis A little that the more new, quiet, that it was always put on the basis by the Labor Party that the new Speaker would set new standards. The new Labor Speaker would set new standards, and I just take out a few uh, clippings to record the the standard treatment of speakers under Labor. They start with, we're going to clean up the act. So back in May 93, the then new speaker, uh, the member for Cunningham, the headline was cleaning up the bear pit. That was in May 93, uh, just after the, uh, that election. By July, we had a headline, speaker's staffer works in ALP headquarters. By the time we get to August, it's the speaker apologises for dumping on Peacock. And by the time we get into early 1994, the headlines are House in uproar as Speaker loses grip. Uh, in, the same, uh, in the same month, we had disorder in the House, uh, followed by, into the next year, hubris and Mr Keating. And this is the, this is, people should not forget the history of the treatment of the Labor Party of Speakers. This is an editorial in 1995. It will come as a surprise to most people that the Prime Minister's image as a parliamentary head kicker is due to the inability of the Speaker to control the federal parliament. Apparently, Mr Keating told the Labor caucus on Tuesday, by way of explaining away the government's devastating performance in the Canberra by-election, that the problems with his style are related to the conduct of question time. Parliament, he told caucus, is not run like a professional organisation by the Speaker. So there they were, attacking the Speaker on another headline, just to finish it off, as, again, typical of the way you've treated Speakers. Don't you, tell, don't you lecture us about the independence of Speakers and the, 
proper treatment of speakers. As this, head, as this, headline, Mr. As this headline, Mr. Speaker, you will remember Keating accused of intimidation of speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, you will make a great speaker because you are a person of experience, you are a person of integrity, and you are well regarded and highly respected in this place. I wish you well in your acceptance of the nomination, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as uh, uh, Speaker, you do honour to this place and to our traditions. To the Prime Minister, to the Leader of the Opposition, to all members of this chamber, can I extend my thanks? It's an interesting post for me to assume, for so long as the Leader of the Opposition has suggested, having been a protagonist in this place, it's somewhat different to be sitting here to arbitrate. I confess that uh, I come with mixed feelings as one who loved the old place, as one who, with my uh, Sancho Panza, enjoyed uh, the venue for the course of the Constitutional Convention, I can say to you all that it would be my hope that we could bring to this chamber some of the magic that existed for so long down there. It was a place where personal debate and policy debate, I think, was of a far higher order, and regrettably it is often achieved in this place. And I shall do what I can to ensure that we can meet those old standards. Can I say individually to the Honourable Member for Wakefield and to the Honourable Member for Richmond, who nominated and seconded me, my thanks for your kind and generous remarks. Larry Anthony, like Kim Beasley, came here uh, in spite of themselves in days when uh, their fathers brought them, and each had uh, a very distinguished entry into federal politics through the very significant service their parents gave. And I count it a great honour to have uh, known both their parents and have worked with them. Can I say to my predecessor, the Honourable Member Casey and Speaker Halverson, we've had a great relationship. I regard you highly, Bob. I think you are a very fine Australian. You have served your country with distinction as you served this parliament. And I shall try to bring to it the dignity that you showed on all occasions. So all gentlemen and ladies, I thank you for the support you've given me and assure you I will do my best to maintain the high standards which I believe should be set in the National Parliament of Australia. The sitting is adjourned until the ring of the bells. Oh, sorry, I've got a call on. I beg your pardon. That it will be His Excellency the Governor General's pleasure to receive you, Mr. Speaker, in the Chamber precincts at 11:05 a.m. this day. The sitting is suspended until 11:15 a.m. and the main committee will also meet at that hour. Thank you.
I have to report that I presented myself to His Excellency the Governor-General as the choice of the House as its Speaker, and that His Excellency was kind enough to congratulate me. His Excellency also presented to me an authority to administer to members the oath or, of, or affirmation of allegiance, and I now lay that authority on the table. You might well wish to question it. I can understand. Pursuant to Standing Order 18, I lay on the table my warrant, uh, nominating the honourable members for Lyons, Menzies, Prospect, the Northern Territory, Mallee, Throsby, Dawson, Greenway, Franklin and Bendigo to be members of the Speaker's panel to assist the Chair when requested to do so by the Speaker or Deputy Speaker. I I better sign it first, it'd probably help. Mr. Clark. This is order of the day number one, manage investments bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I call on the honourable member for Bradfield in continuation. And, uh, congratulations on your well-deserved appointment. Uh, in continuing my remarks on the Managed Investments Bill, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, bring to the House's attention some comments on the government's moves to streamline uh, the management of uh, funds. Three uh, remarks in particular from the General Manager of uh, Managed Investments for GIO Australia, which of course is not a small organisation, nor one that is uh, held in uh, low regard in the industry. And to quote Mr Hamilton, he says of GIO, we are pleased with the government's announcement to go ahead with the collective investments review legislation. This will enable large fund managers such as GIO Australia to efficiently combine the operation of their superannuation and non-superannuation businesses. We are able to care for unit trust monies in the same professional way as superannuation and insurance monies. And that, of course, is a specific intent of the bill. We are very conscious of our fiduciary duties, and this is a very competitive industry. We look forward to the speedy implementation of the collective investments legislation so that we can provide our unit trust investors with a similar level of protection and cost as our other investors receive. We estimate our unit trust investors will achieve increased returns as a result of cost savings from trustee fees no longer payable under the proposed reforms. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, the Investment Funds Association of Australia supports uh, what the government is, is trying to do, but uh, I think it's worth drawing the attention of the House to some specific remarks that have been made by its executive director, uh, Mr Richard Gilbert. And Mr Gilbert, as I uh, reminded the House last night, has told us of the uh, people who were on the Australian uh, Law Review uh, Committee review, Commission review in the early 90s. Uh, Don Argus, Mark Burrows, Alan Cameron, Tony Hartnell, Jim Armitage, Justice Elizabeth Evatt and Justice John uh, Von Dusser. And As Mr Gilbert uh, told The Australian on 14 October last year, the focus of these uh, uh, inspiring and high achievers in uh, investment management and financial management was their focus on how a better system could be set up to avoid multi-million dollar fund failures such as Estate Mortgage and Ostwide. They formulated the concept of the single uh, responsible entity. The system of regulation for non-super investments is the same as that which was in place at the time of these fund failures. And of course, the ALRC was trying to make some remarks and in, uh, upon that uh, system that was in place and some improvements to it. And they said at the time that the law requires each scheme to have a manager and a trustee or investor's representative but it is far from clear which of them is responsible for which aspect of the scheme's operation. And that not only leads to unnecessary confusion, it's also inflexible, it encourages unsatisfactory commercial practices and sometimes results in neither taking responsibility for compliance with the law because each can blame the other. Interestingly, the single responsible entity concept is almost identical to that which trustee companies work under in holding monies for beneficiaries. Some of the trustee common funds operate as SREs and have sought Australian Securities Commission exemptions to do just this by removing the manager. But banks which operate CMTs have to operate with a dual structure. Mr Gilbert uh, went on to say, and I quote, similarly some of the trustee companies have been known to operate superannuation funds as SREs 
not even using a custodian. Now, under the government's reforms, the SRE or trustee of other people's monies will have clear statutory obligations, harsh penalties for non-compliance and independent directors or an independent compliance committee. As well as this, each SRE will need to prove that it has the operational and capital capabilities to manage other people's monies. And when you have a look at some of the prospectuses which show the level of confusion around the two parties responsible for investment money, you find words such as, and I quote, the trustee has, has had no involvement in the preparation of any part of this investment profile other than the particular references to the trustee and has not authorised or caused the issue of it. The trustee expressly disclaims and takes no responsibility for any part of this investment profile. And for those who are not uh, educated or, or necessarily adept at reading prospectuses, this uh, in fact does lead to a degree of confusion on the part of prospective investors. Under superannuation industry supervision legislation, which had three years of successful operation, the regulatory costs of the ISC amount to $27 million. The costs of custodian services where these are mandatory are similar. In other words, to protect $270 billion, about $55 million is expended. For non-superannuation uh, investments, the costs of trustee expenses amounts to $55 million, spread over a total of around $90 billion. And the question that Mr Gilbert and the IFA have quite reasonably asked is, does three times the expense equal three times the protection? And I'd suggest to the House that, uh, in fact, it, it doesn't. I uh, noticed I made some, uh, in my introductory remarks last night, I said, uh, perhaps with a degree of flippancy, that the more that I had, uh, that, well, first of all, it's important, I think, at times to put your mind around something you may not know a lot about, but that the more that I had been lobbied about this, the more convinced I had become that the government was doing the right thing. And amongst the numerous uh, papers that were sent to me was a a uh, detailed analysis of this put to us by KPMG, and I noticed that they had suggested that something uh, like up to $40 million more would, would be spent in administering the new arrangements that the government's proposing. But when you actually look at it, that's about 0.025 per cent of the total funds that are under management, and that is if you are to accept the, uh, the figures that have been put up by KPMG. And KPMG, in fact, in their analysis, made the observation that, in fact, they, that the information that they were working on had been provided, essentially, words to this effect, essentially by one side of the debate and not necessarily by both. I'd also uh, like to say that uh, the, when, I made, uh, when I make those remarks about the uh, advocacy that's uh, been put to us, uh, in no way is that uh, a criticism, implied or otherwise, of those who are representing the trustees' view in this. In fact, they've done a, an outstanding job in doing it. I'm just not convinced of the veracity of their argument, nor do I think uh, the government nor the House should we be convinced that the present arrangements with the costs associated with them are actually delivering the best, clearest and most understandable uh, recommendations to prospective uh, investors in Australia. What we are doing, we are also told, is out of step with international best practice, that in some way we have to do what the rest of the world does. Well, frankly, when I look at uh, the way that investment funds are managed in other countries and I look at the, the history, particularly in relation to estate mortgages in Australia, I ask myself, well, why can't Australia take the lead occasionally? Why can't we actually develop a system in Australia that is simpler, that makes more sense, that uh, reduces confusion amongst uh, investors as to actually who has a direct responsibility for things. And uh, whilst I have a very high regard uh, for trustees and uh, their activities, frankly I think that, it, that trustees ought to accept the concept of a single responsible entity and uh, in fact do what they can to reposition themselves in the marketplace to become SREs themselves. So I, I very much uh, commend the Bill to the House and I suspect I will now be the subject of even more lobbying. Thanks. I call on the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I uh, find myself in a great deal of agreement with uh, the previous speaker, the honourable member for Bradfield, in respect of uh, this legislation that we're debating today. 
simply because much of what he had to say was the subject of examination by this side of the parliament when in government. And in fact, it was the former Attorney General and my erstwhile flatmate, Michael Lavarch, who in fact had uh, commissioned a study into this uh, important area and had also made some proposals for change. Regrettably, they were not uh, enacted, of course, because of the change in government, but nevertheless we have seen that uh, this government has proposed to bring it forward, but with a, a, a one major difference, and I'll comment about that shortly. But, uh, Mr Speaker, I think it is important also to just remind uh, the House that managed investments are non-superannuation collective investment schemes, that is, where investors pool resources in a common entity, which range from property, equities and cash trusts to ostrich farms and pine plantations. And around $90 billion is currently invested in management investments, with an estimated growth of $20 billion per annum. That's the size of this entity that we're talking about. And the concern I suppose I have as part of that is with my role and responsibility as the Shadow Minister for Small Business, in as much as those investments manifest themselves in um, uh, the arrangement which a number of these funds have entered into in respect of shopping centre developments around Australia. And of course, by investing in shopping centres, we find that uh, they then get caught up as owners, as investors in shopping centres, with trying to see that they maximise their returns, and some management companies that take on that responsibility of trying to maximise those returns uh, for the investor uh, then put the squeeze on many of the small businesses that are in the shopping centres, and as a consequence, many of the problems that we've seen from time to time emerge. Mr Speaker, you'd be aware that uh, in the course of the last parliament, uh, a thorough in the, in the last year, I'm sorry, a, a thorough examination of the difficulties involving small businesses was undertaken by this House, and uh, as a consequence, a report was tabled which touched on this very issue. It touched on the fact that major shopping centres, often because of landlords not doing the right thing, were in conflict with. Uh, the tenants in those shopping centres, and as a consequence of there being a desire to maximise the investment return by many of these corporations that we're discussing in the course of this bill, we found that some of the practices in those shopping centres were not perhaps as certainly the tenants would like. And I think uh, when you when you discussed it with also the corporations that were the owners and the investors who had the running of these things, they would not like to see that continue as well. So, as a consequence of that, of course, we as a, uh, are for investor protection in the, the whole concept of these managed investments, but we're also for the protection of the individual, the consumer, the small businesses that are part of that total subset um, uh, through the investment regime that is put in place. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's also important to say that uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s that there was a plethora of funds available and that uh, they became very much uh, a, in vogue for people to invest money. In the same way as we now have the government trumpeting the success of the float of Telstra, uh, back in the early 80s and uh, or in the 80s and the early 90s, there was also uh, much uh, trumpeting of the success of, of these managed investment schemes. But regrettably, that uh, success that was being trumpeted was not matched by the reality of the circumstances. And uh, as the honourable member for Bradfield remarked, as my colleague, the, par the shadow parliamentary secretary to the Treasury, remarked in his contribution last evening, um, mortgage estate, uh, as an example, was one such entity where the market just fell to pieces and many people were actually, uh, were actually uh, burnt. Now, um, I think that uh, as a consequence of that, the fact that the government now has decided to go forward with this particular bill um, is appropriate because it will offer a degree of investor protection and, as I say, that is something which uh, Labor has supported. Now, it's also important to note in this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the difference that I, I, I mentioned earlier between what Labor did in government 
as brought forward by proposals uh, by the former Attorney General Michael Avarch and what the government is proposing now is that the government is omitting uh, the enforced separate entity, that is separation of responsibility and liability of the people who manage the fund and hold the cash. And the government seems to be looking at a, a voluntary system which puts the onus of monitoring and regulating the funds on the Australian Securities Commission. This certainly is an enormous responsibility and uh, I have to say that uh, it is a responsibility which is being made all the more difficult from uh, a, a compliance point of view because of the fact that the government in, in its uh, quest to balance the books continues to make cuts in, uh, in organisations like the Australian Securities Commission and that its compliance and regulation budget was slashed in the 96 budget. So on one hand you're saying as a government, Mr Deputy Speaker, we believe in protecting investors and we believe in the managed investment bill that we've got into the place, but what we're not prepared to do is to uh, separate that responsibility by having a, an enforced separate entity in place to look after the monitoring of that. Rather, we'll leave it to one of the government organisations, but we'll starve that organisation of the necessary funds to continue the compliance costs and the compliance uh, and regulation functions. So uh, it is with some reservations that we say that the bill is important and is supported by this side of the House, but by the same token we point out that there is uh, this glaring difference between what was proposed by Labor and what uh, the present government intends to, to put in place. The Honourable Member for Bradfield, Mr Deputy Speaker, also alluded to the fact that he had been lobbied uh, quite heavily by different organisations with a point of view to put. Um, he wasn't Robinson Crusoe, I have to say. I suspect most members of this place uh, were subjected to an endless stream of faxes and representations uh, from organisations about the bill. I just have a, a small collection of those in front of me now from uh, equity trustees, from the permanent trustee company limited, from perpetual trustees Australia limited, um, uh, each of these putting a point of view. Uh, and, and in one case, uh, for the, from the Permanent Trustees Company Limited, it talked about the fact that uh, the legislation has the effect of weakening investor protection and been criticised particularly by Standard & Poor's rating agency because uh, um, the new system under which managed investments, uh, in particular unit trusts, were going to be regulated in the way that I've spelled out. And, um, this uh, particular organisation is suggesting that maybe there is a need for a bit more scrutiny of the bill with its intentions before it's actually made into law. In a similar way, uh, there are a number of other uh, organisations, as I've said, equity trustees, says that the bill in its current form requires further scrutiny. The reform of our industry has progressed over six years and it's inappropriate to simply adopt an untested model push it through Parliament with their proper investigation of the impact on Australia's 2.5 million investors. And as a consequence, they are saying there is a need for further scrutiny. Now, Mr, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in itself uh, is uh, perhaps not a bad suggestion. Given the volume of, of, uh, of uh, money that we're talking about that's invested, as I said, around $90 billion currently invested in managed investments, and which is growing at an estimated $20 billion a year, it is not an inconsiderate amount of money. I mean, it is, uh, it is a, a sizable amount of money. And as a consequence of that, it's, uh, it's a fact that uh, people are worried about the way in which the monitoring role in a regulation sense is put in place. Now, some mention was also made of the Wallace Committee report, and Wallace, in investigating uh, the financial uh, systems operating in Australia last year, tabled uh, a report which had extensive recommendations. And uh, the whole concept of prudential standards, prudential regulation, and so on was part of that. Maybe, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a need to refer this bill off to a, a, a committee for examination, a committee of this parliament. Perhaps uh, the concept of, uh, and I hear my, my friend, uh, uh, the in independent member uh, up the back, suggesting that that might not be a bad idea. He is somebody that has had enormous experience in this area and has spoken at length in this parliament over a considerable period of time on issues involving finance. And so when he lends his support to the concept of uh, sending it to the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Securities, then I think we should listen to the honourable member because clearly he does have the concerns that we on this side do. 
I, I would commend that as a recommendation to the government. I've never been one, Mr Deputy Speaker, as you know, that suggests that we simply should push off every piece of legislation to a committee for the sake of it, uh, although I'm a great believer in the parliamentary committee system and have been a, 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 certainly a great supporter of uh, many of the reports that, that, uh, that committee, those committees of this parliament have brought down. I mean, dare I say, the Reid Committee that I mentioned a little earlier when it came to talking about fair trading issues and the relationship between managed invest investors that have purchased shopping centres uh, as part of an investment strategy. I, I, I referred to that a little earlier. There is one case in point where you have an excellent report that the government should have adopted in principle instead of in its watered-down uh, form that it's proposing into this parliament at the present time. But nevertheless, that said, I think from time to time there are, there are pieces of legislation that come before this place that probably do warrant a little bit more scrutiny. And so I would simply, in conclusion, say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it may be in this parliament's best interest and certainly in the interests of all of those thousands of uh, people now that have caught the investment bug that are through managed investment organisations that uh, are taking a punt on the stock exchange or whatever. It may well be in their best interest that uh, this particular piece of legislation be referred to that joint committee as recommended and uh, an examination done, I suspect a, a quick but thorough examination, to see whether there are any unintended consequences about the proposal in terms of prudential supervision and the, and the regulations uh, regarding how uh, the funds are to be supervised. I have no objection in principle to the ASC having that role. No objection whatsoever. However, they've got to be given the funds so that they can sustain that compliance function. And unfortunately, with a government like this that is slashing back horrendously in the bureaucracy, I'm a little surprised that they've actually suggested the ASC have that role. I'm surprised they haven't hived it off and given it to one of the big accountancy firms in this country, but uh, perhaps that's a precursor and perhaps that's not an idea I should put in the minds of the government because the way they are they're, uh, going about uh, running this country at the minute is probably something they would jump at. However, that said, I'd, I'd certainly hope that the government takes into consideration the comments that have been made uh, by the uh, opposition on this matter. Uh, we don't oppose the concept. We're a little bit concerned about the supervisory arrangements. We would like to think that perhaps that aspect can be examined by a parliamentary committee, but at the end of the day, this is not a bill which we will necessarily oppose for opposition's sake. The question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. I call the honourable member for Curtin. Mr Deputy Speaker, as with the, uh, a companion bill, the Company Law Review Bill 1997, also on the notice paper, this bill, if enacted, will bring about substantial changes to the way in which business operates in Australia, in this instance, in the non-superannuation uh, managed investment industry. Given the magnitude of the change proposed in each piece of legislation, I'm, I'm pleased to note that the government uh, had second thoughts about a cognate debate as earlier proposed. The controversial nature of uh, the amendments being addressed here justifies the greater allocation of debating time now afforded, and I will certainly be utilising all the time allotted to me. There are many arguments put forward by those who support the proposed changes to the regulatory arrangements of managed investments, Mr Deputy Speaker, and an equal number from those who are concerned about the nature of the reform. I'll broach these individually in a moment. However, it's imperative that we don't lose sight of the core issues in this debate, and they are, do we need to reform the current regulatory arrangements for non-superannuation managed investment schemes, and if so, are we going about it in the most effective manner? Arguably, the first of these questions is the more straightforward to answer. Regardless of whether one argues for or against these measures, there appears to be some consensus about the need for greater clarity of the roles and responsibilities of persons administering managed investment funds. Whether the Coalition's legislation will improve this clarity and uh, transparency without compromising investor protection is not so certain. On many occasions in this place, I've talked about the need for Australia to become more innovative and competitive and more willing to adopt international best practice in business if we are to remain an effective player in international markets. However, 
This is one instance where I believe a more tempered, less pioneering response to reform may have been warranted. It's still unclear why the government is proposing to merge the present separate roles of trustee and manager of non-superannuation managed investment schemes into one when this runs contrary to the international norm. Why is it that the government, with the blessing of the opposition, which, has introduced, similar, uh, which introduced uh, similar legislation before the last election, is determined to trailblaze the notion of a single responsibility entity, an SRE, when only two other countries, the Dutch Antilles and the British Virgin Islands, have gone down that path? Significantly, the latter of these two small countries, having tried and tested the concept of an SRE, is now pursuing reforms of its own to embrace a division of responsibility and accountability in the management of investment schemes. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's true that most of the amendments in this bill are consistent with the findings of the final report of the recent, uh, into the recent, uh, of the recent uh, financial system inquiry and the 1993 joint report by the Australian Law Reform Commission and the Companies and Securities Advisory Committee. It's also true that there has been substantial deliberation and consultation with industry players in the lead-up to the introduction of this bill. However, there's still a growing uneasiness in, or there is a growing uneasiness in the investment, tax and legal professions about the implications of these measures and not just amongst those with a vested interest in the maintenance of the separation of roles of trustee and manager. In its uh, summary to the report uh, Collective Investments Other People's Money, the Australian Law Reform Commission, the ALRC, noted that, and I'm quoting, many investors choose to invest in collective investment schemes because they do not want the worry and responsibility of day-to-day -day management of their money. Moreover, Mr Deputy Speaker, the ALRC noted that they rely on the law rather than their own expertise to give them appropriate protection. As at September 1997, the Australian Bureau of Statistics put the total value of managed investment funds, which employ both a trustee and a fund manager, at around $87 billion. Many small-time investors in, in mainstream Australia, including retirees, who are typically risk-adverse and who have relatively small savings, are moving away from term deposits and into managed funds in order to maximise their returns and ensure a better standard of living. Given uh, Australia's poor performance as a savings nation, Mr Deputy Speaker, and given the negative impact that low, uh, low household savings has on economic growth and employment, it's vital that these small investors have confidence in those who are administrating their monies. It's arguable whether the, the merging of the functions of the trustee and fund manager will deliver improved levels of consumer protection. It's clear that there, imp that there are imperfections in the current system so that it is not always apparent where the fund manager's responsibilities end and where the trustees begins, although it's been argued that this ambiguity is more a perception in the minds of Treasury officials than a reality. It was for this uh, reason that the ALRC and the FSI concluded that the uh, buck should stop with one entity, and hence the concept of the SRE was born in Australia. However, in its uh, February 1998 edition of Credit Focus, international ratings agency Standards & Poor stated that the maintenance of the independence of the fund manager and the trustee was critical to ensuring appropriate investor protection and that the and I'm quoting failure to mandate that fund assets must be held in safekeeping by an independent custodian is of concern and is in contrast to all other major financial centers of the world unquote the same argument was put by Mr James Loney a partner with the law firm law firm Henry Davis and York or Henry Davis York Mr Loney acknowledges that there's uh, room to clarify the responsibilities of trustee and fund manager, but suggests that the adoption of a single responsibility entity concept is either 
necessary, is neither necessary nor desirable to achieve that end. Another independent ana analyst uh, observed that if all managers are honest, honest, diligent and prudent, the new system will probably work extremely well, just like the old system. If there are, however, one or two bad apples amongst the managers, there will be casualties. Where's the value in introducing new legislation to counter incompetent and sloppy management practices if it is unlikely to be more successful than the existing legislation? There simply isn't any. In its summary to its 1993 report into collective investments, the ALRC noted that this perceived displacement of responsibility is, and I'm quoting them, a direct result of the two-party structure that the law imposes, which does little to encourage scheme managers to, to take responsibilities themselves for seeing that the law and the scheme's constitution are adhered to. Mr Deputy Speaker, if this is indeed the case, then, it's, then clearly it's our job as parliamentarians, as legislators, to ensure that deficiencies in the law are corrected. But do such corrections really necessitate the introduction of such dramatic amendments to the existing Act? If the bureaucracy is capable of producing 100 pages of new legislation to radically alter the prudential arrangements for managed investments, surely it is able to more accurately prescribe the distinction in the role between trustee and fund manager while maintaining the two-tier structure. Perhaps the greatest shortcomings in this legislation is its failure to oblige MIFs to have fund assets held by an independent custodian. Not only is this in contrast to international best practice, it's also contrary to the recommendations of the 1993 uh, Collective Investments Review, which the Coalition had used repeatedly to justify its preference for the concept of a, single, uh, of a single responsible entity. The explanatory memorandum accompanying this bill outlines how any property of a scheme must be held in trust for scheme men members and quarantined from its own assets. The Coalition obviously believes that this, protection, uh, this, this is protection enough for investors. However, many industry experts do not. Standards and Poor note that an independent custodian is the minimum adopted standard amongst foreign financial centres and that the value of this independence cannot be underestimated. They argue that if investor protection is to be preserved, then, and I'm quoting, there needs to be a clear signal, uh, a clear legal separation between the fund manager of investments and the custodian of their assets. If this bill is enacted, it is expected that uh, fund managers will be more likely to rise to the role of the SRE than will be trustees. This is causing a fair amount of uh, anxiety for many analysts and for good reason. As one commentator recently observed, this legislation was born to prevent a recurrence of the failure of several high-profile funds. It was manufactured in response to particular aberrational events and behaviour. What has also been noted is that the collapse of the funds which most concerned Treasury were caused by fund managers who acted recklessly. Fund managers who acted recklessly. Not the trustees, Mr Deputy Speaker, although ultimately they too must accept responsibility for any fund's demise, but the fund managers. As Mr Stephen Bartholomew noted in a recent editorial in The Australian, there is no confusion about where the greatest risk of improper or inappropriate behaviour lies. It lies with the managers whom the Treasurer is about to give far more autonomy. Given the bipartisan support that this legislation is likely to receive, there is little doubt that it will pass through this place largely unamended. However, I believe the government would do well to review the issue of mandating for an independent custodian and to amend this legislation accordingly. 
The government promises an appraisal of the proposed prudential arrangements of managed investment funds by the ASC and Treasury at the end of, uh, of the two-year transition period. That's all well and fine, Mr Deputy Speaker, but two years in the investment industry is a long, long time. Mr Simon Hoyne, journalist with the Australian Financial Review, noted in an article on 18 September 1997, the recent upswing in public confidence in Australian managed funds saw the value of the managed funds industry, including superannuation funds, grow $85 billion in 12 months to $395 billion in the 12 months ending 30 June 1997. $395 billion. Growth in the investment industry of this magnitude in this time frame is no accident. It doesn't just happen, Mr Deputy Speaker. Investors don't hand over their entire lump sum retirement payments to a managed investment fund, as is increasingly happening, without being satisfied with the products on offer and with the level of customer service. Above all, Investors don't hand over their savings to be managed by another without being satisfied with the investment performance of a managed fund. The Australian Law Reform Commission is right to have noted that, and I quote them again, the law governing collective investment schemes can't and shouldn't eliminate investment risk, but should ensure that investors are given all the information they need to understand fully and judge for themselves the level of risk involved in the investment. But does the government seriously expect the average Australian investor not to question why we are no longer embracing the concept of an independent custodian when this runs contrary to every other reputable financial centre on the planet? If Australians are prepared to funnel $85 billion into manage in managed investment funds in one year because they have confidence in the current arrangements, imagine what damage they can do to the economy should they lose trust in the system and withdraw similar amounts out of managed funds. Last year, the Coalition produced legislation to introduce a new form of savings vehicle to the market, the retirement savings account. It also offered an across-the-board rebate to encourage mainstream Australians to persevere with a long-term savings plan. During the life of this sitting, we can expect to debate uh, a government bill that will see employees offered a wider range of savings options by their employers. This is all good policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, and demonstrates that this government understands the importance of promoting household savings and the need to reduce reliance on our taxpayer-funded security system. However, I remain unconvinced that the, failure, uh, that the failure to mandate for an independent custodian will further those causes. Proponents of the single responsibility entity have argued that uh, the streamlining of the trustee and fund manager into one position will reduce compliance costs for the fund and therefore improve investor returns. With the exception of the one-off cost of converting to the new SRE structure, it's possible that funds can anticipate a slight drop in compliance costs, although there remains some doubt as to whether the proposed ASC compliance requirements will actually escalate the cost of compliance. What needs to be determined is whether the government has got the balance right between the probable slight reduction in compliance costs on the one hand and, the preserving, and preserving investor confidence in managed funds in the absence of the, of the statutory requirement for an independent custodian. I'm not sure that it has, Mr Deputy Speaker. I support the the, the thorough two-year review as promised by the government, but I also believe it is critical that the independent custodian be retained by the funds under the proposed single responsibility entity arrangement. This bill does have a number of built-in safety mechanisms, including uh, the direction that all single responsible entities shall, uh, will have 
to be licensed by the Australian Securities Commission in order to assure investors that only truly responsible entities are allowed to run a scheme. Further SREs will be obliged to submit a compliance plan to the ASC in which the custodial arrangements to be put into place for the scheme property will be outlined. However, this does not erase the need for the independence of the custodian, and such a plan will surely add to the cost and time of complying with the new regulations. Standards and Poor also point out that the government is yet to provide any information on the qualifications required of members of the touted compliance committee, which is to include at least three members, the majority of whom must be external members, nor has it instructed how often this surveillance committee must scrutinise a fund. Standards and Poor also note that, that uncertainty about the ASC's compliance requirements remains, but that regardless of those requirements, and I'm quoting them, the system's success will be reliant upon the SRE's integrity in surveillance reporting as the compliance committee is required to notify the ASC of any breaches to the trust deed. In in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I return to my earlier remarks about the two key issues in this debate. Do we need to change the prudential arrangements in the non-superannuation managed in investment sector? And if so, are we adopting a better system, a system with superior checks and balances, a system that will not only maintain existing levels of domestic and foreign investment but increase the levels of that investment? The answer to the first question is yes, there are certainly improvements to be made in managed investment funds. However, I do not support a change in the status quo if the single responsible entity is not obliged to establish an independent custodian to hold fund assets. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Curtin for his remarks and I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the adjourned debate remain a order of the day for this later this day. The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask Leave of the House to make a ministerial statement on trade policy and to table the government's second annual trade outcomes and objectives statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Eh? Thank you. Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in presenting uh, the second trade outcomes and objectives statement, I remind the House that the first was tabled uh, at the beginning of last year's uh, parliamentary sittings, and it was a landmark document in the history of Australian trade policy. It was a clear demonstration of this government's commitment to enhancing Australia's trade and investment performance through well focused trade policy objectives, strategies, and actions. The 1998 Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement has the same practical and forward-looking focus on advancing Australia's economic interests. It delivers to the Australian people and Australian business a results-oriented and frank assessment of Australia's trading performance and sets out how we will achieve practical trade wins in the future. It details an unfolding strategy. It honours the strong commitment the Coalition made in 1996 and again in 1997 to maintain a process of open and constructive dialogue with the Australian people on how best to advance our prosperity and security. And it gives detailed expression to the broad long-term trade policy framework identified in Australia's first ever white paper on foreign affairs and trade, released in August last year. Mr Speaker, Australia's jobs and living standards depend on a competitive domestic economy and open international markets. Since coming to office two years ago, the Coalition Government has given its highest priority to securing jobs for Australians through practical and effective domestic and international policies. The Government's trade policies seek to complement our domestic, economic and industry policies. With better market access and more opportunities for export, the benefits will be directly felt here at home through growth and more jobs in export industries. And there'll be positive flow-on benefits to those domestic businesses that support export activity. The 1998 Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement reviews the trade and investment achievements of the past 12 months. Importantly, it considers the implications of recent events in the Asia Pacific, including the overriding imperative to maintain momentum for economic reform and trade liberalisation at home 
and abroad. The government is committed to Asia for the long haul. The government is pursuing active strategies in response to the Asia economic instability through its involvement in the IMF reform packages and our expanded trade credit insurance for exporters. We are talking to Australian businesses and putting in place practical measures to assist Australian companies over coming months. And as we promised to do on being elected to government in 1996, two years ago, we are continuing to expand our market development and market access efforts across the globe. It is interesting to note that Australian exporters are picking up on those opportunities. Exporters are seeing the benefits in diversifying their efforts and are not relying on traditional markets as much as was the case in the past. This is reflected in the decrease in the proportion of Australia's exports going to Japan. In 1995, 23.1% of our exports went to Japan. In 1997, this declined to 19.8% as business capitalised on the range of opportunities in Asia and throughout the world. For example, in 1996-97, our fastest growing markets included Iran, 71% increase in exports, Egypt, 51% increase, South Africa, 31% increase, and Mexico, 24% increase. Mr Speaker, the 1998 Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement highlights some notable trade successes. Last financial year, Australian businesses chalked up record overseas sales of goods and services, with exports exceeding $100 billion for the first time. The merchandise trade balance showed a $1.4 billion surplus, while the service trade deficit had all but disappeared. These impressive results point to the success of the government's integrated bilateral, regional and multilateral trade policy efforts, aimed at securing the best possible market access environment for Australian business. The Market Development Task Force reinvigorated Australia's bilateral trade diplomacy in 1997 and will continue to be a key element of our bilateral strategy in 1998. It fills a vacuum which existed for too long previously. Wins include better access for Australian sugar, Australian rice and Australian citrus into Japan, and financial service licences into China and Thailand. Regionally, Australia will continue to advocate economic reform and trade liberalisation, which is even more important against the background of the Asian turmoil. It's encouraging to note that at the APEC meetings last November, APEC members reaffirmed their commitment to achieving the BOGOR goals of free and open trade and investment by 2010 stroke 2020. And the government will continue to play its leading role in APEC in pushing hard to accelerate the early liberalisation of 15 priority sectors in which we have vital trade interests. We also have important multilateral trade objectives for 1998, which reflect the extent to which Australian economic interests are directly engaged in a strong, comprehensive, rules-based international trading system. These include a successful CANS Group meeting in Sydney next month to advance multilateral agricultural reforms and to, build, and to build momentum for a new comprehensive round of trade negotiations by 2000. This year's Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement also features a new sectoral focus which covers food products, information technology and telecommunications, automotive products, professional services and the textile, clothing and footwear sectors. This reflects the priority we are given to sectoral market access efforts through the appointment of special negotiators in my department. Mr Speaker, a series of special reports examine the key trade issues likely to shape Australia's trading environment over the next day, decade, including environment and competition policy, electronic commerce, intellectual property and standards and conformance matters. The statement concludes a two-year cycle by examining economies not covered in last year's first statement. These include important markets such as the European Union and a number of Asia-Pacific economies as well as a number of emerging markets. I believe that Australian companies that are looking to diversify their export base will find their assessments particularly useful. Mr Speaker, in this rapidly globalising world, Australia cannot afford to be complacent. Globalisation offers real advantage to those economies and societies that are genuinely open to innovation and quick to adapt to more practical ways of doing things. 
It can be a punishing process for those that don't get their house in order, as we have witnessed recently in this region. As we head into the 21st century, Australia's trade policy will need to incorporate a broader and more complex agenda hand in hand with overall economic policy. The increasing intensity of worldwide competition means that Australia must push ahead on microeconomic reform, including measures to take uh, make our taxation system more competitive and to improve labour productivity. This in turn will require a robust and effective flow of information among federal, state and territory governments and the private sector. Mr Speaker, in that respect I cannot emphasise too much the importance of government and business joining forces and talents to take advantage of new opportunities and meet the challenges that lie ahead. The government's trade policy is flexible and pragmatic. It seeks to build Australia into a truly competitive nation engaged with the world arena from a position of strength. It is results-oriented and centres on providing tangible outcomes for Australian business and jobs for Australians. Mr Speaker, the 1998 Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement is a sharply focused, clear and comprehensive document that informs the Australian people about what we have achieved over the past year, defines the challenges and obstacles that still need to be overcome, and charts the way ahead for Australia in the regional and international economy. I commend the statement to the House. Mr Speaker, I present the Trade Outcomes Objective Statement and my Ministerial Statement and Table Sign. Thank you. Uh, do you on the same matter? As leave given, I call on the Leader of the Opposition. Mr, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, first opportunity to address you as a Speaker in this uh, context. Uh, congratulations again uh, on your elevation. Uh, and it's, uh, it is with great disappointment that I find myself in a situation where I have to be critical of the Deputy Prime Minister and the statement that he's produced, because I will acknowledge this one thing about him. The one thing this, I will acknowledge this one thing about him. Over the last two years, he has been the one person in this government struggling manfully to keep the reputation of this nation up above sea level in the, uh, the neighbourhood with whom we trade and the people whom we want to trade with whom we wish to trade more. And uh, in that regard, uh, we, uh, we would uh, offer him, uh, I think, as, as appropriate praise. Very little praise, however, for this particular statement. Very little praise indeed. And I also rather do think that uh, it sees, it's, uh, I, I guess it's, it exemplifies a couple of things in politics. Firstly, if you don't blow your own trumpet, nobody else will. But, uh, and the second thing is the best thing that you can do in politics is to erect a straw man and knock it down and hope that uh, somebody out there at least is impressed. Well, on the side of blowing your own trumpet and, uh, and, uh, on, and nobody else doing it for you, let me just describe the very good wicket on which uh, this trade minister came to bat. The wicket which domestically was described by the Prime Minister when he assumed office as, a, as his having inherited economy better than good in pasts, uh, rather different from the comments that we hear from him from time to time in question time these days, the, uh, the trade picture that was, uh, that was confronted by the, uh, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister when he became Trade Minister was likewise better than good in parts. Under Labor, our exports of manufacturers, the most employment intensive exports, went from under 20 per cent of total, total merchandise to over 33 per cent, from one fifth to one third. So whatever the taxation arrangements, whatever it is Labor was doing, what we were not inhibiting was the export, export of manufactured goods. Services went from 18 per cent of total exports to 23 per cent. So whatever we were doing on the taxation system, services were not experiencing any sort of difficulty in improving their uh, share of Australian trade. And more important than this, over Labor's period in office, Australian exports grew by an average of just over 10 per cent every year for 13 years. Phenomenal. Important figure, just over 10 per cent every year for 13 years. Remember that, remember that, 
because uh, we now contrast it with the position of the Trade Minister. And he makes much in this statement of 1996-97 being a record for exports. A record for exports. And, uh, and of course, this is a bit of a furphy. This is another one of the blow your own trumpet exercises. In a growing world economy, Mr. Speaker, just about every year is a record year. But let's look at the reality of the 96-97 export performance. It represents a 2.5 per cent increase over the previous year. A 2.5 per cent increase. Recollect that is against a background of 10 per cent per annum uh, growth in exports under Labor. And it's not as though we weren't dealing with an, expo an active export sector. I mean, the, Prime, the Deputy Prime Minister was talking about you know, 71 per cent increases on Iran and a few other things like this. You can always get a good percentage when there's a low number to start off with. But the real test is the base, the base of the totality of our export performance. And a 10 per cent annual growth rate in exports under Labor has become a 2.5 per cent growth rate under his uh, government. And uh, there are reasons for that. There are many reasons for that. And among those reasons is decisions taken by this government in the budgetary context, which have flattened this economy and flattened the performance of all those who would be exporters. And basically, for a political, not an economic objective. When the Prime Minister inherited an economy better than good in parts, it was an economy that was well managed fiscally as well as in other ways. They have attempted to make something of something that nobody else out there is interested in but they do, a so-called $10 billion black hole. A fiscal position, the fiscal position which they confronted when they came into office was the second best in the OECD. Now let people get that in perspective, the second best in the OECD. Because they wanted to make a point to us, what they did was go about slashing wholesale a massive number of government programs which were essential to the export sector, absolutely essential to the export sector, particularly, particularly that in the manufacturing area. So what we had, for example, is the, the export market development grants was a 425 million cut over four years. 425 million. And calculations show that for every dollar spent on the EMDG, there was a return of between $9 and $21 to the economy. So we can quantify how much that cut was, likely to cost us in exports between $135 million and $215 million foregone per year as a result of that alone. And I draw attention to something else as well, and that is the situation that occurred with a cut to the R&D tax concession. Now, Just people might say, well, what does the R&D tax concession have to do with exports? Well, the interesting thing is this. One of the few things that you can actually do for your industries without running yourself up against a WTO barrier these days is resources for innovation. And let's be very frank about it. Most of those who moralise around the globe on the subject of, uh, of the need for there to be no support for industry and, uh, and rail against tariffs, and reasonably so, nevertheless, and the Europeans are absolutely front and centre in this regard, are enormous assisters of their industry under other categories. They say it's not export enhancement, therefore they don't run foul of the, uh, of the WTO, but they ladle the loot in nevertheless. And where they ladle the loot in is with innovation. innovation. So those R&D tax concessions are absolutely critical to the service industries and the manufacturing industries in particular that we've sought to encourage. And what have we seen? We've seen as a result of this a slashing of R&D budgets in the private sector across the board. R&D budgets, particularly in those areas which are export oriented. I think of my own state, which is just about totally export oriented, the most active traders in the region. And uh, the, the new manufacturing industries, the new service industries that have been building up in Western Australia in recent times are those hardest hit by what has happened. And they don't assume that they can operate effectively in a domestic economy on their own. They are massively export-oriented. Our new industries are massively export-oriented. And they were savaged in a foolish, politics-driven set of budgetary arrangements put in place uh, by, this, uh, by this government. So in the, front, the second front of straw men 
is this one about bilateralism versus multilateralism. What a giant furphy. This notion that somehow or other the only trade policy that existed prior to this show was uh, a, a, an APEC-oriented trade policy or wherever we could see a collective of nations we'd turn up, otherwise we were not interested. Well, there is not a place that this government has put emphasis on on a bilateral basis where they were not preceded by a ministerial visit and a ministerial emphasis by Labor when in office. South Africa, John Button in 1993. That's why you're seeing these massive increases in uh, trade with South Africa. Nothing to do with a show that weren't sure whether or not they were against apartheid during the 1980s. Right. Yeah. Everything to do with a show that came into bat for the, uh, uh, for, uh, that had been batting for Nelson Mandela and his team and then benefited from it. And John Button in 1993 led the first bilateral trade visit to South Africa after apartheid. And then we had Latin America under Bob McMullen in 1994. They were uh, based on an assumption that we're not engaged purely in multilateralism, we're engaged in bilateralism. And what about India? with Bob McMullen and John Button in 94. India ought to be engraved on the heart of the Trade Minister. It was one of his first visits. And what was he doing in India? What he was doing in India was, was lending his graceful presence and his enthusiasm to a Labor initiative, the New Horizons program in relation to India. And unfortunately for him, he arrived with a giant handicap. He wasn't supposed to be there. The person who was supposed to be there was the Prime Minister, Absolutely. and he was not. He represented an enormous opportunity for this government to put, its stamp, to put its stamp on an area of increasing critical, an increasingly critical nature for this nation in trade, an opportunity to put that stamp on. And the opportunity was foregone by the Prime Minister. Foregone by the Prime Minister. And I found myself when I was there, the Indians wanted to make a point to me about that in the way in which I was treated as a leader of the opposition. Treated an unsight better as a leader of the opposition on international visits than you usually are, and, uh, and at least as well as, uh, as ministers get treated. Because the Indians were not pleased. The Indians were not pleased with the emphasis that had been placed on their uh, situation. And then on another straw man, the European straw man, this was always their plea. You talk about Asia, we talk about Europe. Let us get ourselves into Europe. What has been the European record of this government since they have been in office? The European record of this government since they have been in office has been one of explanation, not one of proselytisation, one of explanation. We have had to explain ourselves to the Europeans, yes, if you want to do business in this region around us, which will ultimately resume as path of growth, if you want to do business in this region around us, uh, you come and invest in Australia. We used to do that with ease when we were in office. Now we have to plead. And why do we have to plead? Because we are changing in our image in Europe from a vibrant, progressive, outward-looking, oriented nation into a cause. And God help those countries that become an international cause. And why have we become an international cause? We have become an international cause because of the orientation, neglect and attempt to flirt with issues in this country which resonate elsewhere. We started with them with the, uh, in the human rights domain. We had a struggle to stand up to sign a human rights agreement on our treaty with Europe, on our treaty with Europe, that Colonel Gaddafi was able to sign. <laughs> I mean, we struggled, whereas Colonel Gaddafi could sign off. We actually had a gigantic struggle with the Europeans to avoid a human rights statement which might say or might imply that uh, how you dealt with labour relations, for example, might be a matter of interest or concern. So the trouble that we had in signing up with the Europeans wasn't actually on racial matters, which is another issue which has been raised in recent time. It was on whether or not Australian workers should be persecuted. <laughs> Let us persecute Australian workers, said the Australian government, or we will not sign, we will not sign a, trade, a trade arrangement with you. And then we move on from that point. The, government's, the stance that the government has taken on the WIC legislation to tweak an opportunity up for a racial election in this country has not gone unnoticed elsewhere. And where it has been front and centre noticed is in the European Parliament, where we had for the first time a resolution passed in the European Parliament condemning Australia and putting a focus Shame. on it. This is the diplomacy 
the bilateral diplomacy of this uh, government, the effort to create and open up a new market uh, in Europe. So those straw men we whack over. But the multilateral element is important as well. And uh, I do praise Laurie Oakes for an excellent statement of uh, criticism in relation to uh, the use of a multilateral organisation to assist in the crisis that we have in the region around us. And uh, he put a point which I would absolutely, uh, absolutely take on board. I can't fault the rhetoric of this government on the Asian crisis now. What I can fault is two things. Firstly, when they came to those conclusions and what they were saying as far as that Asian crisis was concerned, when it was important to say something different. And secondly, what I would fault in regard to, their, to their, their language now on the region around us is their capacity to deliver outcomes. And it was so beautifully encapsulated in that article by Laurie Oakes on the bulletin uh, uh, of March the 3rd. You know, when, when he says this, when the United States uh, President Bill Clinton arrived in Vancouver for the APEC summit last November, he dismissed the Asian financial crisis as just a few little glitches on the road. By the time the meeting ended, he was better informed. But Clinton's initial lack of understanding represented as much a failure in any, as anything else, a failure of Australian diplomacy. If Paul Keating, rather than John Howard, had been Prime Minister, phone calls from the Lodge would not have only have ensured Clinton was properly briefed, there would have been a sense of urgency, ideas uh, would have been generated, plans to deal with the situation would have been floated and discussed well ahead of the meeting, Asian leaders would have been phoned, lobbied, persuaded, things would have happened. So uh, it's not just simply a matter of saying the right thing. Then, of course, they weren't saying the right thing. Remember what was going on then, at that time, when that meeting was being held. What was happening then was when Bob McMullen and others on our front bench were getting up and asking questions in this place. We were accused in this place of exaggerating and, via exaggeration, exacerbating the crisis in the region around us and, the, and, its, uh, and its impact on us. That was going on then. So what happened then was not only was this government's incapacity in diplomacy uh, tested, so was their intellectual endeavour being tested. They came to the conclusion of the Asian crisis when every single blinking newspaper clipping that they finally had shoved under their nose said they should. There was no forethought, no understanding of what the problem was that they were dealing with or the nature of that problem. And then when it came on board, it's not the rhetoric in the end. I mean, they said the right things about Indonesia, they said the right things about Thailand and so on. It is simply a capacity to deliver on the ground. And I look at this performance of the foreign minister up there in Indonesia recently. Again, you can't fault the words, but I'm pretty well aware of what is happening in relation to uh, that situation in Indonesia, and many members of this parliament are. Mr Downer is up there, makes a statement about not being a fair weather friend, exits. The Japanese are there at the same time with 11 ministers and vice ministers, with a total package about what ought to be being done, with ideas about how things might be proceeding. The Americans have been ringing us up for some months, asking for a bit of advice on what is happening in Indonesia, finally are turning up mob-handed themselves to do the trick. We are out there saying we are here on offer but we have no diplomacy to back it up. I mean, if what you ought to do in Indonesia now would be taking the captains of Australian industry, taking the people who know a bit about food distribution, taking the people who know a bit of about currency movements, taking the, the, the fellows who, who, who are there a bit active in our financial markets, going across there mob-handed with a solution. That's what we should be doing at this moment. That's what the Japanese are doing. We should be doing exactly the same. Words are good for Australian editorials. Deeds are what counts for the future of our security in this region and for the future of our economic prosperity. And on Indonesia, what can we contribute? Well, those, uh, those attributes, I would suggest, those intellectual attributes that would be forthcoming from, the, uh, from those uh, groups that I've named. But also, I think we would have to be looking seriously at how we actually physically assisted with distribution. Distribution of food is what is going to be the central issue in the stability of Indonesia over 12 months. Get that right and they'll come through this. Get that wrong and the penalties that they will pay as a people and that we will pay as a nation are untold. And uh, that is what ought to be 
a, uh, that was ought to be at the forefront of the government thinking, but there is no intellectual heft backed up by program. And it's the duty of the foreign minister and the trade minister to get those sorts of things in place. And uh, I must say, uh, even though he did in his reference make in his speech make regard to have regard to the situation in the region around us, when you actually go to the detail of what he proposes, it doesn't actually match the circumstances that we now confront. It's a speech that comes 15 lines in a speech that comes two days after Australia records a balance of trade in goods and services deficit of $600 million for January, after a deficit of $836 million in December. The day we hear that the current account deficit blew out by $5.7 billion, or 22 per cent, in the December quarter. One day after we hear that net foreign debt grew by over 2 per cent in the December quarter last year, as it has done on average since the coalition came to power. That compares to an average of less than 1 per cent in the last three years under the Labor government. The Prime Minister talked about economic comparisons between them and us. Okay, we'll have two today, two great economic comparisons, them and us. 10 per cent per annum increase in growth in trade under Labor, uh, sustained over 13 years, 2.5 per cent sustained over a couple of years uh, by the Liberal Party in office. That's our first comparison. Let's have the second great comparison, that on foreign debt. Foreign debt. Growth at less than 1 per cent or 1 per cent under Labor while we're in office uh, in the last three and a half years of our show, and 2.5 per cent uh, since they've come into office themselves. That's a pretty interesting comparison. And it is, of course, you know, they used to run round with that flummoxy uh, debt, debt truck of theirs that managed to break down on a regular basis. Managed to break down that fully imported debt truck of the, the uh, foreign debt truck uh, that they had, neglecting the fact that uh, the prime minister has returned true to form. Foreign debt grew by 200% when he was in office, and uh, sorry, 400% when he was in office. Half of that in his last couple of years oh. as, uh, as like treasurer of this nation. So let's have a them and us comparison on that. And while we're about it, let's have it on deficits as well. They talk about a $10 billion deficit allegedly concealed, actively concealed, knowingly concealed, was $25 billion when he left office. So as on deficits, so on trade and on foreign debt with this prime minister. A lovely, a, a lovely little trifecta there. So, uh, Mr Speaker, I conclude now by saying this, that this is a statement, a statement from an inadequate government, a statement that con contains a little bit that is worthy in it, a statement that contains the final, con the, at last, an official confession that something might actually happen on the employment front as a result of what is going on around us, when it says lower export earnings will affect domestic activity through their impact on sectoral, impact on sectoral incomes. This will flow onto domestic spending. The consequent slowing in growth, output growth will affect employment, though, and here's the words, though not until later in 98-99. So what is all this pressure for a weak election? What is all this pressure related to when we look at the, uh, at the fact that Senator Minchin announced, and it's worthwhile people thinking on this, that they're going to back away from some of the amendments that they accepted in the Senate, that they accepted in the Senate on the weak legislation, because they don't want to sully their opportunity for a double dissolution. So WIC is not about solutions, formally confessed. WIC is about a double dissolution. But unfortunately, that weak double dissolution plays not into a, a, an atmosphere around us that is simply a clean slate, an atmosphere of, uh, of, of clutter in which nobody else is passing a view upon us. If, the, uh, if that legislation were passed and we were to win an election, let me tell you this, that the explanations that this Deputy Prime Minister would have to offer overseas in the region around us, in Europe, in Latin America, would be totally different from any other set of explanations that uh, have been offered by Australians, even this government's hitherto, he would find himself in the position like, that, uh, that others have found themselves into the detriment of their nations over time. But those were rogue nations, not nations like Australia, where his task is not to explain why people should trade with Australia, but it was, well, no, his task would be to explain why people should trade with Australia, when uh, previously his task would have been how good it is, how good it is that you have this opportunity 
This opportunity, based on a country which has a vibrant manufacturing sector, a vibrant service sector, a vibrant export orientation. No, don't discriminate against us because of our attitudes. We're really not all that bad. He would spend his time debating everything about the quality of the Australian product. Everything but the quality of the Australian product. And this statement, full of motherhood, full of straw men, full of unjustified trumpet blowing, would be a bagatelle. In the, uh, in the sort of literature that he would be obliged to produce to deal with that particular set of problems. Yeah. Mr. Sport and Tourism. I move that the House take note of the papers. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the date be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those in favour say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Yes, the Honourable Member for Chief. Speaker. Uh, it appears that the Deputy Prime Minister, as you know, tabled a document today and made a statement, but it appears that the document was released and used by the media prior to the tabling. And it also appears that the Deputy Prime Minister may have granted media interviews prior to making his ministerial statement. Would you, as Speaker, be prepared to investigate this and report back to the House, as it appears to be a gross discourtesy on your first day as Speaker. Well, I thank you very much for your intervention. It is not a gross discourtesy. It's a practice that has been quite common in matters that are non-confidential. This is not a confidential document. There's no point of order, and I call on the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Managed Investments Bill 1997, resumption of debate on the second reading. Thanks, Harry. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Calair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as the uh, the new speaker leaves the chamber, I offer him my warm greetings to his new position, along with everyone else in this house. I'd suggest. I must say at the outset that I'm uh, most surprised at the uh, the slim nature of the speaking list on this particular piece of legislation, which is, in my mind, a truly uh, significant one, particularly affecting. Uh, those uh, in our uh, community who, uh, who are wanting a more careful scrutiny of their, uh, their investments. There was only one speaker on the government side and uh, two of the other four happened to be independents. And while I don't claim by any means to be an expert in the area of managed investments, I do recognise the fundamental importance of this piece of legislation in protecting the life savings of an increasingly large number of Australians many of whom are in my electorate of Calair. With interest rates so low and with superannuation being increasingly subjected to extra taxation with a constantly ageing and retiring population, the demand for collective type investments that this bill aims to regulate is only going to increase as investors try and maximise the returns on their savings. I must admit it's been somewhat difficult to obtain objective information about the pros and cons of the managed investment bill. Lobby groups representing the trustees have arguments to support their vested interests, as have lobby groups representing the vested interests of fund managers. Fund managers and their representative bodies welcome the bill because they argue it will, among other things, replace an outdated two-party system of regulation which has led to unnecessary confusion of roles of the manager and trustee brings the regulatory uh, arrangements for managed investment schemes in line with those for superannuation schemes, imposes a comprehensive and strict set of duties and responsibilities on the responsible entities, increases the powers of the ASC to set and enforce rigorous compliance and licensing standards, and on the other hand, groups representing the trustees argue the bill should uh, be opposed because, according to them, it dismantles a system of safeguards for investors that has served Australia well for the past 45 years and gives investors no say in whether their existing rights and protection affecting billions of dollars' worth of the, their property are to be changed. It replaces a cost-efficient system with one that is more costly for investors. For example, a study by KPMG has found the changes will add about $38 million to the cost of running funds and there will be one-off costs of between $28 and $33 million in each of the two years in which the changes are to be introduced. On top of this, they argue, the changes will increase costs to the ASC by $4.3 million a year and could involve additional capital gains tax and stamp duty liabilities for investors. 
Further, they claim one of Australia's leading law firms believes that, quote, the bill is poorly designed and establishes an inefficient, complex and bureaucratic regulatory structure under which investor protection is substantially reduced. And it goes on, the International Rating Agency, Standard & Poor's, have said that the existing structure provides greater investment protection as the trustee and the custodian are clearly independent. The failure to mandate that fund assets must be held in safekeeping by an independent custodian is of concern and uh, is in contrast to all other major financial centres of the world where an independent custodian is a minimum standard. That's standard and pause. They also argue, the, uh, uh, the argument goes on, the bill's single responsibility entity structure is inconsistent with international best practice. They argue it's illogical for Australia to be introducing such measures when the major financial centres, such as the USA, United Kingdom and Japan, in order to strengthen investor protection, have actually moved in the opposite direction and strengthened the role of the independent trustee or custodian. In fact, they claim the only other place where a single entity structure is, in, uh, is the norm is in the Dutch Antilles. But when both groups have their fingers in the honey pot and stand to lose or gain from this bill, who are we meant to believe? Well, as the member for Bradfield pointed out last night, the best way to approach such a debate is uh, with an open mind, and that's what I've tried to do. This bill arises from the Law Reform Commission's report, Collective Investments, Other People's Money, tabled in this House in September 1993. The key outcome of that report was that there should be a single operator responsible for the conduct of the scheme. This view was reflected by the Wallace inquiry by Recommendation 89, saying we should have a single responsibility entity structure for superannuation funds, as well as the collective investment schemes covered by the bill that's before us in the House. The report recommended the change to a single responsible entity structure in the collective investment industry to improve accountability, provide cost savings and bring the regulation of the collective investment system in line with arrangements in superannuation funds. There had been notable cases, of which I'll refer to in a moment, where legal confusion had arisen about who was responsible for the collapse of a fund, the trustee, the fund manager or third parties, such as the accountants or the lawyers acting for either. Under the previous government, the Attorney-General drafted similar legislation in the form of the Collective Investment Bill. This bill, with the notable abolition of the mandatory separate independent custodians, now, becomes, or now comes before this place as the Managed Investment Bill. So the bill is substantially that originally proposed by the former government, and uh, they're giving it uh, the opposition their in principle support. They're recommending it be sent to the Corporations and Securities Committee to inquire into whether, with the removal of that independent custodian, the legislation provides enough protection for the investor. So why all the fuss? Collective investment schemes are a major source of investment funds in Australia. There's an enormous variety of such schemes, from the largest commercial property and cash management trusts through to small one-off schemes focusing on single projects such as pine plantations or yabby farms. During the 1980s, these schemes grew enormously, partly as a result of the deregulation of the financial sector. Investments in unit trusts grew from less than $2 billion in 1980 to over $38 billion in 1992, and no doubt they're worth a lot, lot more than that now. This increase has been accelerated as more and more people retire, taking all or part of their superannuation in lump sums and investing in such schemes seeking a better rate of return than that offered by banks through fixed interest. The amount of money invested in collective investment schemes will undoubtedly continue to grow with compulsory superannuation. With so much money going into the industry, it is crucial that investors maintain confidence in the industry and the fate of their own investment. One need only look at the impact the collapse of the estate mortgage trusts in 1990 had on the wider uh, economy for evidence of the need for governing regulations to do everything possible to ensure investor confidence is maintained. Members no doubt recall the commercial property boom of the 80s, how can we forget, accompanied by an unprecedented increase in the size of the unlisted property trust market. 
Between 88 and 90, for example, unlisted property trust assets swelled by 62 per cent, from 5.5 to 8.9 billion. In 1990, asset values held by property trust fell by 2 billion, resulting in massive losses to investors, and it triggered the virtual closure of most unlisted property trusts. The resulting loss of confidence by investors meant the request for redemptions of capital continued to outstrip new investment. Well, the impact of all this was so severe, in the end the government had to intervene and put a one-year freeze on investors removing their funds from these trusts. Now, we know investment's an inherently risky operation. When an individual takes the option to directly invest in shares, they take the risks that go with it. If things go their way, they might reap rewards. On the other hand, there's a chance they might blow their money. For those people, the general rule is the higher the advertised or possible rate of return, the higher the risk. But what are the protections? While there are many investors who are keenly aware of what they're doing, others do not have the experience or expertise to appreciate fully the risks. I dare say many people investing in managed trusts are these type of people. They choose to do so because they don't have the time to manage their investment, or they don't know enough, or they don't have enough money to get the exposure they can have by having it pooled and invested with other people's money. Through a collective investment, they're able to pass on responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of their savings to someone else, and they hope that someone else is an expert. These investors rely on the law, not their own expertise and skill. If, as the estate mortgage case suggests, investor confidence is the key to the industry, then surely investor confidence in the regulatory scheme governing the industry is absolutely critical. In this context, what this legislation has to do is strike a balance between investment protection and providing the framework for a vibrant investment market. Under the current system, collective investments have been run by a manager who could invest the money in any way permitted by the trust deed. The manager's day-to-day -day overseer is the trustee, who actually holds the assets on behalf of the investors. Now, More importantly, the trustee controls the money. So if the manager wants to pursue a particular uh, line of investment, they have to get the permission of the trustee first. Under the current system, the trustee signs the cheques, so they're meant to act as a third-party cheque between the investor and the actions of the fund manager. Now, it doesn't always work perfectly, as the estate mortgage case demonstrates, but at least in that case the investors were able to sue the trustee as well okay. as the manager. The member for Bradfield pointed out last night how investors in estate mortgage have just received some good news. In Burns, Philp, the parent company of the trustee, agreeing to pay a substantial settlement. However, in the estate mortgage case, it would appear the investors were lucky they were able to sue the trustee because they would have got very little out of the fund manager, Reuben Liu, who ended up bankrupt and in jail. My understanding is that this bill scraps the trustees altogether, replaces the trustee with a constitution, renames managers responsible entities, giving them the power to hold assets, sign cheques and make all decisions about the direction of the fund investment. Under this system, only the fund manager, to be known as that responsible entity, will be accountable to the investors. Now, by, by uh, placing responsibility clearly on the shoulders of one body, the legislation will remove the likelihood of confusion arising over who is responsible. However, with this simplification, there are possible drawbacks too. Now, according to Pierpont, writing the Financial Review, there is potential for these responsible entities to abuse their position. The safeguard under the proposed bill is that the manager must have the support of either a majority of independent directors or a compliance committee, but the legislation specifically bars trustees from fulfilling one of these positions. Now, Pierpont refers to the case of trustee, executor and agency, which collapsed in 1983 as a case in point. In that case, all the directors were independent and none of them had a clue until the eve of the receivership that their managing director was engaging in wild, unauthorised property speculation with the company's own money. Fortunately here, the investments held under trust remained intact, but this is unlikely under the bill before us. Under the current system, a trust deed can only be altered with the support of a majority of investors in the trust. But under the Managed Investment Bill, in particular section 601 C1B, 
the constitution of a scheme may be modified or repealed and replaced with a new constitution by the responsible entity if the responsible entity reasonably considers the change will not adversely affect members' rights. As the members for Wentworth and Bradfield pointed out last night, the bill does impose onerous obligations on prospective fund managers and upon their day-to-day -day operations. However, in the light of recent experiences in the superannuation industry, an industry governed by onerous legislation, I question whether the MIB can deliver enough protection. The super industry is governed by the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. This legislation is highly stringent. It sets strict accounting standards. It applies a vast number of rules for both trustees and investment managers. But even with this stringent degree of regulation, it appears inadequate protection has been provided to many investors. Members recall the case of Sentinel, Australian superannuation nominees, and e, uh, EC consolidated capital super funds where unscrupulous fund managers managed to destroy the life savings of their investors, with little, if any, real protection provided by the SIS legislation. Now, in these cases, investors were lured into the funds by the promise of higher than average returns. The investors believed their investments were safe as bricks and mortar and protected by government legislation. But unbeknown to them, they had invested in schemes of highly dubious character. For example, in the Sentinel case, the group is now estimated to have debts of $10 million. And of course, the investors have to wait in line to pick up the pieces of what's left over after all other creditors, with priority, are paid out. Sentinel had actually failed to lodge its returns in 1996. And rather than sensing a problem and stepping in, the Prudential Regulator, the Insurance and Superannuation Commission, allowed the group to keep trading. One of the directors had previously been a bankrupt, but the group openly paraded itself as a financial clean skin. It gets better. One of the directors of the Sentinel Group actually borrowed money from the group, and therefore the investors, to build a house in Melbourne for his own personal use. Investors in the notorious Australian superannuation nominees and EC Consolidated Capital suffered similar treatment and lost their life savings. In the superannuation industry, nearly all super funds have trustees to oversee investors' money, how it's managed, how it performs. But for those in wholesale funds like Sentinel or ECCCL, the investors are actually their own trustees and the CIS rules provide them with little protection. Their only option is to sue managers. But what good if, is that if, you manage, if your managers are bankrupt, has lost all your money? And according to the Insurance Superannuation Commission, last year 21,000 super funds either failed to lodge their returns or lodged incomplete claims. Further, the ISC listed 55 per cent of funds audited as having serious breaches of the SIS legislation, which put investors' funds at risk. Now, some commentators have called for funds to be insured against fraud or negligence. What I ask is how the ISC, if it can't even cope with its workload given present funding pressures, how can the government expect the ASC to operate effectively with increases in its responsibilities? So I join the member for Wentworth in his call for increasing the ASC's budget so it can adequately enforce the compliance responsibilities placed upon it. What the Sentinel and other cases show is that even where regulation and controls are much more stringent, where there is a two-tiered trustee system in place, there are still unscrupulous operators who are taking advantage of the investors and the legislation, and it provides inadequate protection for investors. How can it be that under the MIB, with the removal of the internal regulators, the trustees and the granting of managers so much more power, that the protection will be adequate, especially if the ASC doesn't have the resources? As Pierpont says, there are loopholes in this bill which you could drive cars through and the only safeguard put in place will be the Australian Securities Commission. If the protection is inadequate, investor confidence will be lost, and so too could their, uh, their fortunes. We have to guarantee this bill protects ordinary investors against this eventuality. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, this government and its predecessor has been all about encouraging individual responsibility in relation to retirement. Now, perhaps the government should be incorporating in this bill some form of compulsory insurance, some type of firewall to be compelled upon the industry to provide a safety net for investors adversely affected by the incompetent, the negligent or the fraudulent. The emphasis on superannuation and the winding back of entitlements for social security is part of this government's uh, 
and, and the current feeling about individual responsibility for retirement and such things. And um, I believe the government speaks of mutual obligation in, in many of these areas. And sure, there is a mutual obligation, but there has to be protection with that. We can't leave people out there swimming alone in this, uh, in this uh, financial ocean trying to, uh, to find out whether they're on a raft that will float or not. If the government is to compel Australians to save for their old age and thus encourage them to invest in collective funds, the people can expect the government to put in place the appropriate safeguards to protect their savings. I am not yet convinced this bill provides adequate protection, and so I support the opposition's recommendation that the bill be sent to the Corporations and Securities Committee for further examination. Thank you. The, the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank all those members for their contributions to the debate. And uh, I just note that this bill, uh, as the member for Clare has just mentioned, is being re uh, referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities, and this will provide a forum for those interest groups, both the trustees and the fund managers, to raise their concerns with the bill and have their views tested. And I think we've heard in the debate today that uh, you know there are interest, vested interests on both sides of that, and so uh, being referred off to the parliamentary committee will allow those uh, views to be aired in a proper and fulsome way. Uh, however, there are two issues which uh, do deserve comment in listening to the debate. First, the, the opposition speakers have queried whether the Australian Securities Commission will have the funds to fulfil its responsibilities under the bill. Uh, in response to that, I can assure all honourable members that uh, the government is aware of the resource implications of the bill for the Australian Securities Commission, and the government will ensure that the uh, Commission is adequately funded to perform its functions. Uh, however, it is inappropriate for any comment to be made uh, about specific funding ahead of the budget, seeing that we're into that uh, budget period now. Uh, the second. Um, well, that often happens in this game, doesn't it? <laughs> um, the second issue relates to the bill's treatment of uh, the custody of scheme assets and uh, sort of the non-custodian issue that's been raised. Um, and I'd uh, just make uh, several comments about that. First of all, there is no requirement in the bill for a scheme to have a custodian to hold scheme property. This position is consistent with the recommendation of the 93 review of the Australian Law Reform Commission and Companies and Securities Advisory Committee. Uh, and indeed, the review stated that imposing a requirement for all schemes to have a separate custodian was neither necessary nor appropriate, but would be unnecessarily rigid. The government believes that a requirement for a separate custodian is not justified for regulatory purposes. This is because the bill contains a number of other mechanisms designed to protect scheme assets. For example, uh, the responsible entity will be under a duty to keep scheme property separately from its own assets and will have the duties of a trustee in relation to any scheme property that it holds. Uh, the scheme compliance plan must set out the custodial arrangements that the responsible entity will put in place for scheme assets. That plan is to be vetted by the Australian Securities Commission. Uh, some may argue that a mandated custodian is required to ensure that scheme assets are segregated from those of responsible entity to afford protection of investors' interests in the event of a collapse or fraud. But I'll just make these comments. The requirement to hold a scheme property separately and on trust will adequately protect investors' interests in the event of a collapse. Uh, moreover, the responsible entity concept means that uh, any custodian of scheme assets would be a bare custodian obliged to deal with scheme property in accordance with the responsible entity's instructions. Such a custodian would offer little protection against misuse of scheme property and exercise little oversight of the responsible entity's activities. Rather, a custodian requirement would impose costs that may well outweigh the benefits, 
in terms of improved compliance. If the custodian were given power to decide where the responsible entity's directions were within the terms of its authority or to second guess the responsible entity's instructions, the responsible entity concept would be undermined. Such a custodian would probably owe fiduciary duties to investors. The current trustee manager structure would reassert itself. There are already arrangements with the Australian Securities Commission, uh, which has arrangements with the Securities Commission, has authorised to operate without a separate trustee to hold fund assets. For example, the Solicitor Mortgage Investment Companies and the Trustee Common Funds both operate without the supervision of a second party holding scheme assets separately from the scheme promoter. One of the goals of changing the regulatory framework for managed investments is to ensure that the legal framework for the industry harmonises with the regulation of similar investment vehicles. There is no similar requirement to protect invest, uh, investors' interests in company structures nor is there a universal requirement to retain a custodian in superannuation. Uh, this bill will not prevent a responsible entity from appointing a custodian to hold the scheme properly separately fr uh, property separately from other property. Indeed, the government believes that many responsible entities will find that the easiest way to discharge the duty to keep scheme assets separate from its own assets will be to engage another party to take custody of the assets, but there should be no requirement to do so. In just uh, concluding, I'd say that the government is fully aware of its obligations to investors in this area. We've had experiences in this country where investors' funds haven't been adequately uh, cared for, and uh, there is a genuine uh, concern by the government to try and ensure that, uh, to the best of our ability, that that doesn't happen in the future. But of course, in all of these matters, uh, governments can do so much with regulation and underpinning, but at the same time, there is a responsibility for people who are involved in, in these investment uh, uh, operations to ensure that they, they operate uh, uh, with wisdom and care and with due propriety for investors' funds. I thank all those who participated in the debate. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the corporation's law and for related purposes. Is it the wish to move to the third reading forthwith? Is leave, no. grant is leave granted? If it's granted, the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the corporation's law and for related purposes. Order. I have received a message from the Senate transmitting the following resolution agreed to by the Senate that the provisions of the Company Law Review Bill 1997 and the Management Investments Bill 1997 be referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities for inquiry and report by 23rd of March 1998. Are the clerk. Order of the day number two, Company Law Review Bill 1997, resumption debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill is now read a second time. The Honourable the Member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> this bill in its original form was an initiative of Labor. It was originally re released in 1995 and it seeks to improve and simplify most of the core provisions of the corporation's law. It covers seven major areas and they are as follows. Registering companies, meetings, share capital, financial reporting, annual returns, deregistration of defunct companies and company names. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are all vital areas of company regulation which do need significant simplification and reform. However, I need to point out at the beginning of my remarks that the opposition does not wholly support the bill as currently drafted. We have a number of serious questions on various aspects to which we will be seeking answers. To enable proper scrutiny of these proposals, 
The opposition is supporting reference of the bills to the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Securities. Uh, now, you uh, announced uh, before this notice came forward that the Senate processes have already commenced for that referral to occur. We are therefore happy to pass this bill in the House in the expectation that it will receive proper scrutiny uh, through the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Securities. An earlier draft of the bill, the draft second Corporate Law Simplification Bill, was considered earlier by the Parliamentary Joint Committee. Now, of the 11 unanimous recommendations of that committee, while a number have been adopted by the government in the new bill, others have not. And in addition to these matters, the bill also contains some unilateral alterations made by the government which were not included in the original referred legislation. Clearly, we will be concerned to closely examine these issues to weigh the decisions taken by the government against the previous unanimous recommendations of the committee where they are inconsistent and to examine the other issues. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to give a brief description of the legislation. The broad areas covered by the bill cover a wide range of company law and the ramifications of the legislation are very significant indeed. For example, the proposals concerning share capital transactions represent a revolution in a fundamental matter of corporate law. The bill proposes to abolish the concept of par value for shares. Uh, this proposal follows in the footsteps of other comparable nations, such as the United States, Canada and New Zealand. The abolition of the concept of par value will considerably simplify and streamline the processes which must currently be undertaken. At the moment, if a company's share price is lower than the par value, special meeting processes and court involvement are necessary to approve proposals to issue fresh capital. These processes have lost their relevance in the modern commercial world and their reform is supported by Labor. Buttressing the abolition of par value for shares is the related proposal to simplify the processes concerning capital variations. So, if a company wishes to reduce its issued capital, it must seek court confirmation for the proposal. This bill will abolish the involvement of the court in this process. This will save time, it will save expense, it will remove an unnecessary complication to the financial affairs of major companies. However, like many worthwhile reforms, there are significant complications arising from the proposals. As the government has acknowledged, these capital reforms will open up an enormous tax avoidance opportunity. That opportunity is that companies will be able to stream amounts that would technically be capital and hence non-taxable to shareholders in lieu of taxable dividends. Now, clearly, this would be an untenable situation. The Treasurer has announced that the tax law will need to be amended to ensure that rorts cannot be undertaken. That announcement was made last year, yet we still don't have the amending tax legislation coming before the parliament. And again, the government is falling down on its management of the legislative program. They are proposing to open up a tax avoidance opportunity, which they know about, and yet they've not contemporaneously introduced the anti-avoidance legislation. So just how is the parliament supposed to confidently pass this legislation with the prospect that it may be opening up a significant tax avoidance loophole. This is, uh, from my point of view, very negligent on the government's part. And I give notice now that, in the opposition's view, this legislation should not be passed, at least until the tax legislation is also before the parliament. And preferably, that tax legislation should already be law when this bill is finally debated in the Senate to ensure that, indeed, no rorting can take place. Another important area covered by the bill is the simplified procedures for setting up and running a company. Now, the main thrust of these proposals is to reduce the cost and the regulatory requirements of establishing companies and the completion of the legal rep recognition of the one-person company through reforms such as the abolition of the rule requiring a company to keep their registered office open to the public. Now, again, these proposals seek to simplify the processes for establishing business entities which should assist the general business environment, especially for small business. 
However, while not opposing the thrust of the proposals, I do wish to raise an issue which has been brought to my attention concerning the proposed simplification of this process of registering companies. <coughs> and that issue is the ability to actually trace the person behind the company. And the opposition has been informed of a concern that the new proposals uh, involving electronic establishment of companies will allow companies to be formed without the principal ever being identified. And uh, if that were the case, then the possibility for fraud is clearly greatly enhanced. And there are many circumstances in which you need to be able to go back uh, behind what you've got in front of you now and find out who initially established the company. It is indeed the case that the reputation of Australia could be damaged if it were possible to rot the company laws and surrounding the establishment and registration of companies. Now, I'm not sure that this would be an outcome of this bill, but given that that claim has been made, it needs to be examined closely by the Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities. There are many non-contentious areas of reform which involve streamlining a number of processes, including the capacity for electronic meetings and the capacity for simplified annual reports as an alternative to the general annual report. But I do want to turn to what seemed to the opposition to be some significant problems with the bill. There are at least three aspects of the bill which are causing concern to stakeholders, that is to say national and international investors and institutions and shareholders groups. These are the disclosure of financial information, including details on executive remuneration and a director's report to shareholders, and I want to uh, talk about this in some detail shortly. Uh, the minimum notice required to hold a meeting considering a special resolution and voting procedures at meetings. Now, all of these issues involve complex considerations which need to be thoroughly examined by that Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities. The issue concerning the minimum notice required for meetings is a relatively simple one. The Joint Committee has previously recommended to the Parliament that the minimum notice period ought to be 28 days. This was, let me point out, a unanimous cross-party recommendation. The government chose to ignore that proposal and go for 21 days. This has now been severely criticised, especially by international investors. The simple point that they make is that the best practice standard is 28 to 30 days. This is what applies in the world's major capital markets, such as the United States, which has 30 days, Germany, which has 32 days, France, which has 30 days, and so on. Uh, this is a matter which has been the subject of uh, considerable concern. For example, uh, there was correspondence from Dr Stephen Davis, uh, the president of Davis Global Advisors of Newton, uh, Massachusetts, to uh, Senator Ann Campbell, the parliamentary secretary to the Treasurer, which suggests that if passed in its present form, the measure would set Australia on a course that would place it behind the emerging international best practice of 28 to 30 days. So this is a matter which uh, the opposition has raised informally with Senator Campbell. He has indicated that there may be some reassessment of this issue, and the opposition would welcome that and would examine the matter further in the Joint Committee. Secondly, there are some issues regarding the conduct of meetings, and particularly the rules governing show of hands voting, which have raised some concerns and which we will also be pursuing in the committee's inquiry. Put simply, we would not be supportive of a proposition which uh, prevents show of hands voting uh, if, that, if what this is about is saving directors at meetings the embarrassment of being outvoted on the floor of a meeting of shareholders. And if this were to be used as a vehicle to prevent small investors from bringing their legitimate concerns regarding the management of a company uh, onto the uh, the floor of the meetings, <coughs> uh, this, in our view, would not be appropriate. 
And I guess many people would be aware of the, the, the situation which uh, does occur at meetings of shareholders where those who are present vote in a particular direction. Uh, they may well be outvoted by the proxy votes or the block votes of, uh, of other larger shareholders. Now, where that happens, uh, that may cause some embarrassment to directors, but it would not be our view that it's a legitimate purpose of this legislation to simply save them that embarrassment by saying we're going to, uh, to do away with the show of hands voting. I think that would be a retrograde step and we want to uh, pursue some of those issues in the committee. But I guess the, the major issue of concern to the opposition in the legislation before us is the, that these proposals don't adopt full disclosure on executive remuneration. Now, I believe that this is both offensive to shareholders and is also likely to diminish Australia's reputation with international investors. And frankly, we regard the government's position as untenable. The government is arguing, in effect here, that shareholders should not be able to find out, as of right, the full details about the packages that very highly paid executives are being paid by the company that they own. The shareholders own the company. They pay these salaries, and yet, under these proposals, they will not be entitled, as of right, to full disclosure of the salaries that they're paying. And, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you can imagine the kind of uproar uh, that would ensue if the same sort of proposition were put forward, for example, for members of parliament uh, salaries or, or judicial salaries or other things of that nature which are paid for uh, by the taxpayer. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is indeed a matter which has been the subject of some international concern. And I want to take the House back to a report in the Financial Review on the 8th of January uh, which sets out that many United States fund managers are alarmed by what they regard as significant omissions from proposed changes to Australian company laws. And that the uh, Fin Review reports that uh, this major rewrite of corporations' law has been watered down before even being put before the parliament, and that the managers, uh, one of whom controls $9 billion US in securities outside the United States, have written to Treasury officials in Canberra warning that the weakened company law review bill will leave Australia lagging behind international standards in corporate governance. It, the, uh, the report says they are backing the concerns of governance watchdogs, such as the Australian Investment Managers Association, that proposals to tighten governance in three major areas have been left out of the bill. And uh, that committee, chaired by Senator Grant Chapman, a uh, Liberal senator from South Australia, took submissions uh, on the bill and, certainly according to Senator Chapman, the committee gave careful consideration to these issues and recommended changes to the exposure draft to deal with them. But now we, uh, we have these matters being deleted and high up on the United States investors' list of apparently abandoned issues is fuller disclosure of executive salaries and remuneration. Now, currently, a listed company in Australia simply has to show the numbers of their executives who are paid salaries between certain bands, but it doesn't have to show who gets what or how that package is made up. Now, there are some companies, such as Westpac, which have moved into line with the international standard, the international best practice, and do show uh, the names and salaries of, uh, in Westpac's case, the, top, the salaries of the top five executives, and they also break down the mix into base pay, bonuses, options and the like that make up that salary. Now, the United States companies, they're compelled to do uh, the same as Westpac is doing, but the bill that we've got before us simply requires companies to disclose in their director's report details of options that are issued over unissued shares, and uh, they won't have to give details of any other part of the remuneration package such as salaries and bonuses. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Fin Review points out, this makes an absolute nonsense of the ASX listing rule, which requires direction, directors' options to be approved by shareholders, since you can hardly vote to approve an option without knowing what the, the rest of a director's salary package is. That is, uh, 
uh, a most unsatisfactory set of circumstances, and uh, the article uh, draws uh, attention very pointedly to it. And indeed, the, uh, the Financial Review had an editorial of the same day uh, uh, making reference also to this concern of United States investors and talking about the fact that they are concerned about the issue of extent of disclosure of executive remuneration, the limit on how long notice papers must be published ahead of annual meetings and a plan to do away with show of hands votes at these meetings. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it is not as if there is not some community concern about the issue of uh, executive salaries, uh, to say nothing of legitimate shareholder concern. Uh, we have a circumstance where we've got a, a government that's uh, terribly anxious and terribly fired up about the, the uh, pay that is received by uh, workers down on the waterfront. But when you come to the issue of executive salaries, you hear uh, a lot less from the opposite side of the House. Now, uh, going back to uh, last year, the, the member for Scullin uh, gave the House some uh, first-class information about executive salaries in this, this country and the history of uh, those executive salaries. And some of the things that he pointed out were that uh, from uh, 1983 to 1993, you had award wages increasing by 53 per cent. Uh, average weekly earnings going up by 74 per cent, as did inflation, and yet over the same period executive pay increased by 133 per cent. And uh, if you looked at the salaries paid to the executives of the top 150 companies, uh, that was, they were increasing uh, annually by 6 to 8 per cent and 10 to 15 per cent if you include the cheap share deals and bonuses that have become common practice. Indeed, uh, the survey of executive salaries by Cullen Egan Dell showed that senior management remuneration increased by 6.3 per cent uh, last year, uh, much more than uh, the going rate throughout the rest of the community. The Independent Monthly, uh, back in June of 1996, uh, estimated that there were 45 senior executives in Australia who earn more than a uh, million dollars and many more who earn well in excess of half a million dollars. Now, it's uh, very sobering to, to consider that, for example, the chief executive officer of Westfield Holdings back in 1997 was earning some $72,000 a week, uh, whereas the average taxable income in, for example, my own electorate of wills at a similar time was of the order of twenty-four dollars or $25,000. So what, in effect, this, uh, this means is that uh, an average uh, person in my electorate takes three years to earn the same amount that the Chief Executive of Westfield earns in a week. Uh, we've had other celebrated cases of executive pay not being linked in any shape or form to the performance of the company. So in 1989-1990, Elders IXL managed to increase its executive remuneration package by 23 per cent at the same time as there was an 80 per cent drop in operating profit. And uh, in the same year, Adsteam uh, had its chief executive given a 53 per cent pay increase uh, at the same time as the value of the company was shrinking to 8 per cent of its former value on the Australian Stock Exchange. So we've seen spectacular uh, salary packages uh, for the, the chief executive officer of Coles Meyer, Peter Bartels, 2.8 million. Uh, at the same time, Woolworths was doing, uh, doing a lot better, but their chief executive was only getting a mere 665000 so he was entitled to feel uh, a bit disappointed. We've got, of course, the uh, chief executive of Tabcorp. Uh, uh, the, the age at one stage described his salary package as roughly twice the GDP of uh, Tasmania. Now, that, that was somewhat flippant, but uh, if you look uh, back in 1997, his uh, salary was over a million dollars and his shares had increased in, in value to such an extent that that was adding an additional $10 million uh, to his salary. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer occasionally, occasionally have sounded off about executive salary increases, but they've done absolutely nothing about it. And when they've got the chance to do uh, something about it, at least in terms of disclosure, 
at least, it, at least in terms of giving shareholders the opportunity to know just what salaries are being paid so that when they vote uh, either to endorse or not endorse these salaries, they'll know what they're voting on. Uh, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer apparently walk away from that opportunity. And Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I did a little bit of uh, further research to try and update some of the work of the uh, member for Scullin to talk about executive salaries of uh, some major companies in more recent times. And I uh, <coughs> selected $250,000 as a benchmark because I think it's uh, more than the, the Prime Minister's salary, but uh, just as importantly, it's about 10 times the average income of my own constituents. And frankly, I don't believe that anyone does work of such quality that they can defend, getting more than 10 times in salary the going rate for my constituents. As I point out, it takes them 10 years to earn that sort of uh, money, and indeed where we're talking about a uh, million dollar salaries, which we are in a number of cases, it takes them 40 years uh, to earn that kind of salary. So if you look at BHP's report to shareholders for 1997, we have 62 employees earning over 250,000, earning over the, uh, the quarter of a million compared with 55 the year before. If we look at Coles Meyer, we've got uh, 55 earning over a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, it'd be interesting to know just what the people at the bottom of the line there were getting for their or, or were providing for their salary of in excess of uh, a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, I note that the, <coughs> the payments do include retirement payments and payments associated with terminations as well as the exercise of share options and the like. But uh, it's 55 compared with, uh, according to the report, 18 from last year. With uh, Western Mining, 16 uh, uh, <coughs> directors and other executive officers receiving over $250,000 in salary, up from 11. And uh, at Westpac, 39 employees receiving over $250,000. And at the top of the range, of course, uh, at Westpac, in excess of $1.9 million at uh, Western Mining, uh, <coughs> up around the million dollar mark, and so on. Now, Mr uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, <coughs> it's pretty shabby when you have the government uh, saying we are, we are worried about the salaries being paid on the, the waterfront, that they are outrageous and excessive and not in the national interest, and then when it comes to the issue of executive salaries being prepared to do absolutely nothing and being given at least an option in this bill of public disclosure so that people know uh, what kind of executive salaries are being provided, uh, they are apparently not to support it. And so I want to say to the House that this is an issue which we do intend to pursue uh, through the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Securities and pursue subsequently in the Senate. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Griffith. For Griffith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is not one of the more media-inspiring or controversial bills to be debated uh, in the House this week, although some of the comments, later comments from uh, the member for Wills, one would think that there was a major problem. But in my opinion, it is one of the great importance for small business persons and also, in particular, for the novice investor. The sale of Telstra introduced thousands of Australians to the stock market, and I can bet that until the Telstra float, the majority of these new investors had always considered the stock market the exclusive domain of the economically astute, that is, the corporate business person, the financier or the economist. The sensible marketing and presentation of the Telstra issue made it easy for novice investors to understand the workings of the stock market. As a result, thousands of Mr and Mrs Australia and their families became first-time shareholders, and they are now reaping genuine financial benefits from their first foray into the somewhat mysterious and confusing world of shares and the All Lords Index. I am sure, Mr Deputy Speaker, those first-time investors who dived into the market with Telstra 
will keenly be interested in the ramifications of this company law review bill so that they may understand what company law is about. One of its major elements is to simply simplify and improve the method of reporting by companies to shareholders. Presented with a clear and concise financial report, investors will be able to make assessments and, most important, be better equipped to ask questions at shareholders' meetings. Anyone who has attended an annual general meeting of shareholders will well understand the reluctance of a person to pose a question to the board of directors. The directors have a habit of positioning themselves on a podium. We often see photos in the paper looking down on the sea of investors. And I think sometimes it takes a brave man or woman to stand up and challenge this row. But the reforms in this do bill do make it easier. They expressly recognise by law that shareholders have a reasonable <coughs> opportunity to ask questions at an annual general meeting. The bill will require the chairman of, of that meeting for a public company to allow members as a whole a reasonable opportunity to ask questions and comment on the company's management. It also allows shareholders to ask auditors questions about the audit report. This is a new obligation in the law. While in practice most companies already provide members with an opportunity to ask questions, this bill demands and thereby ensures that shareholders have more time to put ordinary resolutions to those general meetings. The bill also introduces a uniform period for all meetings which at present require 14 days notice for ordinary resolutions and 21 days for meetings to consider special resolutions. The bill insists, as the member for Wills commented, all general meetings require 21 days notice be given to shareholders. And I note his comments in regard to the request to the minister to review that to 28 days and I'm sure he has taken that request on board. For those shareholders who cannot get to an annual general meeting, the proxy voting rules will be updated to give them greater certainty and flexibility in exercising their votes. The formalities for appointing a proxy will also be streamlined. Members will be able to appoint a person who holds a particular office from time to time and to make standing appointments. Members will be able to specify the proportion or number of votes each proxy may exercise. A proxy will be able to vote on a show of hands unless the company's constitution provides otherwise. Shareholders must not only be aware of their importance and value to a company, but now with this bill have wider rights under the law. I am sure both novice and experienced share market investors will be delighted with this action. At the same time, investors will benefit from the cuts introduced by this bill in preparing, printing and mailing out annual reports. Anyone who is or has been a shareholder will be aware of the expensive, sometimes colourful and glossy publications which are distributed by companies prior to an annual general meeting. These annual reports are, are more often a promotion for the company and long on gloss and a bit short on easily identifiable facts and figures. They are usually expensive to produce and obviously to distribute. Most end up in the rubbish bin without even being read, I would hazard a guess. This bill allows for companies and managed investment schemes to take the option of sending concise annual reports to their members, reports which give the necessary facts. Both those members, but those members who want more information can ask for and must receive a full detailed annual report. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, taking the legalese out of the company documents and presenting them to the investing public in plain English is a long overdue step. It is one covered by this bill. When you consider this bill will reduce around 95,000 words of text by 41,000 words, you will see what I mean about clarity and simplicity. Translated, that is a reduction of 43 per cent of the complex legalese which, to many people, is repetitive and confuses rather than clarifies the situation. This extends to that most important aspect, the financial reporting by companies and managed investment schemes to the public and the shareholders and members. This bill will establish in the corporation's law the principles governing financial reporting, leaving matters of technical detail to be addressed in the accounting standards. In simplifying the method in which corporate law and regulations are recorded, this bill makes life easier for that most beleaguered section of, of the community, small business. Each time this government removes yet another form from the desk of a small business operator, it is giving them more time to devote to the business of earning a living. Take the first aspect, that of setting up and running a company. This bill streamlines it to the point that the only formality will be the lodgement of an application form. That is, Mr Deputy Speaker, a single form. Just one single form lodged with the Australian Securities Commission and you have registered a small business. This is an improvement on the current system of multiple, for multiple forms which are not only lengthy but in many cases obtuse. This government has recognised that anyone wishing to start up a business should not, own, not have to employ the services of an accountant and a lawyer just to interpret the documents. It's a shame you didn't bring it in while you're in government. Nor should they need a degree in corporate law or creative writing to get themselves registered. One form will now do the trick, and a form that can be completed without professional advice. To enable companies to choose the structure best, which best suits their commercial or other objectives, the bill will make it easier to change from one type of company to another, for example from a proprietary company to a public company. For years the business and professional communities have been calling for the simplification of the corporation's law. This bill is the result of wide consultation with the industry. When, the dissent, dis, when you dissect this bill, the changes are significant in that so many small and apparently innocuous regulations are simply being removed. Put together, they result in a streamlining that not only cuts time but costs for both business operators and investors. The new bill will make the way easier for not only those who wish to register a new business, but it will make e easier and cheaper to deregister a company that has no liabilities. In particular, it will no longer be necessary to advertise the proposed deregistration in the newspaper. A person will be able to sue a deregistered company's insurer directly without having to first apply to the court for reinstatement of the company's registration. The rules for obtaining and using company names and the Australian company numbers will be rewritten. The companies permitted to omit limited from their names will be restricted to charitable com companies and the conditions applicable to this right will be set out in the law rather than in the Australian Securities Commission licences. Existing licences will be preserved. Small business will also benefit from the fact documentation 
has been dramatically slashed, a promise made by this government on election two years ago. For example, the memorandum of association will be abolished. Companies will not have to hire a professional to draw up articles of association, and I'm sure many small businesses will remember the time when they had to have those memorandums of association on the day and only to put them in the bottom drawer and leave them there forever and a day. To enable companies to function without these articles of association, they will be able to adopt a constitution which displaces some or all of them. Another simplification is that proprietary companies will no longer be required to keep their registered offices open to the public. In addition, companies will no longer need to have a common seal. Public companies will also only need one member instead of three currently required. Doing business with a company will also become easier, especially for those who provide finance. This will be because of the reduced need for third parties to make inquiries about the company's internal affairs. Companies limited by guarantee will be able to convert into companies limited by shares. This will be of particular importance to mutual companies seeking to demutualise through a structure involving share capital. This measure will make it possible for the bill to repeal the provisions allowing the registration of companies limited by both share and guarantee. In looking at the manner in which many small businesses now operate, this government has accepted that the use of modern technology be incorporated into corporations' law. The use of electronic technology to hold meetings will become a legal reality. For directors' meetings, it will be possible to use any form of, it, of technology agreed to by the directors. For members' meetings, it will be possible to use any form of technology that gives members a reasonable opportunity to participate in meetings. And to many shareholders, I think that is a great benefit where distance at times has been limiting for them to be able to get to meetings. With over half of the items currently required to be included in annual returns being removed, we will see a reduction of over 50 per cent of paperwork for Australia's one million companies. This bill not only simplifies corporate law but acknowledges the need to include advances in technology in the future. This bill rewrites and makes significant improvements to the core areas of registering companies, meetings, financial reports and audit, annual returns, the deregistration of defunct companies and dealing with company names. Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe the result will make life easier for our business community, who in turn will be able to get on and do what they need to do most, and that is run their business for the benefit of their shareholders and the benefit of their employees. And for that reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am happy to be here to support the bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think my colleague, the Member for Wills, has already indicated on behalf of the opposition that we do not uh, oppose this legislation. Um, but we, I think, have indicated that uh, there are elements of it that we would like to see examined by a parliamentary joint committee because there are some divergence from the actual implementation in this bill uh, from uh, a committee's earlier report which made recommendations on how best to deal with this issue of company law. Uh, that said, it is important, I think, also, Mr Deputy Speaker, to place on the public record yet again that uh, the bill in its original form was an initiative of Labor. And uh, my colleague at the table has reminded me that uh, he and uh, the then Attorney General, Michael Lavarch, had laboured long and hard to try and put in place 
uh, a, a, a form of company law which would be a much simplified version of what existed. Now, the honourable member for Griffith went uh, at great length, I think, to point out the, just the way in which this actual legislation will be will be amending existing law, and uh, certainly in terms of its actual volume, will be almost cutting it in half, if not a touch more. And uh, I'm sure everybody would uh, would welcome that, as they would any simplification process that actually has the law written in plain English that everyone can understand. That in itself is a step in the right direction. But uh, there's clearly one or two other elements of this uh, legislation which we on this side of the House uh, take some exception to, uh, but uh, by the same token are not proposing to, uh, other than f subsequently if there was a, a committee examination of this that found there were some other problems, would not be uh, opposing. The, the other issue, and, and I, I want to come to a couple of those in a minute, but uh, the other issue, of course, in this is uh, something which, again, the member for Griffith touched on and the reason why I uh, also have an interest in speaking on this bill, and that is that it's, uh, it, what effect this will have on small business. As the Shadow Minister for Small Business, I have been talking to people right around this country about uh, the problems that they're experiencing and what, are the na what is the nature of those problems. And uh, almost to a person, it has been under the broad heading of compliance costs that the greatest aggro has been, uh, has been demonstrated to me. It's all well and good for people like Minister Reith, the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business, to run around and try and whip up hysteria about industrial relations and small business. But at the end of the day, it really is compliance costs. It is, it is the time which small business have to put in above and beyond being out there in retailing and selling at a shop front, being out there in a small manufacturing business just keeping the lathes turning over, being out there in a tourist related industry ensuring the tourists are getting access to the Great Barrier Reef or through diving experiences or whatever it might be. It is the extra time which small businesses, registered as companies, have to put in to keep up the ever increasing burden of compliance, particularly in respect to the paper warfare. And, uh, I know that uh, it was through the Reid Committee report and through uh, examinations undertaken by the government, by Charlie Bell, that uh, this issue was, uh, was, was tackled uh, and some recommendations made. Now, we have on this side of the House some disagreement as to how quickly or otherwise the government has moved in this regard and whether there has been a lasting effect of some of the changes and some of the recommendations in reducing that burden of paperwork. And in fact, I could make a fairly substantial argument that that is anything but the case. And of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think as we get into uh, uh, a, a time uh, in this parliament and in the broader community when the government's secret tax agenda, whenever that's going to be released, comes forward, the secret tax package that's somewhere out there in the ether that everyone keeps talking about but nobody knows what's actually in it, when we come to debating that, we'll also have some comments to make about compliance costs and what effect that that will have on companies that are established under these amendments to the company law. I think it's important as an element of that to drop the three magic letters in this place, GST, because there is no doubt that compliance costs associated with GST for small business is just going to blow them out of the water. Any survey that you care to look at indicates that that's the case. And I thought it was uh, quite uh, therefore appropriate that today, I think it's in The Australian, Ian Henderson does a comparative piece about GST. Uh, by comparing what the Prime Minister has been saying about lowering compliance costs on, uh, on the uh, wholesale sales tax regime compared with uh, what he believes will happen under a GST. And it stands in stark contrast to a report released by the Australian Taxation Office uh, only a matter of a week ago, which paints a completely different picture. Completely different picture. And so when we're talking about compliance costs and the burden of paperwork, obviously, any new small business registered as a company under the changes of the law which this bill that we're debating proposes are going to have to take into consideration those very issues. They're going to have to take into consideration just how much extra time 
they are going to have to put aside to deal with this burden of paperwork, with the compliance that will be on them, to keep every record they have to uh, put forward to the GST police that will be created by this system, and uh, every, every skerrick of information they have, every invoice that comes in, every payment that is made, adjusting their cash registers to keep a record of what is going on. At every turn, small business is going to be placed into an unenviable position of having to master yet again this uh, burden of paperwork that, uh, that is wrapped up in this broad definition of compliance costs. So it was with some interest that the member for Griffith talked about a single page now being required under these uh, simplification processes uh, involved in the company law review bill debating, that we're debating now, and uh, in terms of registering a company. Now there's no doubt that uh, if one could get down on a single page. Uh, instead of 11, 12, 36 pages that, for example, Social Security beneficiaries have to fill in if they want to get into a nursing home these days, it would be quite useful for small business to take advantage of that. And so we welcome that as an initiative as part of this package. But by the same token, I think it is important to say that while small business might get some benefit from a, from a change that is proposed such as that, what about the recommendation that was made by the Joint Parliamentary Committee in terms of the remuneration of executives. This has been something completely left out in this bill. And my friend and colleague, the member for Wills, in his contribution a moment ago, drew the attention of the House to that very fact. I mean, it is so convenient these days, if anybody follows the way major companies operate, they put out their glossy document with all the, all the accounts in the back and their profit and loss statements and everything else. And when you come to the section on executive remuneration, you see a little bit there, and it says number of executives who receive $2 million plus, and they'll have one. Number of executives who receive between $1 and $2 million, and you might see two. Number of executives between $500 and $1 million, and you might see five. But you never know who these people are and how much they're actually getting. Now, in our business, of course, everything we do is open to public scrutiny, absolutely everything. And with the changes that uh, the government has implemented as a result of some indiscretions by members in this place, that scrutiny has even opened it up even further. So everything we do as the representatives of the Australian people in this place is open to scrutiny. We table in this place claims that have been made for travel entitlements. We uh, table in this place our registration of members' interest, and we list in that bank accounts that we have not only for ourselves but for our spouses, for our children. We indicate any real estate we have, any freebies that somebody might give us. For example, uh, if you happen to be going to the Grand Prix next week, and I just let the registrar member's interest know I am and I'll be letting him know that I'm going as a guest of, uh, of a company to that. That's the level to which we have to, in this place, to put on the public record for public scrutiny, tell people what we're doing. Now, is that happening under this company law review bill? Is that happening? Are we seeing how some of these high flyers in corporate Australia are actually um, being asked to manage their own companies? We see from time to time stories being floated in the media about this particular individual is getting $2 million and then uh, the poor the poor son of a gun, uh, he actually had to get, if he happened to be in a company like a, like a bank or something like that, he had to accept as part of his remuneration package X hundred thousand or million of shares that just happened to be going up all the time and therefore the value of his remuneration also happens to be increasing every time the share price goes up. But we never actually get to see, and it's not going to be a component of this legislation to make it mandatory for that sort of information to be disclosed. I think, therefore, that it is a sad reflection on this, uh, this law, on this bill that the government has introduced, that they haven't decided to take that a step further in line with what Labor had been proposing in the bill in its original form. Mr Deputy Speaker, another element which was touched upon by uh, the member for Griffith and I think is worthy of some comment is uh, the way in which we are now seeing the modern age of technology being applied to the way in which business is being done. I think that uh, uh, the concept contained in this bill dealing with the facilitation of electronic meetings and shareholder communications is a most appropriate step forward. 
These days we live in a world of technology where in a split second information is moving right around this globe. And therefore, to suggest that in some way that technology should not be applied to the way in which companies do business uh, is probably a bit of a head in the sand sort of an approach. And so it's, uh, it's most appropriate that the government has included in this bill uh, rules on meetings which recognise the use of communications technology in calling and holding meetings. Uh, for example, uh, companies will be able to serve a notice of a meeting to an electronic address by fax number nominated by a shareholder. Shareholders will be able to send their proxy to the company by facsimile or by email with the agreement of the company. And clearly this is going to reduce the administrative costs associated with the company meetings. Now, I think that's great. I think that's an appropriate step forward, just as is the facilitation of electronic lodgement of annual returns and other documents with the ASC. I think that's appropriate. For quite some time now in the broad community, individuals and companies have had the facility through the Australian Taxation Office, through accountants, to lodge electronically their taxation returns. If we are talking about that segment of the community which is generating wealth and one hopes creating employment opportunities, that is the business community and that is small business, we should be trying at every opportunity to reduce those compliance costs that I've mentioned already. And one way of doing that is by having the facilitation through electronic means of uh, every aspect of their business dealings. I think uh, also, Mr Deputy Speaker, that when we talk about this, uh, this compliance costs issue, with the, particularly now in respect to small uh, in regards to small business, we have to think about some of the commitments that have been given by this government. I mean, the Prime Minister, before the last election, went to the small business community and said, "We promise that within the first three years to reduce the burden of paperwork on you by 50 per cent." And I've got to tell you, if you go and talk to anyone in the small business community, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I'm sure you'll appreciate uh, as you get around your electorate of Throsby and those uh, small businesses that are at Shell Harbour Square Shopping Centre or at DAPDO or at Warrawong, will come and talk to you and they would say, look, you know, we, we heard about this promise, but we seem to be increasing, not reducing, this burden of paperwork that's on us. We seem to be getting all sorts of requests for further statistical information and uh, uh, it's almost to a point where I have to employ somebody else to do this. Now, if you're a micro business or if you're a small business of a, hundred, of a husband and wife uh, combination, for example, you simply haven't got the resources, nor might I say the time, to be spending so much time in doing this. And you certainly, in most cases, haven't got the resources to employ an accountant to do a lot of this work on your behalf. And as a consequence, to say, therefore, that this burden of paperwork has been reduced by any amount is an absolute nonsense. And I think any, any discussion with any small business it is a joke. My friend, the member for Charlton, well knows because in his electorate in the Newcastle area, he knows that I've been up there and spoken to many small businesses in the company of, uh, of uh, our, our candidate to replace him uh, in this place after the next election. And uh, he knows that those small businesses have told me that the biggest sim single impediment to them is the, compliant is the compliance cost burden on them. And I might say, my friend, the member for Patterson, well, I'm pleased he's here because I was up in his electorate recently too. And the small business people I spoke to up there said to me compliance costs in, their, in that particular area, Raymond Terrace and so on, that was a major concern for them. It wasn't all this nonsense. It wasn't all this nonsense about unfair dismissal that you and Peter Ruth go musing around the country floating around and saying, oh, look, you know, we've got to change the laws to so that it's easier to sack people so that there's no protection for the genuine individual who's out there trying to earn a quid, no protection for the genuine employer. No, no, no. According to you and the Minister for Workplace Relations, you're all about sacking people, sacking people, no protection, and what small business wants is you lot Order. off their the back. Member of off their remain back. Silent. Reducing the burden of paperwork. More people in their front door. Economic development. That's what they want. They don't want you up there in their local constituencies slashing all of the government services, Order. Order. cutting Order. CES Order. officers. Order. Honourable Member for Patterson knows the forms of this House and must not interject, so we will remain silent for the remainder of the speech. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, for your protection. Not from you, brother. Not from you. We will continue with the debate. 
As I was saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, the burden of compliance for small businesses is the most pressing issue for them, and the reduction in that burden of paperwork and any review that can continue to relieve them of those problems is welcome. And as I said earlier, the fact that this bill will at least in one or two areas provide hopefully some relief from that is most welcome. I go finally, uh, in the, the time that is left to me, to uh, the issue of the smaller, smaller annual returns uh, proposal contained in the bill. Now, over half of the items currently required to be included in annual returns are going to be removed as a result of the passage of this legislation. This is going to result in annual returns being shorter and less expensive to prepare, and this measure will reduce uh, uh, the burden of paperwork. It's been estimated by the government by 50 per cent. That's a great figure, 50 per cent. We keep hearing it about reducing the burden of paperwork and small business by 50 per cent, but on any objective measure, no one ever gets there. Now, by cutting in half what you're required to put in an annual report, I suppose that's a reduction of 50 per cent, so we'll let you wear that one. That's good. But what we would hope is that by reducing that, of course, the information that shareholders would like to know about these companies is similarly not reduced. I think all the gloss should be taken out of these reports, no doubt about that. Anyone that's been involved with uh, uh, and have, have read through a lot of these company reports know there's a lot of gloss in it, a lot of hyperbole, a lot of superfluous information. I mean, nobody really cares that if the directors went on an overseas holiday with their family. I mean, what they want to know about is if they're an investor in that particular company, they want to know by taking the annual return of that company what profits they have made or what losses they've sustained, what is the long-term plan of that company to redress that circumstance, how are they going to tackle the issue about uh, uh, providing a, a genuine return to investors and to shareholders. And in each and every one of those cases, it is the, sh is the shareholder and the many of those small people in Australia that uh, I know that the government trumpets uh, have now taken a greater interest in, uh, in the stock exchange. It is those sorts of people that are going to continue to take an active interest in this. I happened to be by the uh, Australian Stock Exchange in Sydney the other day. And I was just staggered by the number of people now that are sitting outside the ASX watching the board go by, you know, watching all the lights flash and, all, uh, uh, and the returns and the share prices being ticked over. Now, there is an interest in that now. There is an interest in that. And I think it's through legislation like this that is going to change some of those compliance costs and the burdens and the simplification that I mentioned is most welcome. We've already indicated, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the, the opposition would not oppose this, and we, but we, do, we would like to think that uh, some of uh, the, the more contentious issues, notably about uh, reporting remuneration of, uh, of senior executives, might be reconsidered by the government and perhaps even by a parliamentary committee, as was recommended previously. But the bill itself is a useful uh, attempt to uh, tackle an issue which Labor, as I've indicated, did have in place, and uh, we wish it speedy passage uh, through both houses of parliament. And uh, I think, Mr. Speaker, that just might my, my do me because you're here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, an official photo coming up. Because it's only three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Your wise words on the matter of the well, House. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me take advantage of the of the <laughs> one or one and a half minutes remaining to me. First of all, to convey my personal congratulations to you on your elevation to the position of Speaker. I'd also, Mr. Speaker, like to take this opportunity to uh, express my appreciation to the former Speaker. Uh, Bob Halverston, who I believe, like yourself, I heard you this morning refer to the, the uh, very great dignity that Bob Halverston had brought to that position. But if we were to select, Mr. Speaker, anyone from the opposition, from the coalition government, a, a person to fill that position uh, for the remainder of this parliamentary term, I think that uh, most members of the chamber would, would, would and have appreciated the opportunity for you to do so. Uh, it, was it was mentioned this morning, uh, Mr Speaker, that your, your background of 34 years in this chamber 
has acquitted you in terms of experience and commitment and your own, your own personal dedication to the purposes of the parliament and the nature of this institution to fulfil it. But it was also mentioned, Mr Speaker, as you know, that the opposition said quite correctly that, the, that it will be collectively examining the way in which this, uh, this forum is conducted. What takes place within the four walls of this chamber is of enormous importance to the whole tradition and uh, the complement of democratic procedures in Australia. Regrettably, and, uh, I don't like interrupting you when you're saying nice things seat. about me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But I it being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Before I move on to question time, there are a few uh, words that I might say to the House. The first is that, uh, as we all know, in this adversarial place, question time is probably the most significant of all the parliamentary occasions, is when not only the eyes of each of us as members are on the other, but when the eyes of the Australian public are on us. And uh, I draw members' attention for that reason, both to the nature of questions and the way in which they should be answered. All members should be aware of the contents of Standing Order 144. That lays down very tight conditions on the nature in which questions may be asked and the way in which they should be presented. And I urge all members to take note of those. Secondly, uh, I am aware that uh, there has been a procedure under Section 151 or Standing Order 151 whereby uh, supplementary questions have been accepted at the discretion of the Speaker. I do not propose to exercise that discretion. Secondly, um, I think it is important that we understand. I have suggested your. your as a dispassionate observer of the place, can I assure those who are very vocal in their opposition to that change to say that having sat there and observed the procedure, I haven't felt in any way they have enhanced the nature and character of question time. I would then say that with respect to, uh, to Standing Order 145, that I would ask all ministers to take note. A bit of shush, thank you very much. I would ask all ministers to note the requirement that their answers be relevant. I would say to them that there is a procedure which is identified in Standing Order 101 which sets down a process for ministerial statements that if ministers seek to make a long, detailed uh, answer, particularly read from a brief provided by a departmental officer, it would be far better if they were given by way of ministerial statement. I would suggest also that long answers are inappropriate and do not enhance the procedures of this place. The other aspect of the standing orders to which I wish to draw attention was that under standing order 321 there is a procedure whereby a minister having quoted from a document he may be asked to table that particular paper or document and in uh, response the minister may claim confidentiality. I would say to ministers that uh, I believe in many instances that confidentiality has been abused, that if ministers wish to quote from papers or documents, they are at liberty to take an extract from whatever that document might be so that it may be tabled. I would also say to you that in the normal course, unless that statement or letter or document is stamped confidential, that I believe it should be tabled and I will be requesting them so to do. On that basis, are there any questions? Just I think it might be appropriate if you allow the honourable member Hotham is at the box, and I will not call until you've kept a little shush about the place. The honourable member Hotham. Mr. Speaker, I understand that uh, you said. Do you that seek indulgence? I do seek indulgence, Mr. Indulgence Speaker. is given. Thank you. I understand in your comments, and I'll need to go through them in more detail, but I understood you to say that in relation to supplementary questions, it was not your intention to uh, allow them. Can I draw your attention to the fact that 151 understanding orders does provide for the ability of supplementary questions to be asked? Am I to take it that what you're ruling is that you are going to exercise the discretion sight unseen before the, before the supplementary question is made? 
I intend to follow the practice of speakers in this place in the 35 years of which I have been a member, other than in the last brief time. I call the Prime Minister to advise the ministerial arrangements. Mr. Uh, Speaker, Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Minister for Defence, Industry, Science and Personnel uh, will be absent from question time today. She will be opening the 10th Force Support Unit in Townsville. The Minister for Defence will answer questions in her absence. Are there any questions? Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister aware of the fact that growth in the year to December 1997 was 3.6%, which is both weaker than expected and significantly lower than growth when Labor let off, left office, which was 4.7% in the year to March 1996? Can the Prime Minister explain why Australians should not be concerned that the economy is this soft ahead of the anticipated downturn which will flow from the Asian economic crisis? which, according to today's trade and outcomes objective statement, will lead to slower growth and a reduction in employment in 1998-99. Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, um, the national account figures that were released today show that the Australian economy grew by 0.5 per cent in the December quarter to yield an annual growth rate of 3.6 per cent. For the, an annual growth rate of 3.6 per cent. And that annual growth rate compares very favourably with most other countries. And can I say that if we had not taken the corrective measures that we did when we inherited the $10.5 billion deficit that you left to us, then the Australian economy would not now be as strong as it is. And so far as the Asian troubles are concerned, it is, it is beyond argument that if we had not taken the measures we had taken, Australia would not have the lowest inflation rate in the Western world. We would not have such a high level of business investment. We will not have turned a deficit of $10.5 billion into a prospective surplus. And we would not have, importantly, delivered interest rate cuts to average Australians that are the equivalent of, of, a, of a wage rise of $90 to $100 a week. Now, Mr uh, Speaker, the truth is that if our opponents had been in charge of the Treasury benches over the last two years, we would not have been able to have delivered those interest rate cuts. Wage quiet, and salary please. earners would be $90 to $100 a week worse off in equivalent terms, and the Australian economy would be infinitely more vulnerable to the turmoil now sweeping through the Asia-Pacific region. The Honourable Member for Keong. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and please accept my congratulations on your elevation. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer inform the House of the benefits to the Australian people flowing from the strong growth in the Australian economy as recorded in today's national accounts figures? Yeah, yeah. I call on the uh, Honourable the Treasurer. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for Kuyong for his question. <coughs> uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm sure members of the House will uh, welcome the fact that Today's national account shows Australia growing at one of the fastest rates in the developed world at 3.6 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, good strong growth uh, up around three and three quarter, which uh, is the government's forecast for the 1997-98, uh, is consistent with good employment growth. And I'm sure all members of the House will also welcome the fact that uh, over the last five months, 140,000 new jobs have been created uh, in Australia. That is one of the benefits of the growth which we are now experiencing. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Small Business Survey uh, released today in conjunction with uh, uh, the Yellow Pages showed uh, increasing confidence amongst the small business sector. Uh, it was noted that, uh, uh, that uh, developments in Asia, of course, Not will have an effect holds. on confidence. But, um, uh, Dr Marsden of the Small Business Survey said these words, the impact of the Asian crisis is widely expected to take the gloss off what would otherwise have been near boom conditions, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure all people in small business will welcome that. Mr Speaker, uh, the positive news in relation to the small business sector also showed a remarkable step up in small businesses reporting uh, increases in uh, economic growth and economic outlook. Uh, Mr Speaker, but today's national accounts not only confirm strong growth in the Australian economy, consistent with good jobs growth, but Mr Speaker, it confirmed another record for Australia, an inflation rate down at 1.2 per cent in, uh, in uh, economy-wide terms, Mr Speaker, a, a position that the Australian economy has not been in for many an occasion. 
and it's because of that low inflation outcome that the Australian public will experience another benefit in relation to interest rates, with interest rates down around 6.5 per cent on the home standard variable mortgage, Mr. Speaker, now the lowest home mortgage rate since the 1960s, which I'm sure members of the House will also welcome. That gives young people the opportunity to buy homes which they would never have had under the high interest rate policy of our predecessors. Young people who are getting the opportunity to get security and life to get into a home with a 6.5 per cent interest rate, which they've never been able to do in the last 30 years in Australia. This side of the House believes that strong economic growth and the employment growth that goes with it, low inflation and the low interest rates that go with it, can bring great benefits for Australians and their families. And as far as this side of the House is concerned, Mr Speaker, these are good news results for the Australian public. The Honourable Member for Hotham. Speaker, thank you. My question is directed to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, are you aware that today manufacturing production recorded a 0.6 per cent fall over the last quarter, dragging economic growth down as well? Given the obvious vulnerability of the manufacturing sector, why did the government today withdraw its legislation to implement your car plan of eight months ago? Will you instruct your industry minister to immediately bring the legislation on for debate so that Australian car workers, particularly those at Mitsubishi, can have some job security. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Um, Speaker, my understanding in relation to the legislation is that the withdrawal has not been occasioned because of um, any change of heart in relation oh, to the to the no to the no. It's got nothing to do with that either. I mean, oh, just oh, just oh, quietly, oh, just, just quietly listen. And uh, I mean, you had you had 13 years to get a decent industry policy, and, uh, and, and uh, 13 years to get a decent industry policy, I and asked you failed. Mr. Australian, their enthusiasm. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the the reality is that the uh, the the change is to incorporate um, another aspect of the of the plan, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with any lack of resolve so far as the government is concerned. Mr. Speaker, the the other part of the honourable general's question goes very much to the heart of confidence in Australian manufacturing industry, and it gives me the opportunity to say a couple of things about that. I might remind uh, the House that the industry statement that I delivered on behalf of the government on the 8th of December last year was widely applauded, and rightly so, throughout Australian manufacturing industry. It was seen as striking the right balance between the government taking a limited but strategic role so far as industry is concerned, but avoiding the mistakes of a number of our Asian neighbours who have embraced industry policy that please. were far too interventionist. And, uh, and I mean, I mean it would be very interesting. It, it would be very interesting, be very interesting uh, Mr. Speaker, to comb through the statements made by the member for Hotham seven or eight months ago about the level of intervention that was needed in the economy and have a look at that in comparison with some of the levels of intervention in the economies of the Asian Pacific region, which are now seen, which are now seen as directly responsible for a lot of the economic troubles those countries are now experiencing. I mean, you were in the forefront. Of, of many of many of the statements you were making a few months ago were perilously close to the very models of intervention that are now roundly condemned by the International Monetary Fund and others. I mean, I mean you have been caught red-handed in, in cranking up the desirability of government intervention in the economy. Mr Speaker, what Australian manufacturers want is low inflation, they want low interest rates, they want stability of economic policy. They want the predictability that, that a government surplus, as distinct from the instability of a government deficit, has delivered. And the message I get from the Australian manufacturing industry is that at long last we've got a government that attends to the economic fundamentals and the important foundation, and we have created a climate of growth, a climate of confidence, a little, and a climate please. that has produced 140,000 new jobs over the last four or five months. And that is the greatest vote of confidence you can have in our economic management. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And may I also congratulate you on your election? A little more quiet, please. Look, will you extend the same courtesy to others? That you would expect for yourselves, the Honourable Member Baker. That includes you too. Thank you, Member Borhotham. 
My question is addressed to the Attorney General. I refer the Attorney General to a statement yesterday at question time that Senator Bolkus had released details of confidential federal court documents relating to Christopher Scase. What steps is the government taking to investigate this matter? I call on the Attorney General to provide an answer. Mr. Speaker, I think Just before the... you start, can I say to members, if you persist in intervention, we'll stop the proceedings until you have. The Honourable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Macon for her question. As I said yesterday, Senator Bolkus has been captured red-handed on video, revealing to the media the contents of confidential federal court documents relating to Christopher Scase. Those documents as I said, appear to have been given to Senator Bolkus unlawfully or improperly or obtained by him unlawfully or improperly. The exposure of the information has the potential to frustrate completely the considerable efforts being made to recover SCASE assets overseas. In view of the significance of the leak, the Minister for Justice has requested the Australian Federal Police to investigate it. When he was leaking the contents of the document to the media, Senator Bolkus is apparently recorded as saying, I can't give this document out, but maybe if I just read it off the record. <laughs> this, this is the proceedings in court. A little quiet, please, on the government side. What's Beasley doing? Mr. Mr. Can Speaker, we have a little more quiet, please? The attorney. Mr. Speaker, in the circumstances, there seems to be no doubt that Senator Bolkus would be able to assist the federal police with their inquiries. <laughs> the Australian public has a great interest in this case affair, and there are many creditors owed millions of dollars who have a great stake in the attempt to recover the overseas assets. Mr. Speaker, what should happen is this: the leader of the opposition should instruct Senator Bolkus to stand down and to cooperate with the federal police. Mr Speaker, will the Leader of the Opposition do it? No, he won't. The Leader of the Opposition does not control people like Senator Bolkus. A little more quiet, please. The, lead, leader, the leader of the Opposition, of the opposition does not require his shadow ministers to adhere to any proper standards of conduct. Will, this, will the Leader of the Opposition stand Senator Bolkus down? No, he won't. The Opposition will continue to do whatever it takes to score a political point, no matter what the consequence, no matter how reprehensible the conduct. The Honourable, uh, the Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, the first issue is the Minister was referring I'm to a document. I'm afraid you've got to ask your question. To whom is it addressed? Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister recall his statement to the National Press Club two years ago that, quote, on that great issue of youth unemployment, we have committed ourselves above all other commitments to do something about reducing the tragically high levels of youth unemployment in our community, end of quote. Prime Minister, isn't it true that on the second anniversary of that statement, the youth unemployment rate stands at 28.7 per cent, 2.3 per cent higher than when you made your promise. Oh, yeah. I call yeah. on the Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, by way of, by way of, uh, by way of three, oh, it's a cop-out. Well, uh, I, I, I can understand um, why the Leader of the Opposition, I'm reminded, I'm reminded by my colleague, the Minister for Employment, that the level was 32 per cent when the Leader of the Opposition was Minister for Employment. And not only was the youth unemployment rate 32 per cent, 32 per cent, I mean, 32 per cent, I mean, I mean it was 32 per cent youth unemployment, the general rate was 11.2 per cent, he gave us over a million unemployed and he left us with a, with a deficit of $10.5 billion. That is a trifecta of failure and deceit that hasn't been matched in the Australian parliament ever. But Mr Speaker, I'm asked about the policies of the government in relation to youth unemployment and I want to thank the, the member for Batman for uh, giving me the opportunity of saying a few things about them because uh, it is, as I know the member will agree, an extremely important 
and, and indeed a critical issue. It enables me to remind the House that uh, my colleague announced last year a, a new approach to uh, apprenticeships and traineeships that will create 100,000, not, not 10,000, not 20,000, but 100,000 new apprenticeships. It gives me uh, the opportunity quiet, of, um, of reminding the House that um, the new industrial relations legislation that was introduced by my colleague, the Minister for Workplace Relations, has given far greater flexibility and therefore far more opportunities for the creation of traineeships which are suitable to the needs of individual employers and employees. And I might also remind the House that one of the changes that uh, was negotiated in relation to the passage of that legislation was the postponement of a very foolish proposal from the former government which would have phased out the uh, youth rates allowed under the then and now the continuing law. And if that had not been done, if we had not enlisted the aid of the minor parties in the Senate to do that, we may have put at risk the jobs of over 100 or 150,000, 200,000 young Australians. Now, you were held then on a course of action because you'd been told to take it by the ACTU, which would have abolished the youth award rate that would have pushed up the price of their labour and it would have thrown perhaps 200,000 young Australians out of a job. And you've got the nerve to get up here and pose as a friend of the young unemployed. Uh, but of course uh, the, the evidence, Mr Speaker, of the little indifference little of the chat, Labor please. Party doesn't stop there. One of the things that we have introduced uh, to help uh, instil a, the work ethic and a sense of um, a, a, a better sense amongst young people who are finding it hard to get work is the Work for the Dole scheme, a scheme that has widespread community support, a scheme that is acclaimed by young people as well as the community generally, and at every stage the Labor Party is opposed to, to Work for the Dole. Their instantaneous reaction, and, and you were a prime example of it, you nod your head again, you hate the Work for the Dole scheme, don't you? And if you got back into government, one of the first things you'd do would be to abolish the Work for the Dole scheme. Well, I want to tell the member for Batman that not only has the Work for the Dole scheme been introduced, but in my Federation speech in January of this year, I announced a major expansion of the mutual obligation principle, a principle that says that if people cannot get work, then they are entitled to look to the government for support but the government is entitled on behalf of the community to ask them if they're able to do so to put something back. You don't believe in mutual obligation. You want to destroy the work for the Dole scheme and by your slavish adherence to the union line on award wages, if you'd have continued in office, you'd have threatened another 200,000 jobs for young Australians and you have no credibility at all asking me questions about youth unemployment. Before I call the honourable member for Patterson, there's no need to gauge in this crisp Criss-cross chat all the time. The honourable member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as one of my neighbouring electorates, may I offer you my hearty congratulations on your elevation to the office of Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Before question time today, we had the Shadow Minister for Small Business, the member for Cunningham, stating that small business in the Hunter told him that they did not consider unfair dismissal reforms as important. Minister, when will small businesses in my electorate receive the promised exemptions from unfair dismissal laws so they can get on with the job of employing the unemployed Australians in the Hunter? Minister, who or what is holding up this reform and how widespread is the community support for this move? Minister of Industrial Relations. The Honourable Member for Corwell on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. What is your point of order? Uh, he is drawing reference uh, in, in his uh, under the standing under order on questions, he is drawing conclusions in the introduction to the question. There's no point of order. Fact... The honourable member Patterson, have you finished your question? I call the honourable minister for industrial relations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, I thank the member for his uh, question. It's the Labor Party that's holding up the passage of this legislation, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the bill has now been represented again for a second time to the Senate. And we can only hope that uh, common sense will prevail and that these important uh, reforms for the benefit of small business can go through. Mr Speaker, this has been one of the greatest fiascos of industrial relations policy in the history of the Federation. And really no single measure could have done more damage to the small business community 
than that measure which has been introduced by the Labor Party, introduced by the Leader of the Opposition and the Member for Kingsford Smith, who still sit on the front bench of the Labor Party and whose, whose actions today are preventing the passage of legislation which would actually finally start to fix up the problem which they were responsible for. But it's worse than that, Mr Speaker. Not only is this a record on behalf of the Labor Party of failure, uh, massive failure in respect of uh, the small business community, it's also a record of deceit because if you go around the electorate, in the, in the member for Patterson's electorate, I can tell you what small business are saying. They are saying they want this exemption. And you know why I know that they want what, what they are saying? It's because the, uh, the, the uh, candidate, Bob Horne, the former federal member and the shadow minister for unions over there, had a $100 a head so called function for the small business community. They only got 30 to turn up. They only got 30 to turn up. But the next day, the next day Bob Horne uh, on uh, ABC Newcastle. Uh, said that this issue of unfair dismissal was actually raised during the meeting. Actually raised during the meeting, and he said this. He said, "We've got to try and build up our permanent jobs. Employers are resisting pe putting people on the permanent staff simply because of things like unfair dismissal." So, so, so he 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 denies the problem. His candidate knows what the problem is because small business have said so. But I oh know the deceit. The deceit of these people is absolutely mind-boggling. He went on to say that the reporter asked him, he said, so is there a chance then that changes to those particular areas would be in any ALP employment policy that might be put forward before the next election? Well, he's just had a function with the Shadow Minister for Employment. He's asked the question, might you fix up the problem? And this is his answer. Well, I'm sure we'd be looking at streamlining those factors, yes. So he's saying, so he's out the electorate saying, yes, it's a problem. We hear small business. His, his mates are back here stopping the measure going through the Senate. And even worse, if these, the hypocrisy of these people knows no bounds. Their policy used to be, you know, the draft policy last year, the one that was going to have another review in it. Their policy was. Labor will seek means of giving small business greater incentive to pro provide jobs, particularly for the long-term unemployed, but they took that out because the unions wanted it out, and instead they put in uh, they will support small business, provided that firms meet their social and industrial relations obligations by implementing fair and cooperative relationships with workers and their representatives. And their representatives. This, this is unbelievable, Mr Speaker. The, the small business community, when Labor was in, had a, gov had a government that, that delivered one of the great fiascos of industrial relations, which damaged small business. In fact, right across the board, Mr. Speaker, their policies damaged small business. And when we move to fix up the problems, whether it's unfair dismissal or chasing skates, uh, we've got your little mate up there in the Senate supporting Skates against the interests of small business. Who do you reckon is in the long list of people who are owed money by the fraudulent practices of Christopher Skates? Well, none other than literally thousands of small business people in this country. Another example of the damage you did to small business. And what's your answer to your little mate in the Senate? Absolute, absolute sits there mute and embarrassed when he's got one of his own front benches admitting publicly that he should not be publicly releasing this information. He says, I can't give this document out, a public admission that he should not then do what he proceeded to do. But he says, but maybe if I just read it out off the record. This is a disgrace, Mr Speaker. When it comes to the small business community, not only are you preventing the remedies being put in place uh, to uh, uh, overcome the damage done by the Labor Party when they are in government. Here you are. You have front benchers who are actually supporting somebody like Christopher Scase, and as the first law officer, as the alternate, as the shadow attorney general, publicly admitting that he was wrong to release confidential material on a court file then proceeding to do so. We have it on tape. We've effectively got photos of the bloke, scripts of the bloke, video of the bloke, and this weak leader, this weak leader who so damaged the interests of the small business community, sits here unable to discipline one of his own front benches. I call on the honourable member for Trospect.
A little bit of quiet on the government side, I, please. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to direct my question, Mr. Speaker, without notice to the Minister of Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. And I draw the Minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm, Employment Interactive, has won a tender for 12 employment service sites around Sydney. A little more quiet, Sydney. it's impossible to Isn't hear. it the case, Minister, that this is an unincorporated body? It has no infrastructure, no offices and no employees. Can the Minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Kanda Rowood? Can the Minister also inform the House what probity checks were made on Mr Rowood, who, as an employee of the Islamic Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tendering, is the minister concerned that even low employment this is going very, very has close hung to out, being out of shingle, order. Mr. Rood has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot now I think you might write him a letter. I ask the honourable member to sit down to resume his seat, rewrite the question, and put it in order. Next question, please. The honourable member for Aston. Honourable member Hotham. Point of order, yes, Honourable Hotham. Are you ruling that that question is out of order? That question is out of order. Then I dissent from your you ruling, may, Mr. Speaker. But you've got to do it in writing and you've got to do it immediately. Yes. Speaker, I Can you do it? I don't hear you until you've written it out and I've received it at the table. Right, can I have a little bit of quiet, please? I'll call the Honourable Member Aston directly. Mr Speaker, this is a situation that you have brought upon yourself today because in circumstances in which the minister has been running around the country touting the great success of his new employment initiatives, heralding the fact that what they've got is more entrance into the field, he's been ignoring the fact that the basis upon which the contracts were being let took no regard for the circumstances of previous operators, no regard to the bona fides of people that were bidding for these contracts, no check on them, and yet he's trying to argue the point, argue the point that they've got a much more effective system in place. Mr. Speaker, I would a ask you, quiet, I would like ask to you wise, uh, to dissenting from my ruling apart from anybody else, the honourable member Hoffman. I would ask you to go back and look at this question. Because what it does is it draws attention to an article today in a local newspaper of the member. You are one that has argued consistently that more opportunity should be given for backbenchers to raise issues in this House. And on the first occasion you've got a backbencher up from outside, you have knocked her off. What sort of fairness is that? Well, I think the Honourable General could use a more happy expression. Further though I might be, I suggest you might use a more appropriate form of words. A little bit of quiet, please. You. You. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. The honourable member for Hotham. The other point that was in this question, and these are important facts to establish, so that the minister, who is well known. He's got the nickname Doctora because every time there's a new statistic goes out, he comes round with his little whiteout. Please comes out with his whiteout, manipulates the figures, and ignores questions put to point him on order. the detail. The honourable member Sturt. Point of order. Mr. Speaker, understanding order 100, a dissent in the Speaker's ruling, debate shall be proposed to the House, and debate thereon shall proceed forthwith. I would put it to you that the debate should therefore be about the dissent from your ruling, not about the substance of the question. I thank so you for your assistance. Speaker to order. I thank you for your assistance, but there's no point of order. The honourable member of Hotham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The second, the second point that was raised in her question was that this was an unincorporated body. It had no infrastructure, no officers, and no employees. Now, I would have thought that a minister claiming that they had a better system in place should actually be asked to explain how he can award a contract to someone who hasn't got an office, hasn't got infrastructure, hasn't got employees. What sort of service are these people going to be offering, Mr Speaker? The third part of the question is— A little more quiet, please. Can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made 
on the organisation's principle, no. um, Mr Carter Rudy. And the reason for that is that there were requirements under the past principles that we administered for such, for such financial viability checks to be made. Indeed, I think if you look at the proceedings of the Auditor-General, he in fact requires it. And indeed, if you had have made the viability checks, one would have assumed that, don't you think a little question mark would have raised itself? No office, no infrastructure, no employees. How viable is that, Mr Speaker? I remind you, I are dissenting from my ruling. Yeah, absolutely. That. And I'm telling you why. Because this question was completely in order. It was completely in order. And you have made the decision to rule it out of order to, well, maybe to protect the minister, not on the question of length. And the reason you didn't do it on length is because the member for Patterson, the question before, went on with just as equally a long a question. I might also point out. I might also point Quite out. Point of order, the honourable member for Patterson. I ask him to withdraw that. I find that objectionable. I ask the honourable the member of to withdraw that remark, which the gentleman. But the member for Patterson finds offensive. <laughs> and I would Do you withdraw that remark? With I ask you to withdraw that remark. What remark? The remark to which the Honourable Member for Patterson took offence. A little more. What so it's, it's the normal practice. I'm afraid we're, there is no point of order being taken at this time other than the one by the Honourable Member for Patterson. And I would ask the this Honourable Member for to withdraw that remark. Well, I don't even know what remark it was. But so it you might now... well withdraw it. Well, then I do withdraw right, whatever thank you. You it was. But let me just say, can I have a little bit of quiet on the government side as well as the opposition? Are you going to require the minister, the leader of government, business of the house, and the prime minister to withdraw their remarks when you ask it of them? Unlike being stared down by your predecessor. There is a, another requirement that, if you wish to make remarks of that sort, you make them by substantive motion. So I ask you to move on to your dissent from my rule. I, I, I continue, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I was making reference to the question previously made by the member for Patterson and draw your attention to the fact that his question related to a matter that had already been determined by this House and understanding orders there should therefore have been no capacity for it to be asked, a ruling that has been made on previous occasions in this House. Now, If you want to get technical with the standing orders and reckon you know them, you should have ruled him out. But what we've got is a circumstance in which he has breached the standing orders with the question that he's asked. He's been allowed to ask it, but as soon as one of our backbenchers gets up, you do not allow it. Is that even-handed, Mr Speaker? That's why I'm moving dissent from your ruling. And I continue on in terms of the detail of this question, because it's very important to get this on this record. And you have made a bad ruling today, and you've got to understand why you've made it. It's inconsistent on the one hand, and her question was not out of order. It was Hello, not out of order. Quiet, please. I'm still interested in what the honourable gentleman is saying. I think the everyone would like to hear it. The next part of the question is: Can the minister also inform the house what probity checks were made on Mr. Rude, who was an employee of a council? Now, understand this, Mr. Speaker. He was an employee of a council that made a bid for an employment contract. The council got knocked off—I'm oh, sorry if that term offends in that circumstance too—the council did not succeed, but Mr Ruday succeeded by putting in a, a submission at the same time, a different submission. Now, again, can I just ask you to understand what we're dealing with here in terms of this man this man who argues as minister that he's put in place this great new system, he allows, an offer, he allows a contract to go to someone without an office, without employees, without infrastructure, but worse, this person is an employee of a body working to get that body up and at the same time writing his own the submission. For customs excise. The Honourable Member for Hotham is proposing dissent from your ruling. He must therefore confine his remarks to the appropriateness of your ruling and not canvass the issues of the question. Thank you very much. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I think that uh, there's some truth in what he says. At the same time, I think it's also quite valid 
for the honourable member for Hotham to argue the reason that he dissents, and I believe he's endeavouring to do so. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, what we've got here is dissent from the Speaker's ruling. I'm entitled to say why we're dissenting because his ruling that the question was out of order. I'm saying the question was not out of order. And if you don't understand that as his henchman, if you don't understand that as his henchman, he's even he wasn't silly enough to get up and take that point of order. He cheated you up. I talk Come to in, me and not to the floor. Thank you very much. And then the final part the of the Member question. Member O'Connor on a point of order. Clear reflection on the chair to suggest that anybody is the chair's henchman, and I would ask that that matter be withdrawn and an apology issued to yourself. Thank you very much, Honourable yeah. Member O'Connor. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I didn't regard it as a friction on me. Just remind him you don't need his help too often. Never scored I've always his appreciative life. of him, particularly on his wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. Oh, we all know that. Prime Minister wouldn't reassert his commitment to independence in the House, but he did get up and announce the 40th anniversary of Wilson Tucky. What a sham you are. Oh, there we are. We say, will you reassert your, Can your I commitment to an independence speech and you say happy hand? anniversary? Happy anniversary. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. Let's get back to uh, the matter in hand. The Honourable Member Hotham. <laughs> and then the, then the last part of the question, and bear in mind, Mr Speaker, that you had heard all of those points until the last paragraph that uh, was got to when you, drew her, when you asked her to— uh, I think you made some uh, comment that the question might have been going a bit too long. But, you say, but it then goes on to say, is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rudy has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group? Oh. Mr Speaker, this is the point of the question, and I would have thought entirely relevant to a parliament that's supposed to hold this mob accountable for the way in which they spend public money, to be able to ask a question in this form. One, one the body got a contract. The, the person got a contract. Secondly, the person who got the contract didn't have any visible means of support. Third, that person was bidding for an organisation at the same time as he was bidding for himself. Fourth, were there probity checks to establish whether this, this, quest, this um, contract should have been written? And then the fifth, and I would have thought the most telling point, the point at which you interrupted, which again went to show that this great contract that was being left, it was incapable of being delivered by the person who received it, because the person then contracted it out to someone else. Now, Mr Speaker, I must say, if you don't think that that is a relevant question, then I'm at a loss to know what you think is. Now, well, it is what he said. The ruling was, the ruling, the ruling was, go and get it in some sort of an order. Well, what's wrong with the order in which it came? I mean, what would you do? What would you do? Do you want to understand the order again, Mr. Speaker? Because clearly that leader of government business over there doesn't know any better. But the sequence of events is this. This is the order of the question, and tell me for the life of me how you would reorder it. The sequence of events is that the thing was reported in the newspaper, fact one. The second, the and today. The second is that the body that received the contract was an unincorporated body without means. Without infrastructure, without an office, without any employees. The third was, did the minister seek to ascertain that fact? Did he carry out the probity checks? The fourth was, what probity checks were made of the individual, given that he was not only bidding in his own right, but he was bidding in be on behalf of an organisation, an organisation that lost the contract to him? And the fifth point, entirely appropriate, having got the contract, he then can't fulfil it. Now, Mr Speaker, I am at a loss to understand why that is not in the relevant order. And that's the ruling that you've made. You've said, I'm taking the question out, I'm not allowing the question because it's not constructed in the right order. And that's why I'm dissenting from the ruling. Now, Mr Speaker, we have made a commitment in this place with your predecessor 
and indeed with you today. A little more quiet, please, in the body of the. the by a apartment. speech, I might say. <laughs> by a speech, I might say that was measured by the leader of the opposition, in contrast to those on the other side who sought to welcome you but forgot to do it. I mean, we had the prime minister today reminding you of Jim Cope's dismissal and your court case. I'm sure you were very appreciative of the fact that your pri the Prime Minister drew your attention to that when he thought he was welcoming you to the chair. You had the Leader of Government Business in the House also, also seeking to go on to the uh, Jim Cope there. I think he even forgot to thank you, uh, congratulate you, but don't worry. He's even handed this guy. He didn't even thank Bob Elverson properly yesterday when he fell from the chair. Now, the point we're making is this, Mr. Speaker. We are prepared. We are prepared to cooperate with the chair and try and ensure the orderly running of this house. But we are not going to be mugged. We are not going to allow ourselves. We are not going to allow ourselves to be mugged in terms of putting questions of legitimate importance, particularly backbench questions, particularly questions that relate to the member's electorate, the member for prospect, particularly questions that relate to billions of dollars of taxpayers' money and particularly the questions that are so important in the context of the economic debate at the moment because we believe that the government's employment, program, uh, um, employment policies have failed and we believe the structures they've put in place to try and get people into work have also failed. There's no point then trying to run round the country and say they've created 300 new outlets when they've gutted 1,300 of them. And if, in fact, this is an example of one of the replacement outlets, God help us. I mean, what hope is there going to be for the unemployed in this country? If they're told, oh yes, we've got this great employment agency out in Fairfield, trouble is we can't give you an office address, can't give you a telephone number, can't give you a fax. They haven't even got any employees, by the way, but they're there to help. This is a government initiative. We are there to help. This is the David Kemp solution to problems. We're there to help. Help with no people. Help the unemployed by giving a contract to a body that's got no people to help them get employed. And then this Mr. Rude, Mr. Rude, he wins the contract. No doubt he sees some advantage to him in the way in which the contract's led and his ability to uh, get something for it. What does he do? He goes and hangs his shingle out and, and, and subcontracts his business to someone else. Now, I would have thought, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that that is a legitimate cause for question in this parliament. It's current to the issue of the day. It's the most vital policy issue facing this country, how we deal with the unemployed, how we ensure that assistance is delivered effectively, how we ensure that in terms of taxpayer assistance they get value for their money. Not some shonky arrangement, not some shonky arrangements where the contract is let to someone who doesn't even have an office, a fax, an infrastructure, employees. I mean, this is the question that we wanted answered. And I must say, Mr. Speaker, what you've done, what you've done is certainly have given us time to reorganise the question. We've had 20 minutes to reorganise the question. Trouble is, we would like an answer. But I must say, having argued this point, I find no difficulty with the way the member for Con uh, Prospect have constructed the question in the first place. And I don't think anyone on our side finds difficulty with it. And I would urge you to reconsider your ruling, urge you to reconsider the ruling and allow this question to be answered. The truth of the matter, Mr Speaker, is this. We are prepared to cooperate so long as we are being afforded the opportunity that we're entitled to in this House. That's the opportunity of making the government accountable, making a government that proclaimed in its policy that it wanted to be more accountable. Remember the time it used to float through and say, we're going to be available here uh, more often than the previous government? We're going to make sure that our ministers answer the questions. I was interested in your comments earlier when you came into the chair about the relevance of questions. We will be interested to see how that ruling is enforced, Mr Speaker, because yesterday we had the Prime Minister ask twice 
as to whether he was going to stick to his 40% target on private health insurance. Today, he I ignored the question both fact. times. Ignored the question both times. Mr Speaker, the reason this dissent has been moved, and of course we're reluctant to do it on your first day, but I believe that the ruling that you have made is incorrect. I believe the ruling, if it's to be an indication of what you're up to in the future, will cause a shambles in this House. If you're not going to allow members on our side of the parliament to legitimately ask questions about their constituencies in the context of policy frameworks that we are arguing against, that we have a legitimate difference of opinion about, if we're not being allowed to ask the questions on the detail, the specificity related to the electorate, then there is no point in you. You may as well shut question time down. You may as well, Mr Speaker, because if that's not accountability in its truest form, what is? This is a question asked of a minister about an area that he's been um, proclaiming policy changes to the benefit of the nation in. This is all his own work. But what we seem to have here is a shonky arrangement. Now, he might be able to explain it, only you've stopped him giving the explanation. And you've stopped it because you think the question was out of order. Now, in the, in the time that I've had available, I've gone through point by point, indicating why it was entirely in order. Mr Speaker, I would ask you to reconsider your ruling, allow the member for Prospect's question to be answered, because, uh, 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 asked, and most of all, we'd like to hear what the doctor is up to in terms of his defence. Because if this is the first one that we've found, if this is the first one that we've found, how many others of the 300 are in this category? The public deserves to know. The parliament certainly should. Your ruling is preventing that happening. Yeah. Is the second the dissent seconded? The yes, honourable leader. I second the, opposition. the motion, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I am uh, the first to concede that from time to time the opposition asks questions which test the standing orders to the limit. Yeah. I'm the first to concede that. And uh, I'm the first to concede that from time to time we get our readings of standing orders wrong. And I'm the first to concede that from time to time we and government members will get up and ask questions in this place, the purpose of those questions of which is to make a point and the answer to them is largely irrelevant. These things happen in question time and uh, it's uh, part of the robust exchange and speakers enforcing the rules we might, from, might from time to time interrupt that process. But there are occasions in the House when questions are actually asked that refer to the classic purposes of question time, and that is the purpose to hold a government accountable. That is why question time exists. It doesn't actually exist for other purposes. The other purposes have been grafted onto it. And holding governments accountable go to, uh, goes, of course, to the impact of their administration, the consequences of effects of their administration, and, uh, and, of and may from time to time, provided to win the other framework of the standing orders, go to their legislation. It does seem to me that you had an opportunity to rule out of order one question so far asked during the course of question time, and that was the one prior to that asked by uh, the, uh, the honourable member for Prospect. That was the one asked by the honourable member for Patterson. Because if you go to what standing orders say a question must contain, it says this. A question should not contain statements of facts or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated. B. Arguments. C. Inferences. D. Imputations. E. Epithets. F. Ironical expressions. Or G. Hypothetical matter. And there are other elements of it that ask you, you can't ask for expressions of opinion and uh, you can't ask for announcements of government policy and the rest, uh, the, and the, and the rest of it. And nor can a question, a question cannot be debated. So if you go through all those particular elements and then go to the honourable member for, for Patterson's question, what you will find throughout it is argument, you will find inference, you will find epithet, ironical expression. You'll find all of those throughout the, that member's questions, and that member's question was challenged in this place, and a ruling sought from you, and your ruling was to uphold it. That was your ruling. And uh, that, so, as the media and others pass judgment on this debate today, a debate which we will lose because of the numbers in this place, I would urge them to look at the question 
asked by the honourable member for uh, uh, honourable member for Paterson, and then look at the question asked by, by the honourable member for Prospect, and ask whether, on this first day of a new speakership, the opposition has been dealt with by with consistently and with comparative fairness. Now I go to the question that was asked, and the first phrase in that is this. I draw the minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm employment interactive has won a tender for 12 employment service sites around Sydney. Now, is that a statement of fact or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated? Well, they can be authenticated. We can produce the article that appears, and uh, I wouldn't have thought that there was an item in that which was in any way unnecessary. Is there an argument in that sense? No fair person would say there was. Is there an inference? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Is there an ironical expression? Or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is nothing of that in any of those parts. So I go to the second phrase. Isn't it the case that this unincorporated body has no infrastructure, no officers and no employees? Statements of facts? No. Uh, unnecessary? No. Arguments in that? No. Inferences? No. Imputations? No. Epithets? No. Ironical expressions? Or hypothetical matter? Now, of course there is none there. Of course there is absolutely nothing of that in that, uh, in that particular point. Because the, because the simple fact of the matter is that uh, if you are going to establish a case that there has been in some way or another an inappropriate activity, an abuse of process, uh, asking a question about whether or not there is an unincorporated body that has no infrastructure officers or employees, as the article indicates, that is an important thing to consider. And then the next point is, can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Carter Rude? Is a name mentioned here unnecessary to the context of the question? No. Is there argument there? Could I ask is the members inference? on my left to be a little quiet is so we can all hear the Leader of the Opposition? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Because they're not talking is there an ironical the expression? Lot or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is none of that in any of those cases, a, that's, and that is the third point of asking, as far as that question is concerned. And then there goes, can the minister also inform the House what probity checks were made on Mr Ruday, who is an employee of the Islamic Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tending? Is there in there an unnecessary statement of fact, an argument? an inference, yeah, an yeah. imputation, an epithet, yeah, an yeah, ironical yeah. expression or hypothetical yeah, matter so in any of those items in that particular question. How else can you ask them? If you, believe, if you believe on the basis of information that is presented to you that actions have taken which may potentially or may be improper in relation to the administration of a person's portfolio, I ask you in all fairness, how could you ask the question in any other way? And then it goes on. Is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rude has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot deliver on the tender? So I ask you again, is there any statement of fact in that which is, uh, renders the, the question, question in some way unintelligible? Is there argument? Is there inference? Is there imputation? Is there epithet? Is there ironical expression or is there hypothetical matter in that that uh, is uh, in some way or another rendering that phrase the final phrase of the question the final phrase of the question an inappropriate question I think in all honesty Mr Speaker you have probably picked on the one question we have taken so far that even the most stringent scrooge like interpretation of the standing orders could not have permitted you to rule it out of order. The one question thus far asked, probably in fact in debate today, the one question asked on either side of the House, the one question asked on either side of the House that probably actually conforms to the most Scrooge-like interpretation of stranding orders. It didn't require a smidgen of generosity on your part, not a smidgen of generosity. The question asked by the member for Patterson, which will be inspected, I am sure, now by the media and others who are interested in this judgment on your first ruling and your first dissent motion on your first day, they will make a compare and contrast exercise on that question which you ruled in order. 
And uh, when they do that compare and contrast exercise, they will find a very large element of inadequacy lying at the very heart of it. At the very heart of it. And, uh, and when they do that, when they do that, of course, you will find uh, your, yourself in a situation, unfortunately, of some degree of embarrassment. This is an absolutely essential role for an opposition and for private members, the ability to ask questions on matters like this. It is even more the case because the particular minister to whom it was directed has made an art form of abusing those other elements of the standing orders that you have drawn attention to from time to time and in your opening remarks. And that is the, uh, a, a wide, irrelevant canvassing of his portfolio and a blowhardery of unsurpassed dimensions. And yesterday, indeed, and yesterday, indeed, this minister was up with these tenders that we are referring to. Well, this is a selection of tenders from those tenders that he is referring to, beating his chest and telling people what marvellous opportunity has been presented to them. So that other element of question time, that accountability, this is not something invented out of the air by the opposition, plucked out of the air by the opposition. Uh, it is a matter that goes heart and centre into a matter of public importance now before this nation, which this minister has been openly canvassing questions for himself on, these, on this matter and has been let off it now. Now, it's also a fact that the organisation, the, is the Islamic Council, has had cause to complain yeah. about the affairs of Mr Ruda. He's had this to say. They have indeed written to Deitcher and said this about it. Actions by one of our employees during the recent Deitcher tendering process may have breached the guidelines. It may also have compromised our tender for provision of employment What's services. That, Mr Carter Rude has uh, said he'd submitted an independent tender while helping to prepare our own tender. Oh, Mr Rude had worked intimately with our own submissions for Flexi 1, Flexi 2 and Flexi 3. This matter has been raised at our last management committee meeting and Mr Rude was asked to resign. He has since done so and a copy of his resignation is attached. What we have here is a classic a classic case of accountability, Mr Speaker. An absolutely classic case of accountability. This is an organisation in the community with a, a legitimate quiet, concern. Please. This is an organisation with a sides. legitimate concern. This is an organisation which has made its concern public. This is an organisation dealing with the government at a, at a crucial point, a critical point, of the delivery of an important part of government services. This is an organisation which has been gazumped by one of its employees who does not have an operation but has been successful with 12 tenders. This is, if, if question time means anything at all, if question time means anything at all, then these matters ought to be capable of being subject to question in the way in which they have been subject to question by the member for Prospect in this case. If that is a question that is out of order, then there is no, then there is no capacity for question time to function effectively. You may have been somewhat worried by the length of the question. I suspect in the error that you have made that perhaps you had that in mind. And therefore, I would ask you then to have reference to the question asked by the member for Patterson and this particular question. I am sure that you will find in length that there is no difference between the two as far as length of question is concerned. And it just may have occurred to you and caused you to make this ruling in the way in which you did the fact that you were slightly embarrassed about the ruling you made on the member for Patterson for a question that was clearly out of order and, uh, and, uh, and therefore determined that the next time you got hit, the next time you got hit, you would actually do something about it. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, you have manifestly come across the wrong target, the worst conceivable target that you could have picked up. We have here an absolutely clear-cut case of accountability. I have been through all those points, and not a, a reasonable person could not have made a judgment that there are unnecessary statement of facts or reference to persons in it. There was not argument, inference, imputation, epithet, ironical expression or hypothetical matter in any part of that question at all. Not one word. Not one word. Now, I think the Leader of the House is about to get up and, uh, and defend you, as is his melancholy duty. And uh, he will no doubt say he will no doubt say during the course of it that somehow or other this whole question amounts to an argument. Well, I am afraid not. 
Argument is canvassing the issue. There was no argument in any single one of these sentences. In every single one of these sentences, it was the eliciting of information and to the point. And to the point. And only the most appallingly tendentious interpretation could be placed upon any element of it uh, to discount that. Now, Mr Speaker, I do understand that you wanted to come into this place and assert your authority on this, uh, is this your first day in office. It is an understandable thing for you to want to do. And uh, I do note that you did say, apart from asking us to stick to the standing orders as far as questions are concerned, you asked the other side to, uh, to stop their enormous digressions, irrelevant abuse and all the rest of it. You didn't put it that way, but that was the implications of what you said. I am afraid to say that we would have to suspend judgment on the extent to which that part of question time has been enforced, because as far as I can see, although, though they were delivered at a lower level of decibel, the length of the answers that we have had so far, their argumentative quiet, nature, please. their levels of irrelevancy and all the rest of it have been pretty much up to standard practice. That's pretty right. much up to standard yeah. practice. What has not been up to standard practice, however, has been our questions because we have sought at this Little question quiet, time please. to on phrase our side, questions yes. in such a way and on your that they come too. within what we anticipated your sorts of rulings would be. And of all the questions we've been asked, this of all the questions has not one single jot or tittle of any offensive part, any offensive element to standing orders in it whatsoever. I am afraid to say, Mr Speaker, though you will win this particular vote as you must, because it will be a vote along party lines, it's a very, very bad start indeed. Yeah. The question is that my ruling be dissented from. I call the Honourable the Minister for Workplace Relations and Sport Business. Uh, thank the Leader you, of the House. Mr Speaker, the government will of course uh, uh, oppose the dissent from your ruling uh, on the grounds that a case has not been made out. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I was not surprised after hearing the manager of opposition business, I was not surprised that the leader of the opposition felt it necessary to himself uh, speak in this debate to try and salvage uh, the claims being made by the manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, can I start by saying that the uh, this uh, motion uh, graphically demonstrates to the House the wisdom of its choice earlier today, and uh, in particular the two characteristics you bring to the House, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, uh, patience and tolerance, which is uh, uh, an essential ingredient in dealing with uh, those opposite, and a touch of humour thrown in for good measure. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, an extensive knowledge of the standing orders which I want to demonstrate, uh, Mr Speaker, is certainly the case uh, on this uh, occasion. I was interested in the remarks of the uh, uh, Leader of the Opposition who, who said that this uh, question did not contain any uh, argument. But I, I distinctly heard him say, and I wrote it down at the time, he said words to the effect—we can check the hands hard later—but he said that the words in the question were necessary to establish a case. Those are your own words. I mean, during, during your own presentation, you actually substantiated the argument against your own motion of dissent. It was one of the most pathetic presentations I've seen. And to have, to have the manager of opposition business you know, stand and move a dissent ruling uh, against the first ruling from the new speaker is like the novice standing and telling the expert that the expert doesn't know what they're talking about. It's like the Minister for Finance with a $23 billion deficit in his last two years telling the Treasurer how to balance the books. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a... I don't remember hold up on a point of order. I saw you musing and I thought I'd just prompt you, but you did draw my attention on a number of occasions. After you'd repeatedly when... extended beyond the norm. So you're going to allow it There's now? No Is that a new precedent, no Mr Speaker? The Honourable the Minister. Oh. Uh, well, sadly, Mr. Speaker, those sort of uh, uh, smart remarks from the manager of opposition business only betray his real attitude. Mr. Speaker, in support of the uh, ruling, quiet, please. Uh, in support of your uh, uh, ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to refer to the standing orders, which we didn't hear much of when the uh, leader of the opposition spoke, uh, but. Uh, 
and I don't do so for your benefit, Mr. Speaker, because you clearly uh, appreciate the uh, import of them. But for instruction of uh, members of the opposition, a little bit of uh, it's uh, appropriate to refer to them. Um, the first one I want to refer to, uh, Mr. Speaker, is uh, Standing Order 147, which is alteration of question. And uh, I presume, Mr. Speaker, you had this in mind. You certainly. Uh, reflected 147 in your first remarks to the member for Prospect. Uh, 147 says, the Speaker may direct that the language of a question be changed if it seems to the Speaker unbecoming or not in conformity with the standing orders of the House. My, my memory of it is, of Mr quiet, uh, Speaker, please. that in a fairly generous spirit, after your patience had been tested by the member for Prospect, reading out a question which had been drafted for her by the Hopeless Tactics Committee in the Opposition. You did then invite her to uh, come back later after she'd had a chance to redraft her question. I must say, Mr Speaker, I thought that was a very generous uh, gesture on your part, and uh, that was the first thing that you did. Mr Speaker, under uh, section, uh, Standing Order 147, the, word, the relevant words I want to point out are uh, that you can require the, the uh, language to be changed if the words of the person asking the question are not in conformity with the standing orders. So the question, the question then is, well, in what respect was that question uh, in breach of standing orders, and uh, which standing orders therefore should we turn to? Well, Mr. Speaker, there are actually a number of standing orders which support the decision that you've made. Um, 144 is the obvious one, but it's necessary also to refer to Standing Order 153. Questions shall not be asked which reflect on or are critical of the character or conduct of those persons whose conduct may only be challenged on a substantive motion, and notice must be given of questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons. Uh, well, I, I have the interjection. <laughs> I don't know anything he said. I mean, really, this, this is. Uh, well, I mean, the words speak for themselves. I will now read from House of Representatives practice uh, something which I direct the Leader of the Opposition to read for a first time. On page 515, it says, Questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons cannot be asked without notice. And then it goes on to say, The purpose of the rule is to protect a person against criticism which could be unwarranted. A question on notice does not receive quiet, the please. same publicity and prominence Could as I a, a question without. Quiet, please. I call the honourable minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the words of House of Representatives practice could not be more crystal clear. They say a question on notice does not receive the same publicity and prominence as a question without notice, and the reply can be more considered. So, so. Uh, the first thing you would say about this uh, question or series of questions is that they, they couldn't have been more clearly in breach of Standing Order 153. And in fact, the Leader of the Opposition uh, went through the various parts of the question uh, which he claimed, uh, which he claimed uh, were uh, you know, free of uh, or in conformity with the Standing Orders. Well, I'm, I'm gratefully read them out because. Uh, these are the things that this is part of the question that he read out. Um, he says uh, part of the question was what financial checks were made, and he says, "Oh, that's a totally neutral question. Totally neutral question." Well, I put it to you. I put it to you that that was a that the whole purpose of this Honourable question Dennison, was to raise a Honourable Prospect. The whole purpose of the question was to raise a question mark to make a criticism of a tender and the tenderer, which has been the responsibility of the minister. A, a, further, quiet, a further question which supports this uh, was that part of the, the question which, prospect. which said uh, what probity checks were made on a named individual. Now, what is that? What, is, what was the whole purpose of the question put to the Minister for Employment? The whole purpose of the question was the to make some allegations about the propriety and the uh, uh, financial sense of offering or providing uh, a contract to a named individual. The whole purpose of the question Honourable was a character assassination on a, on a named individual as you wanted to secure what you believe is a few cheap political points for the Labor Party. And uh, one of the questions uh, which was read out 
in part by the Leader of the Opposition, contained the words as I wrote them down that uh, Mr R cannot deliver on the tender. Now, what is that if it is not a claim that a named person is unable to fulfil their obligations under a contract uh, presumably to be let to the Commonwealth? Uh, that, was, that was in the question. It is in breach of Standing Order 153. That is what he said. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm a the, of Brisbane. The, whole, the whole purpose of the question, as he the went on to expound in his defence uh, of uh, this dissent ruling, the whole, the whole basis of the question was in fact an attack on the financial probity and the character of this particular named individual. So, Mr. Speaker, on, uh, on the question of a being in breach of uh, the standing orders on 153. Uh, it's 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 an absolutely open and shut case. But I mean, it's even more it's even more definitive than that. The uh, from the Could psycho, I more quiet, the please, cycle, the front bench. Well, I mean, there's a lot of psycho babble coming from the other side. But this is the Mr. Speaker. This would be the clearest case of a ruling being uh, in conformity with the standing orders that I have seen for a very long time. And in respect of uh, the, the balance of the standing orders, Leader of the opposition, I'm going to get him to keep quiet. In, in respect of standing order 144, uh, questions cannot be debated. Now, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition Honourable made it the quite clear the that Bacandra. the purpose of the question being put uh, was, in fact, to, uh, in the form of a question. Uh, make an argument against the conduct of the Minister for, for Employment. Now, Mr uh, Speaker, on those grounds alone, uh, there is absolutely no doubt under uh, Standing Order 153 you were entitled to, uh, uh, in a generous spirit, suggest to the member that she go away and redraft a question. Uh, that needed to be founded on some aspects of the Standing Orders and based uh, on uh, the uh, question and the import and intent of the question, it was clearly in breach uh, of those uh, parts of the standing order which prevent character assassination during question time, questions without notice. They prevent, they prevent a, a question which is, uh, uh, which is uh, to be debated, because standing order says questions cannot be debated. Uh, questions should not contain arguments, inferences or imputations. And it's quite clear from the statement made by the Leader of the Opposition that that was the whole purpose uh, of the question in the first place. So, Mr Speaker, uh, on any fair, reasonable analysis uh, of that question, uh, your ruling was entirely in conformity with the standing orders, entirely in conformity with the House of Reps practice. It couldn't be clearer, and you can only conclude, therefore, that the tactics committee, someone, the leader probably said to Simon Crean, "Oh well, we've got a got a new speaker, so Simon, you know, as soon as you get a chance, whip in a uh, a motion of dissent." And the only thing you didn't tell Simon is, make sure if you've got a motion of dissent, you've actually got some basis. Make sure, make sure, Simon, that you actually have a case that you can mount. And uh, uh, the the fact that the leader of the opposition, after hearing the most pathetic performance. In fact, I would say a juvenile performance by the manager of opposition business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After hearing that, he clearly felt sufficiently embarrassed that he himself had to, to uh, rise and to try and defend and salvage uh, the uh, dissent ruling that they put. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I don't think we should waste the house, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the yeah. time of the house, anymore. Uh, this is an absolutely open and shut case, and I move that the question be put. The question is: Is the question be now put? Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. no. Is the division required? Division required. I call the clerks to ring the bells.
I'd feel a lot happier if I were able to defend myself, but I can't in these circumstances. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. Uh, lock the doors. I bet that'd be a good idea. <laughs> lock the doors. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. The nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose. Oh, you did, right. <laughs> I keep about forgetting about locking the doors and things like that.
Thank you, Madam Tiger. The result of the division is ayes 87, noes 46. I declare the motion carried. I therefore put the question that the ruling I gave, that the question by the Honourable Member for Prospect was out of order, be agreed to. Be agreed to. Those in favour of the question, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Aye. Is the division acquired? Division being required, ring the bells for one minute, it being a successive division. I ask members to take note of those provisions. I ask uh, all members, please, to take their places as quickly as possible. Eyes will move to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Angamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose.
The result of the division is noes 87, ayes 46. I'm pleased to be able to tell you that the motion of dissent is lost. I ask members to return to their place as uh, quickly and as soon as possible. I'll give you that. I ask members to return to their places as quickly as possible, please. I call the honourable member for Aston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Trade. Can the Minister outline the Government's trade success, successes and wins last year, and can the Minister also detail the significance of the recently released Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement? The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Member for Aston for his question and recognise his role in the, the committee system. I want to make the point that overarching all in respect of trade last year was an all-time record $104 billion of exports in both goods and services to the world and beyond Asia as we sought to diversify beyond Asia. So some of the countries increasing in exports, Iran up 71 per cent, Egypt up 51 per cent in the Middle East, South Africa up 31 per cent, and the Minister Moore and myself conducted the first joint ministerial in South Africa mid-year last year, and Mexico up 24 per cent. And turning to the trade outcomes and objective statement in absolute terms, detailed in here is some of those breakthroughs. And with Mexico, uh, with negotiations as we injected real energy into the Point bilaterals. Order, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the you, you uh, in your opening remarks, you referred to the point that uh, ministers ought not to be making, answering questions in the way of the nature of statements. Yeah. The Honourable Minister has made a statement in this House today about these matters, which has now been adjourned for the debate. He has picked up the report about which he is supposed to have been making a statement and is making yet another statement on it. I would urge you, in the light of that, and given the fact that the question was not pointed to any particular uh, issue of the day, but it invited precisely the same sort of statement that he has already made, that you ask him not to renew it. There is some merit in the point of order, but I call on the Deputy Prime Minister to take note of that and to conclude his answer as quickly as possible. Speaker, happily, a little fact, bit of quiet, please, in the I, opposition. And I the wish government. to uh, add in uh, some additional information uh, uh, to uh, some aspects of the statement. In terms of that, I, I just remind the House, he may not like it, but we have put energy into the bilaterals. You neglected the bilaterals for years. And the words for that come from John Button, not from me. Uh, we put effort into uh, getting uh, increased market access. And coal, a canola, quiet, wool to Mexico, to give one example, but in the services area. Japan to open up the insurance market previously closed to Australia. And so I could uh, go on to detail other countries. I think what uh, we ought to realise, Mr Speaker, is very clearly, if we hadn't tackled your $10.5 billion deficit, our exporters would not have been and have a secure basis on which to operate. If we had not restored the economic fundamentals, our exporters could not have reached that $100 billion level. If we uh, had not have, uh, pursued the bilaterals, we would not have the improved market access we have today. And since the statement, since the period covered by the statement, to acknowledge the point taken by the Leader of the Opposition, I emphasise in the seven months since, we have in fact uh, put in an extraordinarily good export performance against the odds notwithstanding everything that is happening in Asia. And the reason we have done that is because we have been proactive on the bilaterals for our exporters, a balanced budget strategy, and providing real and direct and focused assistance to ensure that our exporters have a fair go. I call the honourable member for uh, uh, Jollybrand. It's my question to the Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. And I refer the Minister to his recent announcement of the outcome of tenders for job network employment services and his claim that the new, new network is focused on results. I ask why is it that in the Melbourne Metro West region the top three private providers under current contracts have received no allocation at all for Flex 3 and very little for Flex 1, 
despite one provider being a finalist in the Quality Agency of the Year Award last year and another notifying the second highest level of vacancies by private providers in the whole of Melbourne. Why is it that others with much less performance in Melbourne West have been substantially funded at both levels, and in what way do such outcomes represent focusing on results? I call the Honourable Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Well, would you mind keeping quiet? Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Jellybrand for his question. The job network that the government is putting in place is going to provide greatly improved services and assistance to unemployed people in getting jobs. And it will do that for quite a number of reasons, but it will do it in particular because there will be many more job vacancies provided by the agencies in the job network. There will be many more sites available to unemployed people to get assistance. Some 1,404 sites will be available for basic job matching services and other services compared with less than 300 um, through the CES at order, the present the, time. The Leader of the Opposition, I ask the Minister to resume his seat. And before I call him, can I ask all members to desist from the constant high level of uh, conversation that makes it extraordinarily hard for anybody to hear anything? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. I take a point on 145 relevance. The question specifically related to three providers in Metro West region. If the minister is unfamiliar with their performance, then perhaps what he ought to do is take the question on notice. But this is a statement. There's no need to give him a lecture. It's not a point uh, of order, please. I call the honourable minister. He takes note. Oh, come Would on. you please keep quiet? I will give my ruling when it's appropriate. I can call the honourable. Are you going to persist? And, and the. Uh, All right. Thank you. I call the honourable minister and ask. Would you please sit down? I am giving a ruling as I'm calling the minister. Thank you very much, and thank you for your impertinence. I call the honourable minister and ask him to take note of the matter of relevance to which the leader of the opposition referred. And I am quite capable of taking a ruling and giving a ruling without your assistance. Thank you very much. The, 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 question, the honourable minister. The question, Mr. Speaker, ad addressed the results well, you won't be here that would be coming it. from the job uh, network and. The most important result is that there will be a focus on getting unemployed people jobs. Now, within the, within the West and Inner Melbourne area, there are over 25 contracted providers. They have been selected on the basis of quality and value for money. They, every, Well, of course, the member for Hotham, this the member for, the member for Hotham, of course, Thank you. value for money to the taxpayer was of no concern to him, because he spent $500 million on a program that cost $143,000 a job. Now, Mr. Speaker, in the context of the tender round for the establishment of the job network, there were over 1,000 organisations which tendered. Over 1,000. Every organisation went through, first of all, a very rigorous financial viability check. A very rigorous financial viability check. A little more quiet, please. And, and secondly, a very rigorous scrutiny of the quality of the quality of the tender. Quiet, the quality of the tender which was made. Now the, the payment the system is a results based system. Because for the first time, the successful tenderers will be paid according to their capacity not to place people in programs, not to turn them around to change the statistics on unemployment, but on the basis of their capacity to get people into jobs and take them off benefits. Within the, within the West Melbourne area, uh, one of the successful tenderers there, and it is somewhat invidious to name them, but I do just uh, identify one or two to give members of the House a sense of the quality of the successful tenderers in West Melbourne. Uh, Mission Australia has been contracted uh, to provide uh, uh, new uh, enterprise incentive scheme uh, payments, that is, NICE services. Uh, there has been uh, a contract provided. Uh, with the Russian Ethnic Representative Council of Victoria, uh, obviously to provide services to a particular section of the community. 
uh, there has been uh, a contract uh, provided to the Salvation Army, uh, an organisation which has enormous respect to provide intensive assistance to the most disadvantaged job seekers. And one of the ways in which the job network quiet, is focusing on results uh, and one can be you, quite confident will achieve results is because by far the largest Honourable financial incentives because by far the largest financial incentives being paid to providers will be paid when the most disadvantaged job seekers are assisted. Uh, another tender, a successful tenderer uh, in the West Melbourne area was Job Futures Limited, who got many contracts uh, for sites around Australia and is a consortium of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence and uh, a number of other major uh, community providers. So there can be no question of the quality of the organisations, their links with community, their experience, who will be carrying through the government's commitment to unemployed people and particularly the most disadvantaged people. Every one of the organisations that the member for Jellybrand mentioned had a chance to tender. They may well believe, and maybe they will have, provided good services in the past, but in the end they were not as competitive as the organisations which got contracts. A little more and quiet, please. They, they were subject to the most close scrutiny as to their, as to their outcomes, and members of the public can be very confident, very confident in the quality of the organisations which have received contracts under this tender process. Let me say finally, Mr Speaker, that the entire tender process was subject to the independent probity auditing of Blake Dawson Waldron, and Blake Dawson Waldron have signed off that they are entirely satisfied with the probity with which the tender has been conducted and with the fairness of the whole tender process I to the every Minister single tenderer. Thank you. A, a point of order. Pursuant to sec um, Standing Order 321, I would ask the uh, Minister to table the document from which he was reading. Of course he was, you dope. Were you reading? I asked the Minister. The Honourable Member of Hotham could desist from his intervention across the table. If he persists in that, there is no need for him to behave in that way. Is the Honourable Member reading? The Honourable Minister is going to table the document. I call the Honourable Member for Hughes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware of spending and revenue proposals which would lower the income and living standards of Australian families? I call the Honourable Speaker, the Prime Speaker Minister. in answer to um, the Honourable Member for Hughes, um, uh, I have over the past few weeks uh, become aware of some uh, spending and revenue proposals emanating from the member for Dobell, uh, who is the Shadow Minister for Health, that would directly attack uh, the living standards and the disposable incomes of ordinary Australian families. To start with, the member for Dobell, if he were to become a Health Minister in a Labor government, would immediately take away the $450 a year tax rebate for private health insurance. I mean, the, the member for Dobell for the, last, for the last six months has been running around Australia. Every time he opens his mouth, he tells us how unnecessary and what a failure the health rebate has been. And one can only conclude that the policy of the member for Dobell, if he were to become health minister in a Labor government, and presumably if a Labor so government were to be elected, he's the shadow minister for health, then his first act would be to increase the private health insurance premiums of average Australian families by taking away the $450 a year. But of course, Mr Speaker, it doesn't end there. On top of that, the, 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 very same, the very same shadow minister for health over the last six months has racked up spending commitments of between five and six billion dollars over a four-year period. And uh, you go through the list, he's, uh, he's committed himself to completely reverse the savings that were made in relation to therapeutic premiums. He's committed himself to completely reverse, uh, uh, rather he's committed himself to support in full the additional demands made by the states in relation to the Medicare agreement. And those two commitments alone add up to about $2 billion, $2 billion 
over a period of four years, and you can go through them item by item, list by list, and you get to a situation where the shadow minister for health has committed himself to spending proposals of a Labor government of between five and six billion dollars over a period of four years. Now, I mean, I mean, you can't. It's about time. And I put, the members, I put the members of the opposition on notice. It's about time that they realise that this business Later. of being in opposition is not a sleigh ride. You can't run around the country slagging everything the government has done. You can't run around the country saying that, that, a, that a particular health subsidy is of no account. You can't run around the country promising to reverse spending cuts and then imagine that nobody on the other side is going to do their sum and ask the very fundamental question of where the money is coming from. So on two count, he's going to take away the private health insurance premium and that will increase by $450 a year the premiums of an average Australian Honourable family. So I say to all of those average families that have got health insurance, if you vote Labor, your premium will automatically go up by $450 a year. And not only not only will that happen, but if you vote Labor, if you vote a Labor, bit of quiet, you are going to you are going to lose that that interest rate cut equivalent to a pay rise Canberra. of hundred dollars a week. And why is that going to happen? It's going to happen because if a Labor government were elected, they would put at risk the budget surplus that we have built up over the last two years. If you elect a Labor government, they will embark upon a spending spree, and you've got five or six billion dollars already from our little mate from Dobell. Our little mate from Dobell's already given us five to six billion dollars, and by the time the by the time we're to finished, the Prime Minister to resume his seat. Uh, well, the member for Dobell. Um, no, no. I'm we're think, finished. The honourable Prime member Watson on a point of order. The honourable member Watson. Thank you. A little bit of quiet, please, from both sides. The Honourable Member Watson, have you a point of order? Yes, Mr Speaker. Earlier you allowed the Leader of the House to reflect on a senator in contravention of Standing Order 75. You are now allowing the Prime Minister to reflect on a member in contravention of Standing Order 75. If you look it up or get him to look it up, will you, will you make them comply with the Standing Orders? Thank you. I believe both of them are. I call on the Honourable Prime well, Mr. Minister. Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, can I say that I... I thought, in, I thought in the Australian lexicon, little mate was pretty endearing, actually. But, um, um, but if, if, the, if anybody on the other side is offended by it, well, I, I unqualified. I would have thought of the last 20 years. That's a pretty endearing expression. Uh, Michael, I wouldn't get offended at that. People have called you much worse things than that. But if you are, if you are, far be it from me to give any offence to anybody on the front bench of the opposition. But can I just? Can I just say, Mr. Speaker, a little that bit of quiet, this, please. You know, this, this is not a Hand costless on the government game. Side. You can't have the luxury of being an opposition that nobody takes any notice of, and that you can run around the country saying, "Look, vote us in, and we'll, you know, we'll spend another three or four billion. Uh, vote us in, and we'll fix all this up." At the end of the day, what your political opponents do, and what the commentators do, is they start doing their sums, and they start saying, "Hey." If he's against the health insurance premium, that means he's going to take it away. And if he's going to if he's going to spend all of this money, then that's going to have a consequence. And you know what the consequence will be? It'll be higher interest rates. Because if you blow out government spending, you'll have a you'll have a large government deficit, and those interest rates will go up, and that $100 a week will disappear. Well, Mr. Speaker, can I say that this is instalment one? of getting back to reality and living in the real world and making the opposition understand that you can't go around the length and breadth of Australia making all sorts of reckless spending and all sorts of reckless taxation promises without being drawn to account. You are irresponsible when you're in government, you're being irresponsible in opposition, and I ought to give you notice that over the next few months the Australian people are going to find out just how irresponsible and how out of touch and how irrelevant you really are, and I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Can I suggest that there's no merit? Actually, I'd also be interested in a few of you keeping quiet. 
I call on the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition a question to vote. Yes, I have a question to you, Mr Speaker. Will you reconsider your decision announced at the outset of question time today that you won't accept any supplementary questions at all during your tenure in this chair? And if you won't reconsider and change that decision, will you please supply to the House a reasoned statement of how that decision is consistent with Standing Order 151, which reads, as you well know, and I quote, questions may be asked without notice. At the discretion of the Speaker, supplementary questions may be asked to elucidate an answer. I ask in particular, will you please explain how it can involve the exercise of a discretion when you've made it clear that your practice will be to invariably rule out supplementary questions in every case without listening to the terms of that question in any particular case or having regard to the particular context or particular circumstances. Is it not the case that to so rule and to so act would involve not the exercise of discretion, as you are obliged to uh, do under 151, but rather to involve the exercise of an absolute prohibition? a prohibition and that that interpretation would apply in any court in the land if this were to be so tested. Is your decision, I further you ask you— You are asking a question, not giving a lecture. I suggest I'm asking, you now return your Well, if you're going to sit seat, me down while I'm asking you questions, well, you've created an intolerable you situation. Well, I draw your question to conclusion, you're not giving a lecture. I'm Will asking you, you to have regard question? to that particular question in giving your response. I'm also asking you to have regard with this how is, your decision is consistent. Your question is far too long. Please draw it to a conclusion. I'm asking you to please supply to the House a statement of your reasons you for that decision. You have already that. I asked you to draw your seat. I am asking order, you to have you... regard to the specific language of 151, which refers to you an answer. You have already asked that once. I haven't, no concluded. I haven't concluded by referring well, to 503 Will you please conclude your question? What other questions do you wish to ask? I am asking them, Mr Speaker, and if you listen, well, you will hear Well, at the moment, you are arguing, you will ask him. I suggest I'm you ask and argue. Will you please, in any statement that you make now, or hopefully in a more reasoned basis later on, indicate how— I take how that as a reflection on the chair. I will give a reasoned answer, as I wish not a more reasoned one. Thank you. Will you please have regard to the particular language of 151, which refers to an answer rather than answers generally in responding to my question? I would further ask you, if you are having regard to the traditional practice of this House, would you please make it clear how it is that that traditional practice can override as explicit a language as that which is contained in 151, and would I further ask you to have regard to the, the account of that practice as it's evolved on pages 503 and 4 of House of Reps practice, and in particular the conclusion that there that this is a practice undergoing further evolution, and would you I please explain you why it is that that decision that you made today is consistent with a further evolution when in fact it involves apparently a sharp U-turn on existing the practice? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. If you like to look at Standing Order 151, it says at the discretion of the Speaker, I'm exercising my discretion. Are there any further questions to the Speaker? The Honourable, you have a personal explanation, though, not a question. I need to make a personal explanation? Yes, I, a personal explanation. I, I call claim to have been misrepresented. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during question time, the Prime Minister claimed that I and the Labor Party uh, had publicly advocated the abolition of the government's uh, health insurance tax rebate. Uh, what I have said, Mr Speaker, is that Richard Court is right, it's a dud, Jeff Kennett's right, it's money down the drain, but we have never said that we would uh, scrap the tax rebate. We'll announce our policy before the next election. The second misrepresentation, Mr Deputy Speaker, you heard what I said. The second, mis mi second misrepresentation, Mr Speaker, is the Prime Minister claimed that I and the Labor Party had made commitments to spend billions of dollars on public hospitals. What we've said, the one commitment we've made, and it's, everyone knows it, is that public hospitals will be our highest priority, and we certainly won't be slashing federal funding for public, public hospitals like this government has. Yeah. Well done. Statement to these presentation papers. I call on the Leader of the House. Mr. I'm Speaker. sorry, there's a further question to me. I call on the Honourable Member for uh, Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, is it the case that uh, this morning, that by order of the presiding officers, that the uh, defenders of native title were prevented from linking hands around the Parliament House? Uh, if so, given that they were able to do this last year, I would ask that you investigate this matter to determine precisely what threat to parliamentary democracy was posed by their so linking hands. I have no idea of the affair. I will make inquiries and respond to the honourable member in due course. Uh, I call on the Leader of the House, Stephen uh, Mr Speaker. Uh
A little bit of quiet, please. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Papers are tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings and Hansard. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Melbourne proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted. Could I ask the Honourable Gentlemen please to resume their seat? I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Melbourne proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the Government's approach to improving waterfront productivity. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their place. The Honourable Member for Melbourne. Here he goes, Jack Burns. Oh, oh, Jack Burns. Uh, Jack Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, enough time has been wasted today. I move that business of the day be called on. Question is that the business of the day be called on. Those in favour, please say aye. Against, no. Is division required? Is division required? Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the business of the day be called on. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, their nose to the left. I call on the honourable members Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina to be tellers for the aye, and the honourable members for uh, Fowler, Maribyrnong and Port Adelaide tell us for the no. Result of the division is ayes 78, noes 46. I declare the motion carried in the affirmative. Call on the, the Minister of the Table, the Minister for, uh, for uh, Communi no, Family Services will do. Uh, <laughs> community Services. If you can organise something else, I'll probably do. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, um, I present the Child Care Legislation Amendment Bill 1998. First reading. First reading. Oh, oh, sorry, we have to go back a little. I move that notices one and two government business be postponed until the next sitting. The question is that notices one and two be postponed the next day of sitting. Those in favour, please say aye. Against no. Uh, the motion is carried in the affirmative. The Honourable the Minister. You're going to read it? Yeah, I call on the clerk. Government Business, Notice Number 3, Child Care Legislation Amendment Bill. I call on the Honourable the Minister. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I present the Child Care Legislation Amendment Bill and uh, present one signed copy thereof. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You're going to read that? Yeah. First reading, a bill for an act to amend legislation right. relating to child care and for related purposes. The Honourable the Minister. Now we're getting it. I move the bill now be read a second time. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Child Care Legislation Amendment Bill as follows the passage of the Child Care Payments Act of 1997 last year, where the government uh, received numerous representations about the likely administrative impact on parents and on services which would flow from its full implementation in April 1998. 
I've just been told to talk slowly. As a, as a result, I announced on the 23rd of January that the government has decided to defer the implementation of the changed payments arrangements aspects of the bill until a childcare card or similar technology is available, known as the smart card. This technology will allow us to introduce a system which is more efficient for all parties. To implement this decision, this bill seeks to defer implementation of the Child Care Payments Act 1997 and to amend the Child Care Act 1972 and the Child Care Rebate Act of 1993 to allow the implementation of the other decisions taken in the 1997 budget and reflected in the Child Care Payments Act 1997. The bill introduces a head of power to allow the work-related circumstances of a family to be, taken, to be taken into account when determining the amount of childcare assistance payable. Using this power, a limit of 20 hours of childcare assistance per week will be introduced for children of non-working families. This measure ensures Commonwealth funds are more efficiently targeted to the primary objective of the program that is, work-related care. The limit will be applied following the same policy parameters would have been used under the Child Care Payments Act of 1997. Work-related care is defined by reference to the Child Care Rebate Act 1993 and includes care required by families where both parents uh, or the single parent is working, looking for work, studying or training. It includes families where one parent is working and the other, because of a disability, is unable to have work-related commitments or care for their child or children. The bill also provides for exemptions from the 20-hour limit. Families in receipt of child disability allowance for any child will be able to access more than 20 hours of childcare assistance in respect of all their children in care. Children at risk of neglect or abuse will also be able to access as much childcare assistance as they need as will children of families in crisis and children who have two disabled parents. Order the Honourable Member for Prospect. Deputy Speaker, to the State of the House. Quorum, requ quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum present, Minister. 
Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank my colleagues for coming in. Finally, uh, as I was saying, exemptions will exist for operators where they are the sole provider of care in an area. Guidelines setting out these exemptions will be in the form of a disallowable instrument presented to the Parliament. A disallowable instrument will be made available to the Parliament which sets out the full detail of how the 20-hour limit will be applied. In many areas of Australia, there are too many childcare centres, while families in other areas have little or no access. The Child Care Payments Act 1997 sought to rectify this situation by imposing an effective limit of 7,000 new places per year over the next two years. With the deferral of the Child Care Payments Act 1997, it is necessary to amend the Child Care Act 1972 to provide for this limit. Guidelines setting out the requirements for approval of places will be presented to the Parliament in the form of a disallowable instrument. The government has also indicated its strong commitment to measures which encourage parents to properly immunise their children. The Child Care Payments Act 1997 contained provisions which required that children be immunised to qualify for child care subsidies. This bill replicates the immunisation requirements contained in that Act and ensures that there is no further delay in implementing this important health initiative. Appropriate exemptions will be made to ensure that children at risk of abuse of neglect are not subject to these requirements. Guidelines for this purpose will be in the form of a disallowable instrument and will be presented to the Parliament. Finally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill introduces for the first time confidentiality provisions into the Child Care Act 1972. These, provi these provisions follow very closely the provisions of the Child Care Payments Act 1997 and are necessary to ensure that families' information is secure. Order. Does the minister present an explanatory? Well, I think I already have. Yeah. have you? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I present a copy of the explanatory mem memorandum duly signed. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The honourable member for Jagger Jagger. I move the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order today for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Notice number four, National Residue Survey Administration Amendment Bill. The Minister for Veterans Affairs on behalf of the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Sir, Deputy Speaker, I present the National Residue Survey Administration Amendment Order. Bill of 1998 and present a signed copy of the bill. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the National Residue Survey Administration Act 1992 and for other purposes. Minister. Deputy Speaker, I, uh, I move that the bill be now read a second time. The purpose of this bill and the accompanying bills is to consolidate 22 levy impositions acts into two acts for ease of administration and to correct technical faults in the national residue survey legislation. These amendments will not involve any new impositions on industry. The national residue survey implements residue monitoring programs for agricultural products under the National Residue Survey Administration Act of 1992 which also provides for recovery of the costs of national residue survey programs from participating industries. These programs form the basis for documentation enabling the Australian government to certify that food is not contaminated by chemical residues. This documentation is a requirement for access to the European Union, United States and Japanese markets and is also a requirement for access to Australian domestic markets for all meat products under the Agricultural and Resource Management Council of Australia and New Zealand Health Standards. It is therefore very important that the Order. National Residue the Survey Program. The Minister will resume The Honourable Member attention to the State of the House. Order. Quorum required. Ring the bells.
or a quorum present. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is therefore very important that the National Residue Survey programs operate smoothly and that their funding base is secure. The government has been advised that the legislation supporting the National Residue Survey programs has technical faults that have the effect that liability to pay the National Residue Survey levy is dependent on, upon liability to pay another primary industry levy. This was not the original intention of this legislation. It was intended that, in order to reduce collection costs, National Residue Survey levies would be collected at the same point in the process as other primary industries levies, but not that one would be dependent upon the other. The current situation means that some industries wishing to participate in National Residue Survey monitoring programs will not be able to do so, that is, those industries not already paying another primary industry levy. The legislation is also being amended to ensure that the National Residue Survey levy on onions is valid. Because National Residue Survey levies are now seen to be dependent on the payment of other primary industry levies, there is a problem where that other levy rate is set at zero. This is the case for onions. There is some question as to whether a zero rate can trigger the liability for payment of a National Residue Survey levy. To clarify this, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Act is being amended to ensure that levy payments made on onions in the past have been validly collected. The amendments are designed to ensure that the National Residue Survey levies can now operate on a stand-alone basis. There will be no change at all to the amounts being paid or the basis for calculating levies for any commodity. However, in the case of horticultural commodities, a maximum levy rate of 2 per cent of the gross value of production is being inserted in the primary legislation to accompany the possible inclusion of new horticultural commodities at a later date. This provision will have no effect on the operative rate of levy of, for any commodity. Levies will still be set at the current rate for each commodity group. There are Mr. Deputy Speaker, negotiations underway at the moment with a number of horticultural commodity groups that could lead to their inclusion in the National Residue Survey monitoring programs. This approach will speed up the process of bringing these new commodities into the programs when the need arises. The bill also repeals the 22 National Residue Survey Levy Imposition Acts, the contents of which are consolidated into the two other bills in this package, that is the National Residue Survey Levy Customs Bill of 1998 and the National Residue Survey Levy Excise Bill of 1998. So, Mr Speaker, this move is being undertaken as part of a streamlining of portfolio legislation and should provide improved access to portfolio legislation by members of the public and make its administration simpler. I commend the bill to honourable members and present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The honourable member for Werribee. Keep your order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. National Residue Survey Customs Levy Bill. The Minister for Veterans Affairs on behalf of the Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. I present the National Residue Survey Customs Levy Bill of 1998. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to impose national residue survey levies that are duties of customs. Minister. Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill is a part of a package of three bills. The purpose of this bill is to consolidate into one act the five National Residue Survey Levy Impositions Acts that impose duties of customs. Consolidation will make the legislation more accessible to the public and provide for greater ease of administration. The bill imposes levies that are duties of customs on five commodity groups to replace the relevant Impositions Act Acts repealed by the National Residue Survey Administrative Amendment Bill of 1998. I commend the bill to honourable members of the House and present the explanatory memorandum. 
Order. This debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Warrawa. I'll move that way, Mr. Speaker. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. National Residue Survey Excise Levy Bill. Minister. I present the National Residue Survey Excise Levy Bill of 1998. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to impose national residue survey levies that are duties of excise. Minister. To this speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill is part of a package of three bills. The purpose of this bill is to consolidate into one act the 17 National Residue Survey Levy Impositions Acts that impose duties of excise. Consolidation will make the legislation more accessible to the public and provide for greater ease of administration. The bill imposes levies that are duties of excise on 16 commodity groups to replace the relevant impositions acts repealed by the National Residue Survey Administration Amendment Bill of 1998. I commend the bill to honourable members and present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The honourable member for Werriwa. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The speaker has received a message from the Senate acquainting the House that the Senate approves the proposal by the Joint House Department for capital works within the parliamentary zone being the installation of drinking fountains in the public gardens and on the tennis court pavilions of Parliament House, approved by the presiding officers on 3 December 1997 and presented to the Senate on 3 March 1998, and returning the following bills without amendment or requests. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 1997-98, Appropriation Bill No. 3, 1997-98 without requests and appropriation bill number 4 1997-98 order i have to report that the main committee has been unable to complete its consideration of the insurance laws amendment bill 1997 and returns the bill to the house for further consideration I present a certified copy of the bill. What well, I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. There being no objection, I'll allow that course of action. The question now is that this bill be now read a second time. The Parliamentary Secretary Cabinet to the Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I just want to uh uh, make some summary concluding remarks on behalf of the government in regard to the insurance laws amendment bill. I think uh, like everybody is in agreement with this and uh, I guess uh, in the, the parliament here I know that a lot of people don't realise outside that uh, we often agree on legislation in here and uh, this is one of those... Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we often agree in here on many, part, many pieces of legislation and uh, this is one of those pieces of legislation in which uh, there is support to across the parties. Uh, just very in summary, this bill um, amends the Insurance Act 1973 and, uh, and the Agents Brokers Act 1984 and the Insurance Contracts Act 1984. The main purpose of the bill is to amend prudential supervisory arrangements under the Insurance Act for Lloyds of London to improve the security arrangement for Lloyds underwriters Australian policyholders. It also brings the supervision of Lloyds more into line with that of corporate insurers in Australia. The bill reduces burdens on people taking out insurance policies in relation to their duty to disclose information to the insurer. And uh, I think uh, everybody in Australia who's taken out insurance policies have been asked, uh, you know, is there anything to declare? And uh, most people sort of flick through their mind and they're sometimes unaware of the extent of what that question uh, infers. And uh, this legislation means that uh, the people giving the policy have to go through a series of questions so that people have a better idea of what is implied there. And so, therefore, there is greater security coming from this legislation for consumers in Australia. 
Additionally, the bill also brings marine pleasure craft owned by individuals into the Insurance Contracts Act, thereby providing a better level of consumer protection to private boat owners, and I'm sure there are many people who will welcome these measures in this area also. I note that the opposition has supported this bill, particularly the provisions relating to the improver, improved consumer protection measures. I also note the concerns expressed by the opposition in relation to insurance cover for people affected by the recent disastrous events in Catherine and Townsville. The government is also concerned to ensure that people who have suffered losses as a result of these unfortunate events and any people who suffer losses in the future are able to have certainty in relation to their insurance arrangements. In view of the government's concern in this area, the Insurance and Superannuation Commission is consulting with representatives of the industry to that end. And could I just thank those people who participated in the main committee and I commend uh, this legislation to the House. Order. The question now is that this bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to insurance and for other purposes. Order. The Speaker has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General recommending in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Order. I understand it's the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith. There being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Chifley is trying to get my eye and Mr. call. Mr um, Deputy Speaker, I draw your attention to the state of the House. Order. Quorum required.
Order. A quorum not being present, the chair will be resumed at Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to insurance and for other purposes. Order, I have to report that the Telecommunications Amendment Bill No. 2 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee. A Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation for the purpose of the bill has been reported and the bill has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand there is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. There being no objection, the question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Thank you. Leave is granted. Parliamentary uh, Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Act 1997 and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the NRS Levy Imposition Bill 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. Again, I understand it's the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Therefore, the question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask leave the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose the NRS levy and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the Customs and Excise Legislation Amendment Bill No. 3, 1997, has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to with an amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill together with a schedule of the amendment made by the committee. I understand that it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. There being no objection, I'll allow that course of action.
The question is that the amendment made by the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. The parliamentary secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading Order. forthwith. We're moving Sorry. smoothly, but not that smoothly. I've oh, got to put right? the question. All right? Another question. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill as amended has been agreed to. Parliamentary secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Order is leave granted. Leave is granted. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Oh, oh. Yeah, leave is granted. Yeah. You, you've moved it, and I'm now going to put it that this bill be now read a third time. House to move it. Now we, moving. We granted it, and you've moved it, and we'll move on. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Order the. Order the question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye, and if the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading: a bill for an act to amend legislation relating to customs and excise and the Australian Postal Corporation Act 1989. Clerk. Government business order of the day number two: company law review bill. Resumption of debate on the second reading. Order the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Charlton. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Company Law Review Bill 1997 is one of a trilogy of bills uh, which uh, were initiated uh, by the former Labor government in uh, 19, October 1993 when it established a corporations law simplification program. Now, the aim of that was to rewrite the corporations law to make it easy to understand and to remove unnecessary business regulation. Now, as I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that gave rise to three bills, one of which uh, received at least part of its sec the second reading debate uh, this morning. That was the uh, Managed Investment Bill 1997. Uh, which uh, dealt essentially with, uh, with uh, what used to be referred to as, uh, as unit trusts. This, the, the sister bill, uh, which we are now currently considering, was really the first of that trilogy. Uh, as I say, it began life under the Keating government as the second corporate law simplification bill. And its intention was one of turning the Companies Act into plain English. It was referred in 1996 to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities, which reported in November 1997. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, as, I, as I've said, the purpose of this exercise was to ensure that the corporations law would be simplified. And although the, the, uh, corpora uh, the company law review bill 1997 that we're now considering has, uh, has a, total of, uh, a total of 384 pages and looks fairly substantial and, as I say, is one of a trilogy of bills, uh, that represents a very significant reduction in terms of volume uh, to the law before. And of course, it's couched in much better language. The, uh, the corporations law or the company law over a period of time not only has become um, inappropriate in terms of its lang language expression, but uh, it has also, over the years, accumulated uh, what has now, to a very large extent, become redundant provisions. So that the opportunity hasn't simply been one of simplifying the wording of the legislation, but also one of ensuring that, uh, to uh, a significant extent, it was brought up to date. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've got uh, some reservations which I want to take the opportunity uh, later to indicate, but the, the, and in case I leave myself short of time, what I want to do in the first instance is to refer to a 
practical question which has been brought to my attention uh, by one of my constituents. Now, my constituent is uh, Mr. Bruce McQuirter. Uh, now, Bruce McQuirter has a relatively has a, a a business operating in a relatively small town within my electorate of Charlton of Yee, quite a small town. Now, Bruce has uh, Bruce registered his the name of his business as Yee Computer Services. Now, clearly, that's not. Uh, it hasn't been incorporated. It's not a private company. It was, as a result of that, it was uh, registered under the uh, state provisions with the Department of Fair Trading. Now, that's not the preferred name that uh, Bruce McQuirter would have chosen for his business. But when he suggested to the Department of Fair Trading his preferred names, and they carried out a very comprehensive check against other names of other businesses in New South Wales, they indicated to him that he would have to change it to ensure that there was sufficient differentiation between them, which he did with some reluctance. You could imagine then, and of course I'm, what, the point that I'm making there, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that, he was, that that precaution was taken under the provisions of state legislation exercised through the Department of Fair Trading. You could imagine then the surprise that uh, Bruce McQuirter experienced when he found that there was another firm operating uh, which was known as YE Computers Proprietary Limited. Now, of course, it's a private company. It comes under the Australian Securities uh, Commission uh, registration provisions and under Commonwealth law. And the provision under Commonwealth law is that any uh, company, any firm, can adopt a name as long as it isn't 100 per cent. Uh, the same as an existing firm. Now, I accept that there are good reasons for that. I understand, for example, that there are about 80,000 companies which are newly registered each year. I understand that there are about 2 million firms currently registered in Australia each year. But I don't believe that it's beyond our capacity and, above, uh, and beyond the capacity of computers and, and beyond as well an exercise of of a reasonable degree of subjective judgment, where two firm names are seen to be so similar that some type of uh, constraint uh, couldn't be exercised to ensure that there is a minimum of confusion uh, about it. Uh, I know that there. I, I think the the requirement under federal law, Commonwealth law. Uh, to clearly differentiate was abolished by the previous government in legislation which we introduced then in 1991. So I'm not seeking to absolve myself or, or a, a previous Labor government uh, from blame, but I do simply point to the degree of confusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, which can be caused as a result of our uh, failure, I believe, to take adequate steps in, in that area. Could I just refer to the provisions of the legislation in relation to this particular question? Uh, in uh, section 3.3, in relation to the naming of, uh, of companies, it says, when a company is registered, the AS of the Australian Securities Commission, the AOC, allocates to it a unique nine-digit number called the Australian Company Number, the ACN. Uh, a proprietary company, of course, uh, may adopt its ACN as its name. Now, the fact that so very few of them operating out in the public market arena do that is for obvious reasons. If it does so, its name must contain the words Australian company number, which can be abbreviated to ACN. For example, then the company's name might be ACN 123456789 Proprietary Limited. Now, there could be some which operate just with their Australian company nu uh, number, uh, but as I say, if they're working out in the public market, the, uh, the arena of the public market, I doubt that they would utilise that type of uh, nomenclature to uh, identify themselves and to uh, uh, use it for you know, business promotion, business uh, publicity, goodwill 
profit-making purposes. So they tend to use a registered name in addition to uh, being re required to have, of course, the Australian company number. And if they're required to do that, I think it is appropriate that consideration be given to some type of arrangement which can ensure that uh, sufficient differentiation takes uh, place between them. I think it's an oversimplification. Could I say generally as well, Mr Deputy Speaker, in relation to this legislation, we are dealing with uh, you know, le legislative constraints on the operations of companies in various areas. Uh, the attempt has been made to simplify it quite correctly. The attempt has been made to take out superfluous regulations quite correctly. But the only reason that the that governments involve themselves in uh, regulations for businesses, or the only reason why they do that, is to ensure, first of all, the protection of consumers, secondly, the protection of the shareholders of the, or the, the owners of the particular corporation, thirdly, to protect one business against uh, the behaviour, deliberate or otherwise, of another, and uh, often as well to, uh, well to achieve certain types of um, social uh, and national objectives as well. So that our, our, while our objective certainly should be to minimise the, amount of the volume of regulations and to simplify them and to put them in, in uh, simple language, we should always be careful, and I'm sure that uh, the departmental officers who have been involved in this exercise have attempted to be as careful as they can to ensure that uh, we don't take that too far and lose sight of the reason why uh, corporate, uh, uh, why uh, uh, legislative enactments uh, need to be made. As I said, the October 1993 exercise by the former Labor government in establishing that simplification program um, had as objective to remove unnecessary business regulation. And I emphasise particularly that word unnecessary. Now, the objectives generally of the, uh, of the company law review bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, is oh, yeah. to improve the efficiency of corporate regulation and to reduce those regulatory burdens on business and other users of the corporation's law. And the burden is not just one in, uh, of resources, not just one of time, but it's one of uh, the, the, uh, the financial uh, responsibility, the financial liability which is placed on companies to not only to comply with the law, but to, uh, to guarantee that they have sufficient expertise available to them to understand what the law says, how the law should be interpreted and how they should react to it. And that's expensive. And for that reason, of course, the, uh, the efficiency of uh, corporate regulation is of uh, particular importance. I appreciate as well the support which the business community has given to this exercise. Why would it not? Cumbersome, uh, difficult language, confused, redundant, inappropriate legislative constraints and requirements on the way in which uh, businesses operate are expensive to them. They have supported the exercise, but there are certainly aspects of this uh, legislation, the preceding uh, legislation, the Managed Investment Bill, and the third one, which I believe uh, will be completed perhaps uh, and available for uh, public review in April of this year, uh, the one which at the present time is known as the Corporate Law Economic Reform Program, Reform Program, the one which, which continues this whole process then into other, other areas of company and corporate law, uh, for uh, uh, certain aspects of, uh, of those uh, bills, Mr Deputy Speaker, about which some sections of the business community have been concerned, the one that I referred to may be in, t in, in the total context of this uh, relatively minor, but for that small businessman in YE, in my electorate, it's a matter of, of substance. He has developed uh, 
his own uh, business goodwill that is an asset to him. He has, uh, and of course that in includes the, the quality of the service that he provides, uh, the, the, uh, the extent to which his clients and customers can feel confident in him and depend upon him, and then for another firm to be able to establish with such a similar name, I think, uh, as I, I said, the, the uh, concerns that he uh, expressed as a result of that and the reasons for those concerns would be quite apparent. And I say that as well in the context of uh, more recent advice to me that the firm which then established its itself and registered a name under the Australian Securities Commission provisions, Commonwealth law, as the YE Computers Proprietary Limited, has subsequently changed its name. Now that leads, if, if in fact that's true, and I believe that it is, that leads me to the belief that that firm did not set up with that name in order to capture the goodwill of uh, Bruce McQuirter's business. But had it chosen to continue with that name, and had it chosen to adopt that name in order to capture the goodwill and the business of, uh, of that other firm, uh, it apparently would have been able to do so. So I refer that matter, that particular matter, uh, to, the, uh, to the government. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill that we're considering now rewrites and makes significant improvements to the core areas of registering companies, meetings, share capital, financial reports and audit, annual returns, deregistration of de defunct companies and company names, to which I've made reference, with a view to facilitating business and investment. And while there will be transitional costs because the core company law provisions are being replaced, the provisions that are replacing them are more streamlined and easier to comply with. In addition, the draft legislation that was exposed for public comment in June 1995 uh, gave people within the business community and with uh, people who acted for them legally an opportunity to examine it. The result is that most users of the corporation's law are now already familiar with the overall direction and the content of the bill. The provisions as, uh, uh, covered by the bill in the existing law are complex. They use complicated uh, legal concepts which are unfamiliar to most business people and impose excessive regulation. Of course, the need for them then to get uh, specialist expensive legal advice for the interpretation of that law is another source of, uh, uh, another source of burden to them. Mr Deputy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I said that this bill was one of, a one of a trilogy of bills, and I said the third one, which I understand and I hope will be available at least in draft form by next month, if it's not yet available. Uh, that the corporate law economic reform, pro reform program will complete, uh, I think, a very comprehensive and a very important approach by this government and the preceding Labor government in this area. I said it's been popular with the business community. Uh, the results of it should be apparent. I, I would congratulate in particular uh, the, the uh, bureaucrats, the people, the people from the bureaucracy who have had a responsibility, of course, in drafting this. I know the extent to which they have conferred with the business community. They've done that very deliberately. The business community has been more than welcome. The, the business legal uh, profession uh, has always, to my understanding, always found uh, um, ready uh, uh, acceptance uh, by those members of that task group, and it's to their credit that they have completed well two bills now, two bills that have been con uh, considered on this one, this one day, and the other one then will uh, apparently become available later on. That third one that I referred to, the corporate law economic reform, pro reform program, if it's still being called that. It will deal with six areas where reform is, is being contemplated. That will cover accounting standards, directors' duties, prospectus reform, takeovers, electronic commerce and a, com and a combined area in uh, securities and derivatives. Just finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to make reference to well, a whole range of, uh, of uh, elements of, uh, of this legislation. As, uh, 
which have been simplified. Many, many pieces have been chopped out, which, as I say, have become redundant. Uh, one example that I'd like to give just before I conclude is the fact that the, that the old concept of par value for shares is one which will go by the way. It's outlived its usefulness. Uh, it uh, isn't any longer a very useful uh, concept. And, that gives an, and, and the reasons for that are apparent, of course, I think, uh, in the material which has accompanied this legislation. Uh, some of the others, I say, the, the government has considered generally that companies should be free to decide for themselves whether they should be, for example, in their annual reports preparing management discussion and, and analysis for shareholders instead of being compelled to do so by law. I've got some reservations about that. I think the, Order. If the, compel the compulsion was there, then the corporation itself and the board of directors uh, could determine the, the content of that presentation for shareholders. The honourable member for Curtin. Mr Deputy Speaker. The bill makes substantial amendments to the corporation's law in the procedures that are required to establish and run a company, as well as recognising the increasing importance of electronic communications in doing business in the 1990s and beyond. It also seeks to improve those provisions which deal with company annual returns, share capital, financial statements and uh, the deregistration of defunct companies and company names. There is a consensus that these amendments being sought to Australian corporate law in this bill are principally based on an economic analysis of the law. That is, they are designed to simplify regulation, thereby reducing the cost of doing business for Australian corporations while improving compliance levels by making the law easier to understand. Both of these aims are desirable and entirely supportable, Mr Deputy Speaker. However, as Mr Tony Greenwood, journalist uh, with The Australian, has observed the government's Corporate Law Economic Reform Program CLERP, <laughs> of which uh, this bill is one part, is motiva motivated by other important factors. On 27 November 1997, Mr Greenwood uh, wrote, CLERP has by no means been captured by that branch of economics that puts market freedom above all else. It's also about investor protection, business ethics and compliance." Unquote. In 1996, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia CEDA, produced a report into the impact of government regulations on national competitiveness. The, ba the, uh, the uh, the report uh, found that, and I'm quoting from it, the basic aim of regulation is to improve overall social and economic conditions. Regulation should only be applied if it yields a substantial net benefit. For this goal to be met, new regulations must be at a minimum, be well designed, well managed, otherwise regulation is likely to be counterproductive." Unquote. The CETA report went on to note that uh, governments should could not afford to view a particular reform measure in isolation, but rather in the wider context of existing and future regulatory regimes. It is in this uh, wider context, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the merits and shortcomings of the Company Law Review Bill 1997 need, to be, uh, need comment. On the whole, I believe the government has got it right. The coalition has committed itself to a, uh, to a continuation of the tax law improvement project. While this bill is independent of that project, it is entirely consistent with the intent of TLIP. What sets this bill apart from TLIP and gives it greater credibility is the immediacy of the effect of these measures. A few moments ago I observed uh, the changes this bill seeks to bring about. But what it doesn't deal with in any way, shape or form is the tax effect of these amendments. I anticipate that we can all look forward to yet another omnibus tax bill surfacing later this year to deal with that. But it is timely to remind honourable members that at least one of the peak tax organisations in this country has expressed, uh, expressed concerns with the likely effect of some of these proposals. The government's commitment to a lengthy and frank dialogue with industry about the contents of this bill is to be applauded. It is uh, unusual, Mr Deputy Speaker, for legislation that initiates such substantial change 
to earn such widespread support. In a media release dated the 6th of December 1997, the Australian Institute of Company Directors AICD, stated, the AICD strongly supports the consultative review progress, process involving business, market participants and interest groups, which has been adopted by the government for the corporate law economic reform program." Unquote. Similarly, in a statement reproduced on 19 December last, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry ACCI, congratulated the coalition on the bill, describing it as an their words, admirable example of microeconomic reform, unquote, which owed its success to a combination of quote, far-sighted government with quality participation by industry. Unquote. Mr Deputy Speaker, praise for a legislative reform doesn't come much better than that. Now, I'm not suggesting that every proposal in this bill has the unqualified support of industry, because that's not the case. As I've already indicated, there are a number of taxation changes which will result from this bill that are of real concern to members of the tax and legal professions, and I'll elaborate on them shortly. But the fact remains that the vast bulk of the changes in this bill are welcome, principally because the consultative process entered into has, to be, has been sound. Chapter 2G of the explanatory memorandum sets out the changes the coalition proposes to introduce to me company meeting rules. The Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities recommended in its 1996 report that any update of the corporation's law needed to more extensively recognise electronic forms of communication. Similarly, the recent financial system inquiry, FSI, demonstrated that Australian company law should be amended to accommodate electronic commerce. The provisions of this bill will pave the way for utilising electronic communication in providing notice of meetings, co uh, conducting meetings and appointing proxies for meetings. It might also be of interest to the Liberal Party. Mr Deputy Speaker, it will also allow companies to electronically register their annual returns with the ASC thereby saving Australian businesses both time and money. All this is consistent with the recommendations of both the Parliamentary Committee and FSI and will quicken the flow of information allowing Australian companies to expedite their decision-making processes. It is also consonant with the findings of uh, the Information Industries Task Force, which advised that the government should encourage ele electronic commerce as both desirable in itself and as an industry development tool. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry endorses these changes to electronic communications, noting that the effect of these measures will be twofold. Individual businesses will benefit, as will the wider economy. In a media release dated 10 December 1997, the ACCI stated, the option to use electronic means will appeal to many companies wishing to streamline their operations and reduce administrative costs. It should also facilitate Australia's development as a major financial centre." Unquote. The Coalition's decision to uh, reduce the information required to be incorporated in annual returns by two-thirds is also welcome. In the same way that the coalition is making it simpler to establish a company, the streamlining of the annual return processes and making it simpler for companies to lodge their return or returns with the, with the Australian Securities Commission will see a reduction in compliance costs for small businesses. Mr Bob Bryant, the executive director of the Corporate Tax Association, was recently quoted as saying these measures will, quote, simplify the framework, take away some of the old formalities and will particularly help small companies who will get very streamlined procedures, unquote. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's a well-known fact that small business bears a disproportionate burden when it comes to complying with business regulations. So it's pleasing to note that the government has been able to achieve here what it has failed to do with the, regu with the regulatory reform generally. 
that is, considerably reduce the burden on the small business sector. Importantly, this reduction has not occurred at the expense of shareholders or other interested parties. Specific measures have been introduced to ensure that company directors remain focused on their obligations to others. For example, companies will be obliged to notify the ASC of any changes in address of a principal place of business, thereby ensuring that creditors can stay in contact with a company. The current director's solvency resolution remains intact under this bill, meaning that if a company fails to lodge its annual financial report with the ASC, this must be made known to shareholders by the directors. In other words, the simplification of this part of the corporation's law is not being made at the expense of responsible and transparent business practice. On the contrary, the recently released 1998 OECD Economic Survey notes that the changes being sought by the government in its CLERP program quote, should be conducive to entrepreneurial behaviour on the part of company managers and directors. Unquote. Arguably, the most controversial change to be uh, brought about by this bill is the, uh, the abolition of the concept of par values for company shares. In his second reading speech, the Treasurer indicated that the intent behind Schedule 5 was to streamline the procedures for share capital reductions while at the same time safeguarding the interests of creditors and shareholders. The Australian Taxpayers Association, the ATA, has acknowledged that the proposed changes to share capital will make it easier for companies to make returns of capital to shareholders by eliminating the concept of par value and removing the role of courts in capital reductions. But it has also branded this measure as a trap. In a media release dated 14 November 1997, Mr Peter Macdonald, National Director of the ATA, described the change as a, quote, major step forward in simplifying the rules for companies, unquote, but he also noted that the tax changes will negate the positive changes from corporate law simplification because, and I'm quoting him again, shareholders face the very real prospect that a return on their, of their capital, on which tax has already pay, been paid, will be double tax. Double tax. Mr Macdonald went on to assert that this will quote, encourage shareholders to use debt instead of equity when setting up a company, effectively resulting in companies of straw. Unquote. The uh, ATA argues that the proposed uh, taxing of returns of capital as an unfrank frank dividend will effectively put an end to the principle that what you put into a company by way of a non deductible contribution in share capital you get back in tax-free form. That principle appears likely to go by the board, Mr Deputy Speaker. During the course of the uh, two public hearings held by the Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities into the draft Second Corporate, uh, Second Corporate Law Simplification Bill 1996, as this bill then was, several industry submissions revealed concerns about the inadequate transitional provisions in the previous bill and the possible taxation consequences of those proposals. The government acknowledged that to be so in its response to the report in November 1997. It observed that there was a need to ensure an quote, adequate transitional period to give the business and professional community sufficient time to adjust to the introduction of no par value. Unquote. It went on to note that a separate announcement about the taxation measures it will be introducing as a consequence of the abolition of par values for shares would be made at a later date. As yet, the government has failed to give industry the slightest hint of the date of effect for this, for this proposed tax measure, nor has it allayed fears that there will be a retrospective element to the new tax treatment of share values. My, my opposition to retrospective taxation, other than where uh, the new tax treatment incurs a benefit to the, on the taxpayer, is, uh, is of course well known in this place. The Australian Institute of Company Directors, the AOCD, in its submission to the Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities in August 1996, voices a similar position. 
AICD states very clearly that it opposes the use of retrospective legislation which operates to eliminate rights that might otherwise exist. As far as the Australian Institute of Company Directors is concerned, any decision to retrospectively remove advantages that presently flow quite legitimately from the distributions of accumulated capital to some shareholders quote, would be to place those shareholders and companies at a distinct disadvantage through no fault of their own. AICD supports the introduction of no par value shares but has recommended that companies should have the option of converting their shares to no par value shares rather than being obliged so to do. The AICD contends that government should be slow to eliminate choice because this is a fundamental factor in a competitive and dem democratic society. In a letter addressed to a senior Treasury official on 9 July 1997, Mr Ian Dunlop, Chief Execu Executive Officer at AICD, renewed his concern that the government's, at the uh, government's tendency to equate simplification with reduced freedom of choice in the nature and structure of corporate vehicles. Mr Dunlop noted that despite the recommendation in the 1989 report by the Companies and Securities Law Reform Committee that companies should have the option of issuing share, uh, shares of no par value, the government has chosen to persist with the compulsory introduction of no par value sh shares. The coalition has argued that uh, the introduction of optional no par value shares will necessarily mean a complication of the law. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, the AICD notes that this is not the American experience and asserts that simplification of corporate law is not an end in itself. It should not be regarded as a means of enlarging, legit uh, of enlarging legitimate business choice and of reducing unnecessary business costs. In its December 8, 1997 edition of The Taxpayer, the ATA outlines the impact uh, that is that this proposed tax treatment of share capital will have on the small business sector. It is argued that this amendment will cause these companies to become less attractive as a business vehicle and that it will disadvantage existing capitalised companies because they will have to compete with new companies that can establish themselves as thinly cap capitalised entities. The ATA also states that post-capital gains tax companies will be encouraged to liquidate to get back their, their capital back without being taxed, only to re-establish themselves as new entities which can utilise relatively higher debt and limited equity. Further, it is claimed that this double tax uh, treatment will dissuade foreign investment in Australian business because of the government's planned reduction of the thin capitalisation debt ratio. The Treasurer has defended the government's tax, uh, planned tax treatment of share capital, claiming that the abolition of par value for shares will provide an avenue for the streaming of capital to shareholders in circumstances where this would minimise tax. For this reason, the government intends to strengthen existing Part 4A anti-avoidance anti rules. What the Treasurer has failed to explain in his statements to the media is that while the current anti-avoidance legislation requires businesses to observe the dominant purpose test, the new rules are based on an other than incidental purpose test and, there, and is therefore considerably more far reaching. As the ATA has outlined, the effect of this new rule will be to severely, severely restrict opportunities for small companies to return their capital to shareholders without those distributions being tracked, uh, taxed as unfrankable and non rebatable div dividends. It will make it as difficult as possible for small businesses to effect a return of capital without being taxed. I repeat, it will make it as difficult as possible for small businesses to effect a return of capital without being taxed. The government is right to move to protect revenue, the revenue from unlawful tax minimisation schemes, but we are not talking about tax avoidance here, and the Treasurer knows that. We are talking about small business being hit by a double tax whammy if there is a delay in the distribution of retained earnings. The Australian Institute of Company Directors has noted that, quote, in other countries where no par value shares have been allowed, 
the relevant government has chosen to allow companies already established to maintain their par value structure. There is no evidence that the retention of this form of choice has led to manipulation or the misuse of the alternative. Is the government suggesting that Australian businesses are exceptionally devious in comparison to foreign enterprises? Why is the Treasury so convinced that Australian companies will abuse having this choice when there is no anecdotal or intrinsic evidence to suggest that it has occurred elsewhere? When the, economic, uh, the Senate uh, Economics Legislation Committee took submissions from industry late last year about the trust losses legislation, the overriding concern was the impact of that, le that, that legislation would be far more extensive than the government and the Australian Tax Office had already indicated. The tax fraternity were united in their criticism that small business owners who were legitimately using the tax advantages offered by tax structures would be hit Order. by measures the supposedly designed to Curtin's catch tax avoiders. For this debate has expired. The Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I at the beginning just thank those members who have contributed to this debate in regard to uh, the company law review bill. And uh, just at the outset, I will go into uh, three or four areas which I'd like to make some uh, brief comments about, but just note that this bill will be considered by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Securities. So. Uh, there will be an opportunity for more clarification uh, at that stage. We hope that that doesn't uh, take too long because I think uh, all of us would agree that we'd like to see this legislation uh, through the, the parliament. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it will be considered by the uh, committee. Uh, the four or five areas which I'd like to just uh, make some response to, first of all, disclosure of directors' remunerations. Um, <coughs> I think in this regard the first point to really make is that there is disclosure uh, of those remunerations over $100,000 in bands of $10,000. So uh, investors and shareholders are able to uh, get a fairly clear idea um, of uh, the amount of remunerations which directors are uh, obtaining. And of course, at the end of the day, at any AGM, uh, any shareholder can actually get up and ask the question as to who's receiving this remuneration, and so forth. So, uh, you know, so sometimes you can uh, bring in regulations to try and get the details, uh, which really aren't needed and can be catered for if anybody wishes to avail themselves of uh, the opportunities which are available to. Uh, shareholders of companies at the right time. There is time and place for all things. Uh, also in regard to uh, the disclosure of directors' remunerations uh, in the legislation, flexible disclosure obligations through the accounting standards and industry best practice in corporate governance are to be preferred, uh, we believe, to the black letter regulation through a corporation's law that also the accounting standards currently provide that the remuneration paid to directors of listed companies must be disclosed in the company's annual financial statements. And uh, lastly, in this area, the Company Law Review Bill will amend the corporation's law to specifically require the disclosure of the options granted to the directors and the company's five most highly remunerated officers. So we believe that in this regard that the legislation covers it adequately. In regard to the 28 days notice of meetings, well, I guess this is an issue in which we could date, uh, debate till the cows come home. Uh, but at the end of the day, but at the end of, the, of this, uh, it's really a matter of making a judgment. Now, the corporation's law currently obliges companies to give 14 days notice for an ordinary resolution and 21 days notice for a special resolution. Now, the bill, of course, establishes a uniform period of 21 days for all resolutions. And that sort of uh, unifies it and uh, there's no confusion then between uh, w which one's applying and so forth. Uh, and companies will be able to provide longer notice periods and announce their intention to do so. Uh, 
I guess the greater use of communications technology which the bill will facilitate will also speed up the communication process and this will make it unnecessary to extend the statutory notice period. Um, whether companies give a longer notice period should be a matter uh, for the market to determine. It is not something that should be addressed through prescriptive regulation. Uh, there is also a risk that longer notice periods will cause companies to not take up opportunities for which there is only a short window of opportunity. And so, as I said, uh, we believe that 21 days is quite adequate uh, for the notice of meetings. In regard to taxation consequences of shares and capital changes, the government has acknowledged that there will be taxation consequences flowing from the abolition of par value by the bill. The commencement of the corporation's law changes is linked to the commencement of the taxation amendments, as the Treasurer has stated in his press release on the 13th of uh, November 1997. And uh, lastly, in regard to the disclosure of principles behind a company, it was suggested that it will be uh, possible to register a new company without disclosing the principles behind it. However, Section 117 of the bill will make it necessary to include in the application to register a new company both uh, the name and the address of the members of the company when it is registered and the name of its uh, first directors. So many of those areas are covered. So uh, can I just uh, once again thank those members who contributed to the legislation and commend uh, the bill to the House? The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the corporation's law and for related purposes. Is, uh, the honourable member for Curtin. I just, I'd like you to know I'd like to speak briefly in the detailed stages. Thank you. Um, parliamentary secretary. Is it the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole forthwith? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary? Um, no, I don't want anything on it. So. Oh. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Curtin. First. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I won't, I won't keep you long. I just wanted to note that uh, while the Treasurer continue, continues to say that more extensive anti-avoidance measures are required to prevent tax minimisation, the reality is that uh, the small business sector is going to be hit by double taxation by this bill. Perhaps. Uh, Perhaps one of, uh, one of the champions of the, biz the small business world from the government benches would c care to uh, go through that exercise and explain it to small businesses. The editor of the taxpayer uh, correctly points out that under the existing law, companies are taxed on their profits. He also demonstrates that there is no legal requirement for companies to distribute retained profits other than market forces or uh, large companies, of course. The ATA has asserted that the changes proposed in this bill by the Coalition will send a very clear message to all Australians setting up a corporate law structure. And that message is, quote, there is no guarantee that you will be able to obtain a return of capital in a tax-free form, even where that capital is no longer necessary for the continued viability of the business, unquote. Mr Deputy Speaker, the question I want to pose in these detailed stages is why would a government which continues to market itself as the saviour of small business persist with this measure, knowing that small, the small business sector will be severely affected by it? The ATA spells out their reading of things very clearly indeed. It suggests that it is simply a matter of the government yet again trying to bring forward the collection of revenue. If the ATA is correct in this claim, the coalition is showing itself to be no better than its predecessor when it becomes to the perennial tax grab. If, if it is, 
the case, no wonder the Australian Taxpayers Association has gone on record as saying that if this is any indication of the Coalition's hyped tax reform package, then small business appears to be in for trying times. I would like some reassurance on this, and, uh, and I think the fact that uh, the, the Coalition hasn't announced its tax proposals will leave it open to be questioned along the lines that I've raised. Now, in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I simply want to confirm my support for the general thrust of these reforms. The government has produced a series of, a series of measures which, as a part of the bigger clerk program, will facilitate the decision-making process and boost investor confidence. With the exception of the transactions affecting share capital, which deserves more thorough consideration on the part of the government, this bill is to be commended. Uh, parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Uh, the Honourable Member of the State of the House. Quorum required. Quorum required. Uh, ring the bells. Quorum present. The question is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, this bill has been agreed to. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move the third reading forthwith. The question is that the. Who's leave granted? The question is that uh, the third reading be forthwith. Those of that opinion say it's all right. Smile. I yeah. move that this bill be now read a third time. <laughs> the question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the corporation's law and for related purposes. Order of the day number three. Charter of Budget Honesty Bill 1996, number two, resumption of debate on the second reading.
The Honourable Member for Wills. Thank you, Mr uh, <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Order. Would Honourable Members uh, either resume their seats or leave the chamber? Yeah. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Wills. Thank, <coughs> Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, it is uh, appropriate that we go back to uh, the history of the Charter of uh, Budget Honesty. And, uh, uh, in, in reviewing the history of the Charter of Budget Honesty, uh, it was spelled out for the first time in his first headland speech by the uh, then Leader of the Opposition. And, uh, I note that, apart from the commitment to a Charter of Budget Honesty in that headland speech, the other thing that was uh, referred to in the headland speech was that the Prime Minister was going to lift the role of Parliament. Now we can see what sad and sorry times the, uh, the Prime Minister's undertaking that he would lift the role of Parliament have come to. What a joke that turned out to be. We've seen the Speaker resigning just yesterday. We've seen the government unable today to even manage a quorum and the Parliament closed down. What a shambles this Parliament has been reduced to. Now, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, the Charter of Budget Honesty has fared little better. It too has turned out to be a joke because this is the second time this bill has come before the, uh, the parliament. and Indeed, it came before the parliament last year, and at that stage it was supported by the opposition, as indeed it still is, uh, and we set out to improve it with uh, a number of constructive amendments which were supported in the Senate. And what did the government come back and do? It set the bill aside. It wasn't interested in a charter of budget honesty at all. And indeed, when we, uh, <coughs> the bill was first reintroduced uh, to the parliament uh, late last year, they refused to debate it. We wanted to bring it on for debate, and they weren't uh, even prepared to debate it. So the, go the government was not interested in dealing with this bill at all, and the government is not interested again today in a charter of budget honesty. Uh, <coughs> what it's interested in is the politics of this rather than something which will genuinely make uh, governments accountable. And if they would uh, wanted to agree to it last year, the Treasurer could have had his own mid-year review bound by this bill, but in fact he didn't want that, and they didn't want to have the Parliament uh, pass this bill and have it actually passed into law. And it ought to be remembered that, far from being some important groundbreaking reform, what this legislation in fact is, is optional. There's no penalty for non-compliance. It's not possible for any citizen to ensure that the government complies with this legislation because the bill itself contains a specific provision ensuring that the legislation is unenforceable. It is quite literally an optional Charter of Budget Honesty. And when the Senate voted to make the Charter enforceable, the government members voted against that proposal. So, <clears throat> like so many other matters, Genuine fiscal transparency and accountability is clearly a non-core promise which is never going to be delivered by a coalition government. It is never going to be delivered by a Treasurer who is also refusing to be held accountable for his performance in combating tax avoidance by opposing a, uh, an amendment which mandates disclosure of threats to the tax base. Once again, that was something put forward and agreed to by the Senate. The Treasurer knows he's going to fail that particular accountability test, so he's not prepared to agree to that amendment. He's also refused to accept the Senate amendment which would prevent him, the Treasurer personally, participating in the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook report, rather than that being a matter dealt with by the relevant bureaucrats. He's interested in politicising that process uh, rather than having it as a matter of genuine budget honesty and therefore he wants to be involved in that process and won't support uh, it being genuinely independent. So, uh, <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Labor proposed amendments previously in the Senate. We will be proposing amendments again, and they ought to be properly understood by this House. Labor voted last time to make the Charter legally enforceable. The Howard government wants to make it optional. We sought to have governments publish estimates of the effect of budget measures on national savings. That was rejected by the Howard government. We put forward a proposal to include a discussion of threats to the integrity of the tax base. That was rejected. We sought to have the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook reports published within five days of the issue of writs for an election, rather than the proposed ten days. 
as it stands now, as it's put forward by the government, it is simply an election tactic available only to the government. And in addition, we strenuously oppose the participation of ministers in the preparation of the fiscal outlook paper to be published during the election. We want those papers to be prepared by the public service for the public, for the media, for the opposition, for the caretaker government. It would be totally inappropriate for ministers to be involved in this process. I want to reaffirm Labor's support for a proper charter of budget honesty and hope that the government will see fit to join us in passing a decent version of it. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> the opposition finds it very disappointing indeed that the government has taken the course of action that it has on this legislation. And as a brief recap, let's have a look at it. This is the second version of the bill introduced back in 1996. The first bill was passed unanimously in this House on 10 February of last year. It was supported by the opposition at all stages and duly passed on 28 October 1997. Now, not only did the opposition constructively support the passage of the Charter of Budget Honesty Bill, we sought to constructively strengthen and improve it, and we wanted to give it some teeth. Now, due to the merits of the various amendments which we put forward, many of them were agreed to by the Senate. Not a Senate controlled by Labor, but a Senate with very broad representation across the political spectrum. These amendments were supported by all of the non-government senators because they unquestionably improve the legislation. They are what? They are opposition puppets. Oh, I, I, I see. I thank, I thank the, uh, uh, the minister for his interjection. The government's outright opposition to ten highly reasonable, highly sensible, long and carefully debated amendments agreed to by the Senate shows that the Charter of Budget Honesty is not some brave and brilliant new contribution to integrity in government and enhanced quality of democracy, as it is claimed to be by the government, but it is in fact nothing more, nothing less than straight-out political stunt. The government simply does not want to entrench a superior system of accountability with this legislation. They want to give the appearance of reform, but they do not want to deliver the substance. And they certainly do not want anything to operate as even-handedly as between the government and opposition of the day, and which in so doing would enhance the quality of democratic debate and accountability. Otherwise, they would be accepting our amendments. The other thing that the, the Treasurer does Order. is to falsely claim that Labor is opposing this legislation. As I have pointed out, Labor has consistently voted for this legislation and will do so again. Indeed, we are trying to raise it from a stunt to something of substance and value. Now, the clearest demonstration of these points was the rejection by the government of the proposal in the Senate right at the outset that the Charter be legally binding. The way it is drafted at the moment, it is not enforceable at all through the courts. There are no penalties at all for non-compliance. Now, uh, <coughs> the bill could quite readily create enforceable rights and duties, as indeed is the case in New Zealand, where the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1994 is binding on the Crown. We voted in the Senate to make the Charter enforceable. The government has refused to accept that position. The government itself, in so doing, has acknowledged that the whole Charter is optional. And the notion of an optional Charter of Budget Honesty while perhaps consistent with the optional approach to honesty that this government has displayed in its last couple of budgets, makes a farce of the government's rhetoric in this area. Now, the second demonstration of our good faith in all of this, before we come to the actual amendments, was our proposal in the Senate that the budget documents ought to contain, amongst other things, an, effect, an estimate of the effect of the budget measures on national savings. The Treasurer has repeatedly taken uh, other occasions to tell the House and it ought to be noted that he's absent again from this debate, as he's so often when matters of this kind are being debated in this place, that the overriding objective of budget policy is to increase the level of national savings. Now, as we argued the last time this matter came before the House, 
Surely, against that background, it is not unreasonable that the government be asked to attempt to qu quantify the effect of its budgets in achieving such a key objective. Now, <coughs> the government, however, succeeded in excluding this key measure that we are proposing from the legislation by recruiting Senator Mar Getz. I think she took the view that anything to do with saving transparency was a form of economic rationalism and therefore to be treated with the utmost suspicion as a result. But, whatever the, the reason, we lacked a majority in the Senate for this particular amendment. But the key point has to be this. What was the government afraid of in having a provision of this kind put into the legislation? We were perfectly happy to have the information included in the budget about what the estimated effect on savings would be. Why was the government opposed to such a fundamental proposition? What is the Treasurer afraid of? Why shouldn't the public be able to know what the effects of the budget are on national savings? Why shouldn't the Treasurer then be held accountable to whatever targets are included? Mr Deputy Speaker, unless the government has some answers to these questions, it really approaches this debate with no credibility at all. The opposition is not going to resile from supporting the amendments that were supported in the Senate. We will be moving them again in the consideration in detail stage of this debate. And therefore, and particularly as this bill has been described as a potential double dissolution trigger bill, we need to go through the amendments briefly to reacquaint the House with the detail. Now, the first amendment goes to the principles of sound fiscal management, so called, set out on, uh, in part three of the bill. This amendment is fundamentally important in terms of the objectives of the government. We believe those things which ought to be objectives of any government. We believe that fiscal policy should be directed to worthwhile community goals, not just accounting outcomes. Why do governments set fiscal objectives? They do so to ensure that broader objectives can be achieved. And what we want to do with amendment number one is to add to the principles of sound fiscal management, as set out in clause five to schedule one, three further paragraphs <coughs> which I believe should be supported by every member of this House. The first two subparagraphs should be very familiar to many members because they are contained within the Reserve Bank legislation. These are some of the obligations which the bank has had to take into account in its role in relation to monetary policy. And the amendment in question requires accordingly the government to have regard to, first, the achievement of full employment in Australia and, secondly, the overall economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia, and thirdly, to the maintenance or improvement of the real value of wages and conditions and the welfare of workers. These principles do add a humanising element to the principles of sound fiscal management, rather than presenting fiscal management as wholly a matter of fixation on accounting bottom lines, which is the case with the present bill. Now, <clears throat> of course it's appropriate that a statement of principles of fiscal management recognise, address and require commitment to these accounting criteria. We do not want to remove them. But it is also the case that they should recognise that the application of fiscal policy has a very real impact on the lives and on the welfare of people. For people's welfare to be enhanced and for their prosperity to increase, there has to be a focus on the achievement of full employment and there has to be a focus on the achievement of economic wellbeing. The pursuit of better employment outcomes should be a key priority of this government. It hardly needs to be pointed out on this occasion, but nevertheless I'll do so, that that has not been the case and that the government's record in relation to employment has been very much poorer than Labor's. This is the biggest economic and social problem now confronting this country. We have not even stayed still on the jobs front. We have gone backwards since the Howard government came to office. There was the creation of an employment committee of cabinet to deal with this issue. That whole enterprise has been an utter and spectacular failure. What these amendments seek to do is simply compel the government to focus on the key issues of national welfare, as they are so obviously not doing at the moment, and to do so in the budgetary context, as they are obviously not doing at the moment. And I personally regard it as unbelievable, and I think the community ought to regard it as unbelievable, that the government is not prepared to accept this amendment 
because to do so indicates that they simply do not support improved employment and national welfare outcomes, and that they don't see that as any part of the government's budget or fiscal responsibility. Mr Deputy Speaker, the second amendment, which we would expect a decent government to embrace, goes to the accountability of the Treasurer. Now, the integrity of the tax base is absolutely fundamental to the delivery of adequate public services. Taxes are obviously necessary to finance public services, and these are most fairly raised when everyone able to contribute does in fact contribute in a fair and honestly administered system. Ensuring the integrity of the tax base is therefore crucial to ensuring that all taxpayers are paying their fair share. What Amendment 2 does is to simply require the Commissioner of Taxation and the Secretary to the Treasury to provide a report on any material threats to the integrity of the tax system, <coughs> including the fiscal impact of any of these threats as a permanent and as an integral part of fiscal reporting. Now, this is obviously an important proposal because it will allow the government, and especially the Treasurer, to be held accountable for the conduct of tax policy. There can be few duties of higher importance for the Treasurer than to maintain a fair tax system. We are concerned to ensure that these concerns, as they evolve in revenue authorities, are made public to enable scrutiny of the Treasurer's performance in his duty of protecting the public revenue. The Tax Commissioner can advise the Treasurer on matters that should be undertaken to maintain the tax base, but as things stand at the moment, and if the government has its way, will remain, he has no power to force the Treasurer to act in the national interest to protect the tax base. The discretion is all with the Treasurer to either accept or reject the advice of the Tax Office and the Treasury, all in comfortable secrecy. Now, that secrecy, of course, is what the Treasurer relies upon to act against the advice of the Tax Office or of his own department. There has been no clearer demonstration of the Treasurer acting in this way than in relation to the family trusts tax wrought, which the Treasurer has deliberately allowed to continue. On the 13th of May last year, the budget night, the Treasurer clearly rejected official advice and changed the trust loss provisions to exclude family trusts. The continuation of an exemption for injections of income by non-beneficiaries in family trusts to enable them to, in effect, traffic in trust losses, pay no income on income derived by them in completely separate circumstances from those relating to the trust itself, is one of the more extraordinary and indefensible tax avoidance loopholes to have been left open in recent times. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no public policy justification for this. There has been none articulated in this place. It is manifestly against the advice of the Treasury and against the advice of the Tax Office. We know that, not least because advice on this issue was very squarely given to the former Treasurer, Ralph Willis, in our government. There was no question of Labor allowing that particular exemption or loophole. This government has chosen to do so, and we can only speculate as to the reasons for that, that it is of manifest benefit to high wealth individuals in the community, that it is of manifest benefit to up to 19 members of this government's front bench who do in, in fact have family trusts. Now, what the opposition wants to do is to, make, <coughs> is to make this open and transparent and where it's designed to improve the quality of public administration and in particular fiscal administration in this country. So it needs to be made open and transparent. The amendment that the Senate proposed doesn't seek to alter the Treasurer's right to make tax policy on behalf of the government. What it does do, however, is to seek to ensure that material threats to the tax system, not least those created by the actions of the Treasurer himself, are codified in a systematic and public basis, so as to enable the performance of the Treasurer in dealing with these revenue threats to be much more openly and readily evaluated than is the case at present. Now, of course, it's the case that future treasurers will still be able to refuse to act on the advice of their revenue authorities, but they will not be able to, they should not be able to, 
hide their actions or their lack of actions, not be able to hide the nature of that advice and the fact that they're not complying with it from the Australian people. And if you're serious about budget honesty, that is exactly the kind of thing the government ought to be prepared to put into this legislation. Now, Clause 12 of Schedule 1, as it's currently worded, only includes some references to the sorts of risks that may have a material effect on the fiscal outlook. There is a reference in very general terms. And what is not there, and this is the nub of the argument for this amendment, is an explicit reference to particular threats. Now, in the Senate, in opposing this measure, Senator Kemp made two particularly ludicrous claims which ought to be uh, once again put on the public record. Uh, they were then repeated here in the House by Parliamentary Secretary Miles and mentioned briefly in the Treasurer's second reading speech reintroducing the bill back in December. Now, the first silly claim was the uh, few pages that do now exist in the Statement of Risks in Budget Paper No. 1 that they actually deal with this issue. Now, this is rubbish. What we envisage is that this independent statement by the bureaucrats will not be the generalised language of the kind set out in that section of Budget Paper No. 1, but a much more detailed statement about specific schemes, specific issues, which will complement the broad information which is already on the record. And secondly, the government advances the ludicrous notion that publication of information about schemes or other threats to the tax base would encourage their use. Now, the tax office does not dream up theoretical schemes. What the tax office and the Treasury do is to detect taxpayer behaviour, often unhappily some years after it's become established practice, and then advise the government of the problems and the possible solutions. It is simply wrong to suggest that the tax office could advise by this means the tax industry on ways to avoid tax. In practice, it is absolutely the other way around. The sequence of events works quite differently. And if the proposition that is contended for in defence of the government's position here were to prevail, the tax office would, for example, never take any taxpayers to court on the basis that a loss would alert the taxpayers to uh, possible schemes. So clearly that is absurd and that is at odds with current practice. Now, <clears throat> what we know is that the tax system and the threat to its integrity is under constant and sustained attack. In some instances, this may even be as a result of the government's own legislation, directly opening up loopholes or deliberately leaving them open. And uh, we believe that the risks to the integrity of the tax system are always going to exist. That is a recurring problem that every government has to confront. But we do believe in that context that one way of ensuring that those risks are properly dealt with is to ensure that the government can be held accountable for inaction, for failure to act. And that is the very point of this amendment. And that is why we are going to insist on it. And that's why that we're particularly disappointed, and I think the community is going to be disappointed, that the government has taken the path that it has and is not prepared to support this amendment. Now, the third amendment goes to intergenerational reporting. It changes the frequency of the proposed intergenerational fiscal reports from five years back to three years. This one was actually moved by the Democrats, but it was supported by us in the Senate. And what it does is to ensure that there will be such a report in effect during every normal term of parliament, that is to say once in the life of every parliament. The reporting framework of three years proposed here does in fact align with the other long-term fiscal report already presented to this parliament, namely the report by the government actuary into the long-term costs of the Commonwealth civilian and military superannuation funds. Those reports are prepared every three years and we consider this to be an appropriate interval for updating reports to be released. And we very much hope that the government reconsiders its position on that amendment. Of course, the available evidence is that it will not. Amendments four and five both relate to the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook report, which the legislation proposes to require. What amendment four does is seek to replace and improve the proposed provisions for a pre-election economic and fiscal outlook report published prior to an election. And it suggests that within 10 days of the issue of writs for an election, 
the responsible bureaucrats produce a report to inform the electorate of the economic and fiscal outlook as it is likely to be after the election. Now, the amendment proposes that instead of waiting until an election is called, in the case of a parliament that looks likely to see out its full term, that report should be published in the normal way two years and nine months after the first sitting of a new parliament. If an election should be called prior to that time, then we argue in the amendment that the report should be produced within, uh, not within 10 days, but five. And we move this amendment for the very simple reason that if a pre-election economic and fiscal report is to be published, then for it to be genuinely useful, genuinely contribute towards public debate, it needs to be available on a timely basis as soon as practically possible. This system should not be set up in such a way to enable such a report to be used as a political tactic by the government of the day simply in order to advance its own political agenda. And obviously, the later such a report is released to the public, the less opportunity the public has to consider each party's policies in the light of it. Mr Deputy Speaker, Amendment No. 5 concerns another important matter. The pre-election report that I've been discussing has to be prepared and certified by the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance. That's a proper requirement, and the opposition agrees with it. And the reason for the provision is clear enough to keep ministers from meddling in the preparation of the report. And uh, <coughs> we support keeping ministers out of interfering with the report, and we think it's such an important principle that it ought to be enshrined in the legislation. And so we are adding a new subclause 3 to clause 27 of Schedule 1, which will read that apart from providing information to the responsible secretaries under subclause 1, the minister must not participate in the preparation of a pre-election economic and fiscal outlook report. So in plain, simple English, Labor believes that this legislation should specifically prohibit the interference of the minister in the preparation of the pre-election report. Now, what's the government say on this matter of probity of proper ministerial conduct? It says, <coughs> we are not interested in this. They use their numbers to defeat this amendment, thereby preserving the right of the Treasurer to politically interfere and doctor the pre-election document. Now, if that's not the government's intention, why don't they get on board? Why don't they support our amendment? Amendments 6 to 10 simply attempt to inject some balance into the proposed costing regime. This bill is completely outrageous in that it proposes that the opposition has to send copies of its policies and the assumptions under which they are costed to the Prime Minister prior to getting those policies costed. Then the Prime Minister has discretion about whether he refers the policies onto the bureaucracy or simply refuses to. Now, this is a disgrace. This is, not, this is being trumpeted out in the electorate as something which will keep governments honest. What it is designed to do is to make the position of oppositions absolutely impossible, that we should be prepared to hand over policies, or indeed any opposition in future, should be prepared to hand over policies to the government of the day for costing, when, of course, the government will be doing no such, uh, providing the opposition with no such courtesy. And if the opposition, if the government is to have a costings regime set in legislation, that regime has got to be fair. Clearly, the proposals in this bill are unfair. The playing field is not level. It's severely tilted against the opposition, whomever that happens to be. This bill is not about budget honesty. It's about political advantage. The costing regime is the worst aspect of this legislation. We will continue to attempt to improve the equity of these proposals. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me finish my remarks by stressing that, despite the total misrepresentation by the Treasurer and others in the government, Labor will vote for this bill, as we did in 1996, as we did in 1997. It is simply false to say that Labor opposes this legislation. We do not and never have done. The truth is that the bill will be significantly improved by the amendments proposed, and that is why the opposition will be moving them and supporting them. The audacity of the Treasurer to, complain, to claim that this legislation represents meaningful reform in its current state is quite breathtaking. The bill is not enforceable. It is simply optional. No one can seek to enforce the bill if it is not complied with. There are no penalties on the Treasurer or anyone else if the law is not complied with. 
It is a farce and should be understood as such, and in committee we will be moving, as we did before, to turn it into something of substance and something of real value to the Australian electorate. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, certainly, when I defeat my, when I defend my seat at the next federal election, <laughs> the people of Richmond, the people of Richmond will know exactly how well this government is performing economically. Admittedly, providing the Australian people with details of the nation's fiscal standing is certainly unlikely to embarrass this government since our prudent economic management means we'll be fighting the next poll in a budget surplus. That's the most common of courtesies, affording voters the opportunity to make a fully informed decision. And this certainly was not extended to the people of Richmond in 1996 when Keating was the Prime Minister. More importantly, it will not be necessary to be given to them under a future Labor government. So let's look at the obstructions in the Senate. Labor's attempted emasculation in the Senate of the government's proposed Charter of Budget Honesty shows the shadow treasure at his hypocritical worst. We support the medium-term goal of restoring the budget to balance, he now says, but it was he as a key member of the government whose only action in relation to the budget deficit was to deny its very existence, and the member for Wills will well remember that. In a media release dated 5 December 1997, this errand boy, the member for Wills, had the gall to claim the Treasurer has no interest in the reform of the budgetary process. This was because it was this Treasurer who actually initiated the reforms of the budgetary process and it was Labor that blocked it. Earlier, the Democrats, then led by the ALP's leader-in-waiting, weren't sure what their position on budget honesty was. On the 1st of October 1997, the curiously titled Australian Democrats spokesman for accountability said, this charter contains some very useful accountable measures which could convincingly ensure that the electorate is provided with better and more accountable information about the government policies and the true condition of an economy prior to an election. Prior to an election, that was Cheryl Curnow. A rational statement, except for the fact that the Democrats had just torpedoed the Treasurer's bill. The Democrats' leader had another fish to fry on the 1st of October 1997. This was the day Mrs Kernow informed her biographer that she was going to join, obviously, the ALP two weeks before she had told her staff and her colleagues. So for the benefit of Labor and other minority parties with a short memory, here is a little reminder from February 1996, and of course it's in relation to Labor's deficit. Before the election, we asked Labor what the state of the nation's books were and the Australian public had a right. A fair enough question to put to a government, we thought. They evaded it, they squirmed, they deceived, they brought up old figures which they knew were hopelessly out of date. Eventually they told Australia that the budget was in surplus, February 1996. In fact, there was a deficit of 10.5 billion this means that the Labor government was spending over one million an hour more than it was collecting. Over one million an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days of a year to rack up that deficit. A Labor was being outrageously profligate with other people's money. And by contrast, they were being very uneconomical with the truth. Deficit? What deficit? Was all you could hear from them. And that is precisely why, Mr Deputy Speaker, we need the Charter of Budget Honesty. We need it so no government in the future can ever again get away with Beezy's black hole. So let's look at the Charter. The Liberal National Government is already demonstrating its commitment to providing Australians with better fiscal accountability and improving fiscal outcomes. 
we are already complying in full with the Charter's requirements. Why then, even the member for Wills, why then does the ALP oppose the Charter, which even in the Australian welcomed as a big step towards honest budgets and sound fiscal policy? After all, the Courier Mail, certainly not known for its love of conservative governments, described, as the member for Marino would know what, quite well, described the Charter as fundamentally important for good politics and good policy into the future. The Courier Mail. It is the honesty part that really Labor objects to, it or it does not understand. Because the coalition government already complies with the Charter, the ALP has no interest in committing itself to the honest budgetary reporting if it ever gains power again. It is unlikely to happen soon, or perhaps even after many decades to come. Labor has not won any election since the federal poll for the last two years. And look, they couldn't even wrestle the left-leaning Australian Capital Territory from the competent hands of Kate Carnell. Still, I suppose it is the duty of any opposition to prepare for government. Surely, then, supporting a bill that merely commits them not to tell budget fibs anymore is not such a big ask. The ten amendments that were discussed and that have been tried to be moved by the opposition and other minority parties in the Senate attached to the bill, quite frankly, would make it unworkable. And specifically, the greedy amendments relating to the costings of unannounced, unannounced election policies during a caretaker period would run the Treasury into a free research centre for each of the parties. You would see public servants, Mr Deputy Speaker, frantically costing a myriad of different policies which may or may not be used depending on the results of the bureaucrats' investigations. Another quite irresponsible Labor Democrat amendment which we rejected would require a report on threats to the taxation system and detailed countermeasures. <clears throat> While the intention of the amendment is quite in Congress, the outcome would be provide tax planners with a receipt for tax avoidance, because they would precisely know. The other proposed amendment merely clutters the charter and makes it more difficult to operate as transparently as it is designed. The fact is that the bill does not need any amendments from the policy-free Labor apparatchiks or the power-starved Democrats. The bill is comprehensive. And it's natural and radical in its simplicity. We have already proven that it works by complying with its provisions even before it's been enacted. The Charter of Budget Honesty addresses both fiscal policy formation and fiscal reporting. Fiscal policy formation would be enhanced with the establishment of a set of principles, which are used to evaluate a government's fiscal policies. The principles are flexible enough to take into account short-term factors such as cyclical economic downturns while still focusing on long-term issues such as sustainability of government debt and national savings. And the Charter would enhance the public profile of the government's economic management, good or bad, to the government shareholders, the Australian people. And yet still the ALP blocks it. Let's have a look at some fiscal reporting. It is the fiscal reporting aspect of the bill which really worries the Australian Labor Party. Fiscal reporting provisions will allow voters to measure the government's performance against their fiscal objectives. At budget time, the government will be required to report economic projections and forecasts, both for the budget year and for the three-year period. The bill mandates a further set of halfway reporting through the financial year in the mid-year economic review. And when the government released its first mid-year economic review under the provisions of the Charter in 1997, many people welcomed the com comments and contents, as I did. The point is that the fact the review was undertaken and released at all was all but universally welcomed. A landmark document in the management of the Australian economy trumpeted the Australian Chamber of Commerce industry a body better known for its mastery of understatement than that of praise for any government. Terry McCran in the Courier Mail 
must have made the member for Hulk choke on his croissants. Peter Costello has made the public the sort of budget details that his predecessor, Ralph Wills, did not want to know about, and most certainly did not want the voters to know about budget figures. What budget figures? What budget? The legacy of deficit is a damning and tragic indictment of the Keating, Beasley and Willis governments. Quite irresponsible behaviour, and you know it. This leads us to the most important part of the bill, and the one that Labor cannot bear to support, but has not got the intestinal fortitude, not got the intestinal fortitude to reject openly. And of course, it's the provisions that require the Treasurer and the Department of Finance to prepare pre-election reporting, providing an up-to-date assessment of the fiscal and economic outlook at the beginning of the campaign. <clears throat> the big problem, of course, that Labor has with this simple measure is that when the voters get too much information about the Labor governments, and particularly the last election, they tend to vote for the national and liberal candidates. For some time now, Australians have been doing just that in every state and territory except my home state of New South Wales. And the current series of backflips back that seem to indicate things are not looking so promising for Mr Carr is another indictment. So in conclusion, one can only speculate about what would happen if Labor had been compelled to release an accurate pre-election fiscal report at the last election in 1996. I suspect if they had Western Australians that knew about Beasley's borrowing billions, he would not be sitting in this House. But come to think of it, that, come to think of it, that would not have been such a bad outcome for the member of Holt, would it have? Thank you. Well, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my opening remarks in the debate on the original Charter of Budget Honesty Bill 1996, I noted that the legislation was especially important for the coalition, given the Prime Minister's commitment to the electorate at the last election to improve standards of political behaviour. As part of that, it was the Prime Minister's stated intention to restore greater meaning and authority to the parliament in the public eye and to commence this process with a commitment to enhanced economic honesty. Mr Deputy Speaker, my comments made some 13 months ago on the strengths and weaknesses of the original bill remain valid because this bill has been returned to the House by the Senate in exactly the same form in which it first left. I was broadly supportive of both the content and the intent of the initial legislation, and I remain so. If anything, I've come to the view the bill more favor uh, I've come to view the bill more favorably owing to uh, the widespread support that it has received from the ensemble of business and industry leaders who appeared before the Joint Committee on, uh, on Public Accounts, the JCPA, in March last year, when this bill was being considered. Although it's a cause for concern that the JCPA prefaced its findings into the bill with the statement that it had to complete its review in an unreasonably tight time frame at the expense of an exhaustive uh, consultation process. While some of uh, those witnesses who appeared before the parliamentary committee suggested areas in the legislation that could be improved, each of them endorsed the general thrust of the bill. Further, representatives of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Society of Certified Practicing Accountants, the Australian National Audit Office and the Australian Council of Auditors General all commended the Coalition on specific key features of the legislation. It's a curious thing, Mr Deputy Speaker, that so many of our independent economic leaders were prepared to publicly support the Charter of Budget Honesty, but that neither the opposition nor the minor parties in the other chamber can see fit so to do. In report number 351 from March 1997, the JCPA stated very clearly that it saw no reason 
why the Senate should further delay the passage of this bill. In the interests of improved disclosure of information and an enhanced democratic process, it suggested that those who opposed the original bill should reflect on the evidence provided to the JCPA in March 1997 and re-evaluate their positions. The bill is not immutable, Mr Deputy Speaker. As Mr David Hope, a representative of the Australian Society of Certified Practicing Accountants ASCPA, suggested in his testi testimony before the JCPA, quote, the charter should not be set in stone and improvements should be made over time in the light of experiences, unquote. Another contributor to the public hearing embraced the terms of the charter describing them not just a step in the right di direction, but a fairly long run in the right direction, but by no means does that preclude future changes to the initial legislation. The JCPA came to a similar conclusion, noting that the Charter has, and I'm quoting from the report, the capacity within the fixed principles and standards specified to reflect changes in the demands of accountability in information technology and the needs and expectations of the electorate well into the next century." Unquote. So, Deputy Speaker, the parliament will have the opportunity to amend this bill, if it's deemed necessary, once it has been put into practice, building on its strengths and correcting any deficiencies. The first step, however, must be to expedite enactment. Critics uh, of the term of the Charter of Budget honestly note quite, quite accurately that the rights and responsibilities set out in the bill, while desirable, are not legally enforceable. Well, I remain disappointed uh, with the absence of uh, judicial enforceability of any part of this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker. However, I accept that the standards the coalition seeks to introduce will bring about greater discipline in the management of our economy. If a government is fiscally irresponsible, that will be shown to be the case following the publication of its financial reports. The Australian electorate can decide for itself how best to discipline such aberrant behaviour. Similarly, should this or any future government arrogantly ignore the requirement to produce regular, detailed fiscal updates as laid down in this legislation, it's reasonable to expect that both the media and the electorate will take it to task. The strength of the bill lies in the frequency of government reporting. The frequency of government reporting. As one witness before the GC JCPA noted, the combination of the pre-election report, the annual fiscal statement, the budget account, the post-budget update and the intergenerational estimate will mean that, and I'm quoting, we are never more than three months away from a reasonably current view of Australia's economic outlook." Unquote. With the recent admission of Mr Ted Evans, uh, the Treasury Secretary, that it is in the nature of economic forecasts that they will always be wrong. And we've seen uh, many examples during the life of this and previous parliaments to suggest that Mr Evans is spot on in this regard. The frequent updating of these forecasts will minimise the margin for error. That a government will find it more difficult to avoid public scrutiny of its recent past performance as well as its future fiscal intentions should bring the focus more sharply on delivering at a minimum a balanced budget. The two proposed financial reports to have won the greatest support from the private sector are those that have not been released by past governments, that is the intergenerational report and the pre-election fiscal update. The inclusion of these reports puts paid to the claim that the bill does nothing more than codify existing practice. If this bill is enacted, Every Australian voter will have access to information about any underlying debt or surplus, levels of government debt and the state of national savings within 10 days of the issue of the writs for a general election. 
the opportunity currently afforded to political parties to curry favour with the electorate with unsustainable levels of election promising will be severely curtailed under this legislation. Governments may attempt to fudge their economic performance and oppositions may opt to avoid clearly articulating their preferred fiscal program, but they would do so at the risk of being exposed to the broad Australian public. As Mr Claude Pacini, Assistant Director of Economics with the Business Council of Australia, noted in his evidence to the JCPA, quote, the whole idea of transparency in fiscal documents is that they are open to the public. Not only is there the responsibility on government and public servants to be honest about what their expectations are, but there is also an obligation on the commentators to take governments to task. The Australian uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry has suggested that the publication of comprehensive fiscal information prior to an election will increase the pressure on government to act responsibly and that this will have a direct impact on improving the overall level of business confidence during an election campaign. In addition to the publication of material about the short to medium term fiscal strategies of federal governments, the Business Council of Australia, the BCA, indicated that it also sought to have information about the long-term impact of these strategies on the national economy made available to the general community. The proposed five-yearly report on the long-term and intergenerational consequences of existing fiscal policy certainly meets that expectation. As the ASCPA made clear to members of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts last year, the requirement on government to produce longer-term economic action plans will bring them into greater alignment with the standards ex expected in the business sector. That's important, Mr Deputy Speaker, for sustaining investor confidence in Australian markets, for providing greater stability to the economy and to enable business to determine the likely outcome on the economy of a change of government. For the uh, intergenerational reports to be truly transparent, however, clarification is needed as to the content of those particular reports. It would have been naive to assume that the Charter of Budget Honesty will oblige governments to behave with greater integrity. No amount of legislation can regulate for honesty. What the Charter will do is to put the onus on the government of the day to provide the Australian people with a greater pool of data on which to judge the effectiveness of that government's public sector programs. The Auditor General has made, it clear, uh, has made that point clear in the uh, public hearing into this bill when he noted that even if the Charter of Budget Honesty Bill 1996 does pass through the parliament, and I'm quoting, people can still query your competence and query the basis of the information on which you made the judgment. Importantly, the Auditor General went on to say, but they cannot query your honesty in coming out and saying, this is the judgment we made and this is the reason for the variation of the judgment. I confer, concur with the findings of the JCPA that reporting is not an end in itself, but rather that it is merely another link in the accountability chain, but it is an important link. It is important because it seeks to provide a greater amount of information to the Australian community. Those who oppose this legislation for a second time should think very carefully about their opposition because a vote against this bill is a vote against a better informed public. It is a vote against accountability in government and it is a vote against a more sustained level of business confidence and investment. As I said in February 1997, it is important that this legislation be, imported, uh, be supported in this and the other place. The, uh, the legislation creating the charter is—I mean, if the if the legislation creating the charter is enacted the second time round, it is incumbent on each of us 
to ensure that this and future governments uphold their commitment to publishing their fiscal targets and to make regular progress reports against those targets. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the bill. This Acting Speaker, I draw your attention to the state of the House. The quorum required? Is the quorum required? Yeah, well, no, you drew my attention to the House. The quorum required, ring the bells. Quorum present, the question, quorum present, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Blacksland. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This uh, Charter of Budget Honesty Bill, which has been reintroduced into this House, and will provide, no doubt, one of the triggers for a double dissolution election, needs to be looked at again. And it needs to be so because the government has refused a series of ten amendments put together by the uh, Australian Labor Party and other parties, <coughs> and those amendments go to a number of areas which would have substantially improved the bill originally before the House. Now, the Labor Party has supported this bill in the first instance and introduced a series of amendments to that bill in the Senate, and that process, I understand, will be undertaken again this time. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I might start where I'll finish and quote from the Department of the Parliamentary Library's Information and Research Services, uh, Digest number 142, and they say this. Arguably, the legislation is in most respects unnecessary. What is to be achieved under the bill can be achieved administratively for the life of the present parliament, that is, within existing executive discretions. <coughs> Not even regulations are required to allow the government to provide the electorate 
with the sort of information that the bill seeks to guarantee. Hence, it may be argued that the bill of itself is a relatively poor indicator of the government's capacity to govern and the workability of the parliament. As a test of the government's capacity to maintain parliamentary support or compliance, the defeat of the Charter of Budget Honesty Bill would not self-evidently present itself as a failure to pass a legislative proposal vital to the execution of a major policy of the ministry. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll note that here the Department of the Parliamentary Library in that last part, noting that of itself this may not, quote, present as a failure to pass a legislative proposal vital to the execution of a major policy of the ministry. That quoting comes, in fact, from another context from Sir Garfield Barwick in a radical Tory. Now, the point being made by the Parliamentary Library here is a fairly fundamental one, that if this piece of legislation is to be again rejected, if amendments made by the Australian Labor Party and the other parties in the Senate are to be refused by this government, if this bill was to be the only bill that the Prime Minister put to the Governor-General to seek a double dissolution under section 57 of the Constitution, it would make an extraordinarily interesting test case of the discretion of the Governor-General in terms of whether or not he should grant a double dissolution. Because there are precedents where advice had been sought previously for other double dissolution proposals. And the general notion that if a Prime Minister simply advises the Governor-General that he wants to have a double dissolution election and therefore that should happen because a piece of legislation or pieces have not been passed, that as of nature and as of course the Governor-General has to accept that very advice, that's come under question in the past. And indeed, the Parliamentary Library's paper underlines that fact by noting that the 1983 double dissolution sought by Prime Minister Fraser was subject to considerable discussion between Prime Minister Fraser and Governor-General Sir Ninian Stephen. And the question went to that of the workability of the parliament being a central factor and that that must be considered by the Governor-General in responding to a request for a dissolution. Now, there have been double dissolutions that have been granted on what we might think of fairly narrow grounds of insubstantial bills. But in fact, the Parliamentary Library points to a most interesting piece of, piece of advice given in 1914, and I quote at page 12 from their digest. Prior to the granting of the 1914 double dissolution, the then Governor-General, with the approval of his Prime Minister, approached the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia on his powers under section 57. Griffith CJ advised that the Governor-General was an independent arbiter who should dissolve both houses only where he is, and to quote Griffith CJ, personally satisfied after independent consideration of the case, either that the pro proposed law as to which the houses have differed in opinion is one of such public importance that it should be referred to the electors of the Commonwealth for immediate decision by means of a complete renewal of both houses, or that there exists such a state of practical deadlock in legislation as can only be ended in that way." End quote. A most interesting piece of advice from the then Chief Justice. If this bill was to be the only one presented to the Governor-General, we expect that there may be more, then it could be argued quite sensibly, quite rationally, that the Governor-General should be in a very strong position to refuse any grant of a double dissolution, because it would not be evidence of the unworkability of the parliament. 
it would not be evidence of a practical deadlock in legislation. And in part, one could use the argument that I quoted initially from the Parliamentary Library that, in fact, arguably the legislation is in most respects unnecessary. It can be done administratively. It can be done by regulation. And this, Mr Deputy Speaker, underlines part of the great problem with this Charter of Budget Honesty. This is essentially flummery and window dressing. It is essentially a political document which this government wishes to use for a number of political purposes. Those political purposes arise out of their actions prior to the last federal election and the manner in which they attempted to make an argument for supposedly more open government and a government that should be more responsible to the parliament. In fact, Prime Minister Howard, the then opposition leader, in his first headland speech talked about a future coalition government bringing in a charter of budget honesty with a view to rebuilding trust in government. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, two years on, you could ask some serious questions about how much trust has been rebuilt in government by this Prime Minister and this coalition government. And you could ask that question yesterday in a particularly pointed way, given that the Speaker of this House resigned for his own reasons and purposes, but we know that that goes to the manner in which he was treated by this Prime Minister and by several members of this coalition front bench. Mr Howard argued at the time that he wanted to enhance the position of the Auditor-General and the role of the parliament. But does this Charter of Budget Honesty really seek to enhance the role of the parliament, or is it designed for some other purpose? I think it's designed for other purposes. For almost three weeks of the last federal election, the first three weeks, the question that dominated the media and dominated coverage was the situation of the budget. Now, when the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Keating called the election on the 29th of January, he was just over one month away from the member for Jellybrand bringing down a mid-year review. When we came to government in 1983, budget reporting, as it had been over most of the period of this Commonwealth government, was almost negligible. Indeed, from 1975 until March 1983, throughout most of which period the member for Bennelong was in fact treasurer, an ineffective treasurer, I might say, in the view of his Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, an ineffective and ineffectual in terms of getting any major new legislative or administrative programs through the parliament because he couldn't win in that cabinet. That member for Bennelong, as treasurer, full well knows that when he was asked about the situation of the budget and what the budget deficit might be and the fact that there were reports that the budget deficit could be substantial, he gave some estimates and some guesses about what it might be. We had a figure of, I think, $4.6 billion. We had another figure of maybe $6 billion. On coming to government, we're not dealing with underlying structural budget deficits here. We're talking about with real headline deficits. When we came to government, it was discovered that, in fact, the member for Bennelong knew because he had been advised directly of what the budget deficit was, that it was $9.6 billion in 1983 terms. And that's the full headline deficit. That equates to $1998 terms of $25,000 million. This Prime Minister, the then Treasurer in 1983, knows that he was not honest, open, transparent and truthful 
in responding to questions about the budget deficit. And he knows that he was directly advised by his department, and instead of saying it's $9.6 billion, he chose to pick a number out of the air for his own private political and party purposes. So it's this Prime Minister, as ineffective and ineffectual as he was as Treasurer, who was attempting to remake past history in his time as Treasurer in bringing forward this Charter of Budget Honesty. And he's doing it to cover up his past, but he's also doing it for a number of other reasons. He knows full well that when they came to government, that the mid-year review announced by the member for Jellybrand dealt with the headline deficit and also dealt with the underlying structural deficit. But the brain from both he and the member for Higgins during the election campaign was a demand to know, right on the election, exactly what the figures were, not the fig figures of six weeks before, but what they were at that current time. And they've blasted the entire continent of Australia with the notion that they will be upfront, they will be clear, they will be open, they will be responsible, they will report to the nation exactly what the state of the budget is. This is a government that will not say what their target is in terms of the unemployment rate that they should be seeking to find. This is a government that, when the unemployment rate was 8.5 per cent, currently 8.2 per cent, would not say that they had a target to bring that unemployment rate down. This is a government that won't outline what its aims and objectives and targets are, not only in direct economic policy but also in the social policy areas as well. This is a government that's not true and open and transparent, but one that trumpets this piece of legislation, which says they will be. This is a government in its first and second budgets which stepped away from the accountability and transparency of the budget papers and its presentation of information that had been the hallmark of the Hawke and Keating governments of 13 years of Labor government. This is a government that stepped away from that because they haven't wanted to tell either the media or the Australian government what the true nature of their measures has been. This is a government that wouldn't outline fully what the costs of those measures would be to the Australian public that wouldn't, on budget night, have the cuts that they were making to their programs outlined so everyone could see what they were doing. They hid it away. And they also hid away the actual situation by entirely reversing the headline and underlying structural budget deficits, and they have consistently done that for two years. They are not being open. They are not being honest. Now, what's so hard for this government in terms of what is so hard, what is so shocking, what is so unreasonable in terms of the amendments passed in the Senate? I'll just go to a couple of those because they're fairly important. If the amendments put by the Senate are so utterly unreasonable as to negate this legislation, and as to make it a possible cause of a double dissolution election, you might think they are extremely weighty. You really have to ask yourself a question about not the budget accounting and not the forecasts or the state of the budget that's intended to be put prior to an election, but what the political purpose of this is, not just as the window dressing they wish to put up, not just as the fairy floss they wish to actually draw around their present state, but what they want to achieve in terms of muzzling the, the parliament and muzzling the opposition and putting the opposition in a position where it is not capable at election time of keeping its policies and its costings to itself as an opposition. This is a government and a prime minister that wants the prime minister and the executive government of this country to be in a position to determine absolutely what goes to the Australian electorate and to be in a position to determine that the opposition will not have a fair and equal chance of putting its policies and its costings before the electorate. So what they say they're doing, they're in fact doing the exact opposite. And I go to amendments six, seven, eight and nine. 
The Senate proposed a widening of the proposed prime ministerial discretion to request the responsible departmental secretaries to prepare costings of government policies to include unannounced as well as announced policies. <clears throat> And secondly, allowing the Leader of the Opposition to request responsible departmental secretaries to prepare costings of all opposition policies, including those not publicly announced. This is not earth-shattering stuff. This is reasonable and sensible and appropriate. What has been the government's response to that? The parliamentary paper <coughs> lays out what the government's response that this proposal has the potential to increase enormously the workloads of the departments in preparing costing reports as requests could be made to assess a myriad of policy alternatives and options. That's about it. Apart from that, they say that that process would also put the departments in a position of advising oppositions on the development of policy, and that's against the conventions of what's been done in the past. Not a very substantial response one would think, from this government. But further, the Senate proposed that the Prime Minister must agree from, to a request from the opposition, opposition leader for opposition policies to be costed. Time and time again, in 1987 and 1990 and 1993, this coalition, when in opposition, demanded the right to have their policies costed by the federal bureaucracy. Here, their response is, that that right should not exist with an opposition leader, despite the fact that they demanded it time and time again. The Senate also said that the bill should make it plain that nothing in Clause 29 requires the Leader of the Opposition to disclose to the Prime Minister the details of an opposition policy. I'll say that again. The bill makes it plain that nothing in Clause 29 requires the Leader of the Opposition to disclose to the Prime Minister the details of an opposition policy. This Charter of Budget Honesty seeks to make it mandatory that the Leader of the Opposition, if he wants policies costed, has to give a copy of those policies to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister would then be in a position to determine whether he chose to refer those to the departments for costing. He would then be in a position an example in previous, the previous history of this Commonwealth where he would have total knowledge of the policies that the opposition was putting up. Now, the government's statements to date have not squarely addressed these two issues, other to, than to suggest that the proposals would lead to a lack of transparency in the, in the costing process. This is a political document with political intent. The very minor steps they take to build on the work done by Labor in presenting much better budgetary figurings and much better budgetary reporting in the 13 years that we were in office, office those minor steps we have supported. Order. But the here we say these amendments should go has through. Expired. The question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. I, I call the honourable member for Burke. Yes, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Yes, yes. I call uh, your attention to the state of the house. Quorum required. Ring the bells.
That's all right, Robin. You're not intending to leave the chamber, are you? for Bruce as eager for a, an audience. Okay. Neither did Gareth. Neither. Quorum present. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I might uh, recall to the House that in my first year uh, in this place in 1993, the circumstances were that a quorum was called upon me at that occasion, midway through what I thought was a particularly impressive speech. I'm sure the Deputy Speaker would have agreed. And it was a time of a uh, delicate caucus meeting with respect to the conduct of that 93 budget. And no one came down to listen, and the House closed on me on that occasion. So I'm very pleased that the, uh, the government of today has come along to ensure that I have the right to speak tonight. We're here to debate the Charter of Budget Honesty Bill, which has been considered by this House, also by the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, and on from that the Senate been returned with amendments, amendments rejected and now being considered yet again. I'm the deputy chair of that particular parliamentary committee which considered this legislation um, some time ago and I'd like to make some comments tonight with respect to what occurred on that occasion and also make some general comments about the bill and about some of the history to this bill and the issue of the question of Charter of Budget Honesty. On the question of the Public Accounts Committee, which is a report which has been referred to, Report 351, an advisory report on the Charter of Budget Honesty Bill 1996, which has been referred to by a number of speakers in the debate. One thing I would like to make clear, it's been said by some that uh, witnesses in general were quite uh, um, happy. Uh, con pleased to see this particular bill coming forward and saw it as being a major leap forward. I think that's overestimating things slightly. A number of speakers who came to the, um, to the committee, a number of witnesses, were quite happy and saw it as a step forward. But I think that um, I'd like to quote the words as I did on the uh, last occasion I spoke on this um, issue um, of Professor Mark Robinson, who made a submission to the inquiry and said, no legislation can compel fiscal responsibility. The most positive view of the bill is that it is merely the latest in a long series of incremental improvements in fiscal reporting requirements. So as far as it goes, it's a good thing. But it could go further. These things develop over time. And the fact is developments on this issue can occur over time and should. But I think one thing that has to be understood is those developments have been occurring predominantly over the last 13 years prior to the election of this government under the Hawke-Keating Labor governments. 
a range of changes occurred on the question of reporting during those times, a range of developments which saw an improvement in the circumstances of what information was provide, provided to the public on the question of our fiscal position. And I guess part of the reason for that, I think, goes back to the question of prior to the election of the Hawke government, some nearly 15 years ago, almost to the day, when the now Prime Minister, John Howard, member for Bennelong, was the Treasurer, and the Treasurer for some five to six years. He made a number of comments then on the circumstances he faced, which seemed to have been forgotten by the other side of the House in the time since. I'd like to take up a couple of those issues today just to set the context for what we're talking about here. At the time, on the question of estimates, and we are talking about estimates with a lot of this stuff, at a press conference, and I quote from Hansard and an extract from um, the press conference of the 21st of February 1983, when he was Treasurer, he, he said, I can't put it more firmly than some estimates because the nature of calculating these things is such that you really don't know until much closer to the event precisely where revenue and expenditure are going to go. He went on, let me point out that this time last year when the government got its first look at the likely shape of the 1982-83 budget, it appeared on the basis of calculations then that our deficit position would be a great deal better than what it ultimately turned out to be and the estimates of revenue which made certain assumptions about wages growth and certain assumptions about activity growth were much more buoyant. I genuinely believe that it's impossible to go hard on the size of next year's deficit. So I think the uh, then Treasurer was making a point about the question of estimations, the difficulty with accuracy and the fact that often they need to be changed. But of course, during that particular election, which led to the change of government, we had a situation where, as he has said since then, that in fact he was given three different figures around the time of the election from Treasury about the size of the deficit. Eight billion dollars before the election campaign began, nine billion dollars the week before the election, and nine point six billion dollars the day before the election. And yet these figures were not released until after the event. When questioned on this, he later justified it by saying that his figure, some $6 billion, was a personal estimate which he was entitled to produce, having been Treasurer for five years. One worries if the current incumbent is in the job for anything like that length of time. As I said, though, when we look at the question of the changes in accountability over that time, We've seen a number of advances. The Labor government, over the time of its time in government, introduced the publication of three-year forward estimates of outlays and revenue, which was something the previous government, the Treasurer of which is now the current Prime Minister, did not do. The Ford government also introduced the publication of annual tax expenditure statements, again, something the previous government was unable or unwilling to do. The Labor government also introduced the mid-year review itself and also the National Fiscal Outlook, again things which Mr Howard as Treasurer for a number of years of this country in the late 70s, early 80s was unable or unwilling to do. The question there I think is something that he needs to answer himself but seems to, on the occasions he is in the House, see, um, try to ignore. The genesis of this particular legislation goes back to a JCPA report 341, financial reporting for the Commonwealth towards greater transparency and accountability. And um, some members of the um, JCPA, or now, now JCPAA, like Senator Brian Gibson and uh, former chair uh, member for, um, for Fairfax, um, Alex Somalay, uh, I think are, are worthy of congratulation in terms of their work. Uh, on this issue. It particularly came about um, with respect to examinations and consultations that occurred in New Zealand regarding the question of the operation of the system there and adjustments that have been made in recent years. But again, 
there are criticisms of what's been proposed on the terms of how far it goes. Again, I quote from Hansard, from a speech by the member for Werriwa, where he quotes from the spring 1996 magazine Policy from the Centre of Independent Studies. The quote is from Ruth Richardson, who was the finance minister, as I understand it, of the um, New Zealand government um, at um, a time when the, this legislation, it, the Fiscal Responsibility Act in New Zealand was being um, developed and implemented, and who is seen as being somewhat expert in this field. She said, similar criticisms apply to the proposed Australian Charter of Budget Honesty when you compare it with New Zealand's Fiscal Responsibility Act, which was enshrined in legislation in 1994. One needs to tie politicians' hands by ensuring transparent quality information about the fiscal position. Only quality disclosure and full knowledge about the long-term consequences of fiscal initiatives will discipline governments and parliament. From what I have seen to date, I am not sure whether the Australian Charter will meet these requirements. We know what the characteristics of responsible fiscal responsibility are, yet the Charter shies away from such a discipline. Parliament may well dilute clear binding rules on reporting and auditing of the sort laid down in the New Zealand Fiscal Responsibility Act. Act. Now, I must admit I'm not a great admirer of many things fiscal that have originated in New Zealand, but I think that we do need to temper our enthusiasm for this bill and for this sort of legislation with the question of how it will actually operate in the cold, hard light of day. Because the fact of the matter is, it just isn't quite that simple. Those opposite have made great play of the question of the black hole, which, uh, as I think I've said in speeches previously, was a Disney movie of some 20 years ago, which I saw as a much younger man. Uh, in terms of the situation faced by this government when it ascended the Treasury benches some two years ago. However, this is a comment I think that we've got to be cynical about this. Every new government always seems to manage to find major problems with the accounts they receive and then endeavours to use that as a basis for reconfiguring its own commitments in terms of the future, sometimes justifiably, sometimes not. But will this legislation really change that? I doubt it, but I do think it is a step forward. I think the changes that are being proposed are part of what needs to be done, but it can go further, and it should go further. And when we consider the amendments which were considered by the Senate and supported by the Senate, I think we see some of the issues which ought to be embraced by this government and which, in fact, can be embraced by this government. Let's not misunderstand the circumstances that we now face. The opposition is prepared to pass this bill. The opposition supports the concept and supports the guts of this bill. But there are amendments that can be made and should be made and ought to be made to improve the bill. As we see the incremental development of something such as a Charter of Budget Honesty as something which relates to as part of a development of our financial and fiscal framework which allows accountability on a general and a specific basis and an ongoing basis. We do have a situation where these changes are sensible. They're changes that I'm sure many of those opposite would like to support, but who feel, because of the constraints placed on them, I suspect, by the Treasurer, feel they can't. But the fact is, as earlier speakers have said, those amendments do make sense. They do improve the environment. They do improve the circumstances which could operate around the question of a Charter of Budget Honesty. And for that reason, I would urge the government to seriously consider it. For an example of that issue relates to one of the amendments, which relates to the question of signing off. I won't go into the detail, but the um, position of the uh, Secretary, particularly Secretary of the Treasury, around the question of signing off reports, not just the final report pre-election, but the regular reports that are made of government on economic matters. There's no reason why this can't be done. It, in effect, is done now in many respects, but this formalised it. And the fact is that formalisation is an important part of the process because I think, as we all know, when we're talking about the question of accountability, we are often in a situation that's not only a matter of what people see as happening, what actually is happening, but what people agree is seen to be happening. That may sound convoluted, but the fact is sometimes appearance articulates the substance, and the substance in these circumstances 
is very important if we are talking about things being out in the open. But the fact of the matter is, when we look at the question of budget honesty, there will always be criticisms. I don't believe this bill, when in operation, will stop those criticisms. I don't believe it will lead to a situation where they end. Hopefully it will lead to a situation where we're arguing more around the edges than in terms of the basic points. When we talk about the question of uh, estimations and um, uh, forecasts, I would again make a comment which um, I quoted from the Secretary of the Treasury uh, at the uh, hearings of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts where he said, it is in the nature of forecasts that they will always be wrong and we have to do our best to minimise those errors. That is a situation we will all face and will face into the future. I urge the government to reconsider its position on these amendments. I believe it can improve the bill. I believe if they are serious about this issue, they can adjust their position to incorporate it and lead to a situation where we again incrementally improve the whole financial accountability framework within the budgetary system of this country. And I urge them to do it and to do it speedily and not use this as an excuse to try and rush off to the people on other issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. I call the honourable member for Correa. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, uh, let's not pull any punches in this debate tonight, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This bill should be renamed the Charter of Budget Dishonesty Bill. That's what it should be renamed, because uh, what this is is one of the most massive exercises in political and economic deceit that this nation has ever seen. And I think we should reflect on, on uh, one particular feature of this bill uh, which uh, we find quite interesting. It's an optional piece of legislation. It's like one of those non-core promises that the Prime Minister happens to, uh, happen to have made before the 1996 election. Now we have an optional piece of legislation, a piece of legislation that doesn't bind the government to anything, really doesn't bind them to any standards in uh, fiscal responsibility. So really, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we question the very worth of the legislation, if I might just Where'd go? pick up some papers here. <laughs> this worthless piece of legislation that's been foisted on uh, the uh, fiscal planners of, of this nation. Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I find it uh, incredible that the uh, government has failed to accept the reasonable amendments that were made to this uh, particular piece of legislation after it was introduced to this uh, chamber some time ago. Now, we believe in a democratic process. We b surely we believe in a reasonable and rational debate around these particular questions and issues. And when this particular legislation came into the House, uh, we on this side proposed certain amendments which we uh, proposed would improve this legislation. They went to another place and, of course, uh, many of those uh, amendments were accepted and uh, others added on. In a spirit of uh, democratic process, in the spirit of democratic process, I would have thought that the government would have welcomed these amendments which uh, were designed to improve uh, this piece of legislation, but uh, alas, they didn't. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we need to uh, put this piece of legislation in its correct historical and political context. Uh, on the, the speech that I made on the 6th of February 1997, when this uh, legislation was before the House for the first time, I said uh, that this legislation was a crude attempt by the Prime Minister to exercise a terrible political ghost from his past. That's really all it is. We had, we had the worst treasurer in Australia's post-war history returning to the scene of the crime to try and make amends for the mess that he left the Australian economy in and the shambles of an economy that the Australian people and indeed the, the incoming Labor government had to deal with in 1983. And I think, uh, I think we, will continue. we will continue in economic debates in this House 
to remind the Australian people and to remind those opposite that the Prime Minister who now leads them was one of the worst fiscal vandals that this country has ever seen. One of the worst fiscal vandals this country has ever seen. Now, I find it extraordinary. The depth of the gall of the Prime Minister astounds a newcomers to this house, a relative newcomers to this house, when he gets up in this place and he levies a charge against the Leader of the Opposition about budget deficits. About budget deficits. For goodness sake, the $25 billion man, that's what he is, the $25 billion man is getting up here in this House and, and, and lecturing us on the Opposition about charters of budget honesty and tax reform. What an incredible pop proposition from a Prime Minister who deliberately deceived the Australian people in 1983. That's why we, are, why we have this Charter of Budget Honesty Bill. It's mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. For my past sins, I now present to the House a Charter of Budget Honesty, which I hope will wash away my political sins from my past. Well, we'll wash them away, and I can go to political heaven when P1 and P2 move against the, move against the Prime Minister uh, in the near future and grab, grab the, uh, the Liberal leadership. I can at least go to political heaven knowing that I, I really did make an honest effort to make amends for the shambles of an economy that he left the Australian Labor Party in 1983 and the deceit, the political deceit that uh, he foisted on the Australian people when he said, well, I don't really know what the deficit was. It was uh, maybe nine. No, it wasn't nine. We couldn't really get the figures out of him in 1983. So I can understand, Prime Minister, I understand how you've come to this place wanting to wash away the terrible sins of your past. Now, the amendments that have been placed before the House are very, they're not very controversial at all. They're not very controversial at all. What the amendments uh, that have been put, put into this legislation, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the most important one of those is to ensure that the Commissioner of Taxation and the Secretary to the Treasury provide a report on any material threats to the integrity of the tax system including the fiscal impact of any of these threats as a permanent uh, and making it a permanent and in integral part of the fiscal reporting uh, uh, framework of this nation. Now I would have thought anybody who is remotely interested in budget honesty and setting up a realistic framework, one would set up a framework that was legally binding and two would ensure the integrity of the tax system, the integrity of the revenue base, is protected at all times and correctly reported on at all times. But no, but no, this sham, this sham of uh, uh, a charter of budget honesty bill that is being uh, uh, that being introduced to this place uh, by the government continues. Now, I have a few suggestions for the Prime Minister because I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've only gone a little way. We've only gone a little itsy bitsy way in getting honesty back into the political and economic system in this country. I'm, uh, I'm proposing to the Prime Minister, as well as uh, putting up a charter of budget honesty, that he puts up a charter of parliamentary and ministerial responsibility. I think that would be important. The, hon the Honourable Industry Minister, we know that he has skated on thin ice as far as these issues are concerned in recent times and in the recent debates. The one that got away, the big fish that got away, the big fish that should have gone down with the Titanic but managed to start. We say about the Honourable Industry Minister, uh, through you, Mr Deputy Speaker, you're a survivor and we love you for it. We really do. because. You are, you are a living witness to the decrepit decay of this particular government. Now we've had, I just happened to open the newspaper today, Mr Deputy Speaker. My heart did beat fast because there was the list. 
the terrible seven, was it? All right. What, what number are we up to now? Ministers of the Crown that have bit the dust in the most, what I would have to say, is the most incompetent and rotten government that this country has seen uh, since in the post-war era. But it doesn't end there. We have a backbench that's deserting you. Your own members are going into the crossbenches because they think you're, you're, there is no leadership in your party. And then, of course, you do the speaker in, and none of you on the government ranks have the, have the gumption to put your hand up and say, we'll have it. It's a Liberal Party position. Now, that is no reflection on the current speaker. We know that he is an eminent Australian and, and the, the one person in the coalition ranks with the skill and uh, the, the knowledge of this House to make a fist of the job. But it doesn't say much for you lot. It doesn't say much for you lot when you couldn't even put one person up from your own party to, uh, to uh, have the speaker. Point of order, I ask the Honourable Member Can I ask you, uh, Mr. Minister? Can I ask you, Mr. Speaker, if the current speaker has any relevance to the debate? Well, I would suggest that it would be a good idea if the Honourable Member for took note of the Minister's intervention and uh, responded. I will, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and uh, might I say uh, I was going to make another suggestion which does really uh, go to the heart of this uh, question of budget honesty and my suggestion to the Prime Minister, as well as introducing a charter of budget honesty and a charter of parliamentary uh, and ministerial responsibility, he might also like to introduce a charter of electoral honesty. Because, uh, because we had a plethora of promises made by the Prime Minister. That, that rather cute distinction that he now makes between core and non-core promises made to the Australian people and later reneged on on the basis that he was indulging himself yet again in another bout of fiscal responsibility. That was the reason, that was the reason why the Prime Minister uh, acutely uh, segregated his promises into core promises and non-core promises simply because he came uh, in the few months after he was elected saying that he had a, a black hole to deal with as far as the uh, fiscal state of this nation was concerned. Mr. Dep uh, Mr Speaker, I wonder what the Prime Minister would have done in 1983 as far as the, a fiscal black hole was concerned if he had have faced the deficit that the Labor Party had to face when it came to power in 1983. He'd be still zooming down the black hole, the $25 billion black hole that he created. But of course, uh, what, what worries me, Mr Speaker, is the fact that the Prime Minister gets up in this House and talks as he does in those. Uh, he's a real zealot on taxation reform, and of course the Treasurer is as well. well well, I find it quite, quite extraordinary because we know the Prime Minister was a friend of the tax bludgers it and being the tax rorters. It 7.30pm, I propose the question of the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Dixon. Speaker, um, I wanted to uh, uh, congratulate the Queensland Sheffield Shield side on their impressive win in the Mercantile Mutual Cup and also at the same time wanted to reflect uh, on uh, a couple of players. Uh, first of all, to mention uh, Jeff Foley from my own electorate, uh, who played a very important part and has played a very important part in all of the uh, one-day games. But I particularly wanted to reflect uh, on uh, Matthew Hayden, and uh, I do so because, uh, having watched Matthew Hayden since he entered cricket, uh, I think in 1990-91, it has been a very, very sad career. And uh, it's a career, in my view, that has occurred because, in many respects, he has never been given a fair go. When, when I first uh, started watching cricket, my father was a, a very keen cricketer, and uh, I also played myself, but never to the level that he did, or, or the uh, minister at the table, I might say, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, I recall uh, seeing probably the greatest left hand batsman ever in uh, the 1960-61 uh, famous series against the West Indies, and that was uh, Garfield Sobers. Sobers was uh, and remains the best left-hand batsman I have ever seen, and probably the best all-rounder who 
has ever played the game of cricket. And when I first saw uh, Matthew Hayden playing cricket, uh, he reminded me more than any other player of uh, Garfield Sabres. When, when Hayden came in, he was a dashing left-hand batsman. He hit anything uh, sometimes only just barely short of a length, and maybe in a good length he would hit it and hit it hard. His style was uh, impressive to watch. He was the sort of cricketer that brought, brought people to the game, and I have many followers of cricket in my own electorate, particularly people uh, in the Pine Rivers uh, Cricket Club who uh, are very, very keen cricketers and who have, who have provided a nursery for many cricketers. But to see uh, Matthew Hayden uh, last weekend was, was a total transformation. Uh, a, a man who was moving across uh, outside the off stump when he needn't do so, and ultimately he was out LBW for a very low score. Now, why has that happened, uh, Mr. S Mr. Speaker? Uh, while uh, I don't want to pose as an expert on cricket, I, I do believe it's capable of being traced back to the fact that he was never given a fair go. In his first season for Queensland, he scored more than a thousand runs. He scored century after century. But when an Australian side was picked, an unknown from Victoria called Wayne Phillips was made the opening batsman. Now, Wayne Phillips played one or two tests and has never been seen or heard of again. But Matthew Hayden, a great cricketer who should have been playing for Australia right from the beginning, from that time onward, in my view, his confidence as a cricketer, and, and cricket is about confidence, it's about knowing that you can do the job, his confidence as a cricketer was eroded. And in my view, uh, from then on, given the treatment that was meted out to him, I don't believe he has ever been the same cricketer. And of course, what often happens in sport when somebody sees you and, uh, and says, "Well, you didn't make the team, but you should change your style a bit. You should you shouldn't go for everything outside the off stump." I mean, the man had made 14, 13, 13 to 1400 runs in his first season of cricket, and somebody saying to him, "Well, your style is a little bit different to other people." But if you comp compared his style to that of, uh, to that of uh, the, the West Indian type batsmen, who do have a go at everything, be it short of a length, be it pitched up, be it uh, on a good length, that's the sort of style that brings Australians into cricket grounds and uh, the, the sort of cricket that we loved and delighted in coming from West Indians in particular. But it was that sort of style that somebody grabbed hold of you and said, look, that, that's really not good enough. You've got to tighten up a bit. Don't try and flick anything off your legs. You'll get caught. All of these sorts of things. And ultimately, I believe his ability, combined with a very biased selection process, which favoured New South Wales and certainly favoured Mark Taylor, who was constantly picked, despite the fact that he was out of form constantly, ahead of Matthew Hayden. I think all of those things have, have, have left an indelible mark on him. I hope he can come out of it. I really do. I think he is a great cricketer. He's an absolute credit to the sport. He has never said a word or complained or, or, or said he's, he's never had a fair deal. Well, I don't think he's had a fair deal, but I don't think he's ever complained. I think he's a credit to the game, an ornament. I hope he comes back bigger and better th th than ever next year with uh, his style back in shape. And I really wish him well, and I wish the Queenslanders well in their quest for the Sheffield Shield. Thank you, Rapsa. Before I call the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger, I apologise for not calling you first. I got the sides round wrong. The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. All right. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and congratulations on becoming the Speaker of the House. Thank you. Uh, with International Women's Day uh, coming on this Sunday, it's timely that we put down some markers about the impact of the Howard government on Australia's women. Because it is the case since the Howard government came to power in 1996 that Australian women have found it harder to get a job, harder to get a wage increase, harder to pay for childcare, harder to pay for health care for themselves and their families, harder to pay for their own and their children's education, and of course, very much harder to pay for aged care. It's Australian women who have paid the ultimate price for the Howard government's deep cuts to health, education and community services. So the message, the message from the Howard government to Australian women has been clear. When it, comes, when it comes to balancing work and family responsibilities, you're on your own. You're on your own out there because there is nothing this government is going to do to help you. Let's just look at one of the most important things of all, what this government has failed to do as, as far as providing job opportunities for women are concerned. 
Over 300,000 women are currently unemployed, and 86,000 of these have been unemployed for more than a year. Let's just make a very important comparison. During the 1980s recovery, from November 1983 to August 1989, female employment expanded by 850,000 jobs. Women actually gained 55 per cent of the extra jobs created in that period. Now let's look at the relevant comparison to the current recovery, which of course started earlier in the 1990s. Let's just look at what's happened. In the current recovery, female employment growth has stagnated, has stagnated with only 20,000 extra jobs created, whereas in the 1990s recovery in the comparable period, so we're talking about the same period of time, we're comparing 20,000 jobs for women under the Howard government compared to 215,000 jobs under the Labor government. This is material from Jeff Borland from the Australian National University. It is an indictment on this government because what it shows is when it comes to ensuring that you can earn an income to make sure that your family budget is adequate to put food on the table, this government is going to do nothing about making sure that you get a job. And of course, what happens uh, at child care is so, with childcare is so interrelated. Childcare costs under this government, as so many families know, and particularly women know, childcare costs have risen by, by approximately $20 a week. $20 a week to make up for the $820 million taken from this government out of childcare. For many women, for many women, the response has been, I have to reduce my hours. Some of, some of them, have, in fact, have had to leave the workforce altogether. Under the Howard government, childcare is becoming a luxury. It is no longer the case that the majority, that so many women, that so many working women are having to face reducing their hours, leaving the workforce. And what does it mean? They're having to end up uh, using services that are by no means the same uh, level of quality that they were getting in uh, decent daycare services. What this government is trying to do, that so many women uh, say to me, uh, this government, particularly the Prime Minister, wants to just send women home. So they're not creating the jobs. They're not creating the jobs so that women can get out and earn an income to contribute to their families. And, what, and the other side of it, of course, is that they're making childcare so expensive that they are forcing those women who have struggled to keep their jobs out of the workforce because they just can't afford an increase in $20 of $20 a week to their childcare costs. This government must be condemned for what it has done to Australian women. We will have a lot more to say about this between now and Sunday because the truth is certainly known by Australian women and we will, uh, we will be drawing all the details to their attention. Member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and congratulations on this, your first day in the job. Uh, during my campaign in the March 1996 election, I promised a second EIS on the Badgerys Creek Airport site. I promised that EIS would have immense and widespread public consultation, that it would be independently audited, uh, that it would consider an airport of the maximum size it could possibly be built on that site, and it would contain a no-go option. It was clear to me by the end of 1995 that the 1986 EIS on an overflow airport at Badgerys Creek that the Labor Party had relied on uh, in, uh, was in completely outdated. By 1993, Diane Beamer, the then mayor of Penrith and now the member for Badgerys Creek, had successfully campaigned to have the airport at Badgerys Creek extended and to have the facilities expanded so that it could cater for international aircraft. By 1994, Laurie Brereton had said, Sydney West Airport at Badgerys Creek will operate without a curfew and that's absolutely non-negotiable. Mr Speaker, my electorate of Lindsay was Labor heartland. And Labor felt that out there in Western Sydney they could treat the residents uh, like mushrooms. 
not keep them informed, sneak in an overflow airport, don't inform them and have them all jumping up and down for joy because uh, of what a wonderful thing Labor was doing for them representing them in this place. Publicly they made that 1986 EIS available and said that the results did not preclude an international non-curfew airport at Badgeries Creek. And they proceeded to criticise John Howard and, in fact, Bob Carr and uh, Faye Lopo condemned um, the, uh, Mr Howard in a motion in the state parliament for his action to delay the construction of a Sydney West airport at Badgeries Creek uh, in his decision to have a further EIS. This is how much of a fraud uh, the Labor was in that area. That 1986 EIS and the subsequent actions by the Labor Party was a fraud. It was a classic example of Graham Richardson's whatever it takes philosophy of Labor politics. Well, surprise, surprise, a Liberal won Lindsay. Because Labor Heartland got sick and tired of being taken for granted, not just with respect to the airport issue, but with respect to our roads out in that area. The M4 at the moment is a complete joke, and Bob Carr is doing absolutely nothing about catering to our needs. Then he comes in with the poker tax, uh, the pokies tax, the um, land tax. Uh, our hospital waiting lists have blown out. He's given us the cheap option on Warragamba Dam. He's increased tobacco and alcohol excises. Uh, He's fiscally been so irresponsible to make the residents in my electorate continue to pay. Well, we instituted a new EIS. We delivered for the people of Western Sydney. And we've made this EIS so that it looks at a proposal that is as big as an airport could possibly be. There will be no surprises if Labor should ever and I really do hope it never occurs, but if Labor ever snuck back into power by telling a bunch of lies out in Western Sydney, they would never get away with that little sneaky in, oh, it's just an overflow airport that Anthony Albanese and Leo Maclay always say. It is going to be a very public consultation that this has been, and I've really ensured that with a survey that I conducted out at the end of my electorate. Uh, as far as Castlereagh and Cranbrook and uh, Bly Park, they are aware of the impact of the airport. They are aware of uh, what the EIS has to say about it. They are aware of what the independent auditor has said about it. And that airport, that independent auditor, basically has a summary as follows: the major deficiencies identified by the auditor in the draft EIS are listed in the preceding chapters or in the actual audit. But the key deficiencies are in the area of project definition interaction with Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport, the assessment of a do-nothing option and related environmental assessment of impacts both at Badgeries Creek and Sydney Kingsford Smith, presentation and interpretation of noise information, air quality assessment, land use planning and related social community issues, assessment of surf surface waters, visual assessment, economic evaluation and mitigation measures for construction and operation uh, impacts. Now, all of these have to be addressed in the final EIS. And still we have Labor trying to score cheap political points, demanding a decision before the complete EIS is, is carried out, and uh, the full information is available both for the inner city residents as well as the outer city residents to know that an adequate decision has been made. And I urge all of my constituents to put in a submission by the 30th of March, to attend the 15th of March rally in Jamison Park, and let's have a say, because the we won't be the mushrooms of Western Sydney any longer. I call on the honourable member for Denison. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise tonight, uh, and I apologise to my colleague, the member for Lyons, for interceding uh, in his place, uh, because of the exceptional circumstances which have arisen. Uh, you will recall, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, in Senate estimates, uh, Senator Hill gave an undertaking that by close of business uh, today uh, he would be tabling a range of documents, particularly relating to decisions which he made, uh, where he overturned recommendations on priority orders coming to him uh, from state advisory committees under the Natural Heritage Trust. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it now appears that those documents will not be available uh, for tabling. They were not tabled today at close of business in the Senate. Shame. Now, uh, Senator Hill's office uh, rang uh, our Senate leader, Senator Faulkner, and indicated that uh, they required further time 
uh, for this material to be put in a form suitable for tabling. Uh, and we have accepted that. So I make uh, no suggestion that there is uh, in any way uh, a, a sense in which uh, we have uh, indicated that uh, uh, we will not permit that course to take place. But we do understand, as a matter of fact, although this was not disclosed in that conversation, that uh, Senator Hill's office has had the full materials available to him since noon today, at least noon today. And we understand from information we have received that his office has been in crisis meetings all day uh, and that he is in a process of seeking to put the information in a form firstly suitable for tabling but also to enable him uh, to make a presentation statement when that material is put down. Now that material, that material, I believe, ought to have been made available to the opposition also overnight so that we would also be in a position to have an analysis made of that material. We expect it to be in that position. My staff and other staff were available to undertake that, uh, that analysis of what we understand will be a substantial volume of materials so that by question time tomorrow the opposition would be in a position uh, to examine and to test the minister in relation to these matters in which we have raised considerable concerns. We may not be in a position uh, to do so, depending on the circumstances of the tabling, the timing of the tabling and our capacity to bring a forensic examination to that material uh, in the time uh, which will be available to us. This, I believe, is yet one more step in a process where the opposition has been uh, sought to be tactically manoeuvred by Senator Hill to reduce the impact of what increasingly is being shown to be a scandal of massive proportions. But the material will be examined closely by us. Uh, we will, I, I am certain, be in a position to make some uh, preliminary uh, comment in relation to it by close of business tomorrow. And we will be looking at it over the weekend. This is not going to go away. This is not going to go away. And the hope, the hope that it can be in some way avoided by not providing the raw material to the opposition overnight to enable them to examine it and to have the same time of examination as the minister is, uh, is requiring for himself will not make this scandal go away. We have a situation now where the minister, where the minister has been unable to meet the timelines of his previous undertaking. We are looking forward to that material coming forward and we are also looking forward to the minister making good on his undertaking to supply the full range of unsuccessful applications and, uh, the st and, and a short descriptor of what, what those applications were for and in which electorates they were uh, sought. Only when that full range of material is available will we be able to have a comprehensive examination of the, so of the claim that these, cases were, these determinations were made on merit. Uh, I think, that, uh, I think that that will be sufficient for my comments tonight, but I do again say that there have been crisis me meetings in the minister's office. No doubt the minister, the, the reason for those crises meetings will become apparent tomorrow. The Honourable Member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tonight I rise to speak about the Shadow Attorney-General Senator Nick Bolkes's disgraceful actions relating to the deliberate leak of information from a confidential federal court document linked with Christopher Scase. I would like to address this, in relation, this issue in relation to Senator, Senator Bolkes, a man who was without doubt Mr. Speaker, committed an act akin to treason against the Australian people. And I believe that the Leader of the Opposition, the Hon. Kim Beasley, must call for the Senator's resignation immediately. As the Minister for Justice, Senator the Hon. Honor Amanda Vanstone announced yesterday, Senator Bolkus has been caught red-handed leaking this information in a media conference earlier this year. At the conference, Senator Bolkus, referring to a confidential federal court document Relating to the case said, I can't give this document out, but maybe if I just read it out off the record. This is the proceedings in court. 
Mr Speaker, as you can see, this once, once again demonstrates exactly how many members of the Labor Party feel that they can undermine the national interest for personal political purposes. And Senator Bolkus is a shining example of this. Senator Vanstone announced on Monday of this week that the trustee of Mr Scase's bankrupt estate, Mr Max Donnelly, described the material published from the document as the most damaging of all information that had been released to the media. Here we have the federal government trying valiantly in a process to recover the debts of one of this country's most wanted men, while people like Senator Bolkus attempt to intervene for the, ben for the benefit of Australia's most wanted man, Christopher Scase. This process will see Mr Scase finally brought to justice over this ongoing outrageous and flagrant abuse of the Australian people and our justice system. Show me the logic in that, Senator Bolkus. The fact is there is no logic whatsoever in his actions. It's just another example of his contempt for the Australian people who have made it quite clear that Mr Scase should, must be brought to justice. Mr Speaker, throughout the Scase chase, Senator Bolkus has continually denied any role in the leaking of this information. However, the latest evidence proves that he is willing to undermine the people of this country for his own political purposes. And, Mr Speaker, I'm sure you'll be interested to note that Senator Bolkus was most certainly a part of a government which failed in its efforts to bring Scase to account. During the Keating government's reign, when Mr Scase was allowed access to his passport, which in turn saw him flee justice. Mr Speaker, this action by Senator Bolkus over the last two months strongly demonstrates the contempt, as I said earlier, he has for the Australian court processes. And once, once again, I call on Mr Beasley to demand that the senator resign. As Senator Van Zoon so correct, said so correctly, Senator Nick Bolkus's actions prove that he is unfit to hold the position of Australia's alternative Attorney General and Minister for Justice. Mr Speaker, I say to you once again, Senator Bolkus has committed an act akin to treason against the Australian people and must be sacked. And I call upon the Leader of the Opposition to demonstrate some form of leadership and rid the other place of a senator whose actions prove he is unfit to hold such a high position of office in our land. And before I finish, Mr Speaker, I would just like to add that we shouldn't forget that Bolkus recklessly endangered the extradition of Dolly Dunn. He, rec he was recklessly indifferent to the success of the Dunn extradition, even though US authorities warned public debate risked the extra extradition. And in fact, our Attorney-General had to send a letter to Beasley read the behaviour of Bolkus and others, which is absolutely shameful and disgraceful and typical of the Australian Labor Party today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I congratulate you and wish you well in your new office of Speaker. Yeah. The plan to privatise the CES was outlined in the Ministerial State in Reforming Employment Assistance, which was released with the 1996-97 budget. The government took pub public consultation on the process and released the results in December 1996. In the end, the government launched its new job network to replace the CES late last month and announced successful tenders for the services previously provided by the CES. The evolution of the job network has seen some changes, not least of which was, of course, the change of the minister responsible. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm I have great, greatly confident in, in Mr. Kemp's uh, abilities. He's uh, one of the best ministers in the cabinet, and I believe that he is sincere in the approach he has taken to privatise the services involved in helping the unemployed find work. However, I'm less confident in the processes that have been undertaken as a consequence. One of Minister Kemp's press releases said there is a total of 306 organisations that have been contracted. 153 are private. 134 are community and 19 are government organisations. My colleagues, the member for Lowe and the member for Clare, have both raised concerns about the process for warding contracts in the House in the last couple of days. I am sure that there are members of the coalition who have private concerns, but I very much doubt we may get to hear them. We'll get to hear of them publicly, other than those comments made by Senator Eggleston, which he had to uh, withdraw about five hours later on being informed of the actual fact of the matter. 
Today at Question Time, the member for Prospect raised an issue of a winner of a tender to provide services, allegedly having no staff, no equipment, no premises, and, in her words, presumably no track record at delivering these services. This person is alleged to have won the contract ahead of existing service delivery organisations with good track records. Now, if this is true, it is a worry. Unemployment is a very serious problem for hundreds of thousands of people who, don't deserve to, who do not deserve to be punished further by sloppy contracting, if this is the case. If it is true, it will also show the government may not be able to rise above the experience under the Labor Party. I recollect it was the current Prime Minister in 1987 who was so scathing on the Labor government's decisions to grant contracts for coastal surveillance air contracts for Northern Australia to a company who did not even have aircraft at the time. In my electorate, I've begun to hear from many people who are concerned at the way some contracts have been allocated. I've no doubt that some very good work will be done by the successful organisations, and I want, don't want to reflect on the organisations being successful because I know they have, in all of the cases, a very, very strong pedigree. My concern is about the perception and concerns about the process involved in the tendering. I know that this policy of privatisation is a significant break with the past, but most people coming to me know and accepted that and prepared for it. They were keen to be part of it and expected, to, um, expected that, based on their high levels of performance, they would be part of the change, and they were looking forward to the challenge. I've been approached by representatives of organisations who were established in the community and working with success rates in excess of 85 per cent. They had tended for contracts at a reasonable rate and have been overlooked. Now, one might argue their prices were too high, but they have advised me they had ascertained that their tendered price was lower than the organisations which gained the contract. They were advised they were not competitive. Since the criteria was not just price, I can only assume that the government managers must, contract managers must have decided they were less able to provide the service or the services than the successful tenderer. Mr Speaker, I am on the record in this place for my defence of the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme. I fought against Labor's plans to abolish it when they were in government, and I lobbied against Minister Vanstone's attempt to stop funding it. It has been one of the most spectacularly successful employment programmes in operation in recent times. Mr Speaker, the NICE programme has been unique in that not only do the participants create their own jobs through the creation and establishment of their own small businesses, but these businesses end up as employers as well. Eight new and additional jobs were created for every ten NICE businesses established. This saved the Commonwealth $65.8 million in unplayed unemployment benefits in 1996-97 alone. I just want to very briefly touch on a letter from the Chairman of the North West Metropolitan Business Centre in Moore to Minister Kemp which has just been sent to him in reflecting on the decisions on the administration of Nice as an example. The decision to award the administration of the Nice scheme on what can only be seen as a cost basis can do nothing but backfire. Without the income generated by the Nice scheme, many business support facilities such as ours, the Business Enterprise Centre and others, will be forced to downsize and in some cases close altogether. This will result in a lack of assistance to business, which in turn will increase the failure rate of businesses and, of course, simply increase the queues at Centrelink. These comments are worrying to me. They are not being made by someone who is driven by a profit motive. The North Metropolitan Business Centre has provided free community services for eight years and have done it very well. They are not part of the unemployment problem. They are part the of the solution and should expired. be listened to by the government. The Honourable Member for Lyons, you've got about half a minute. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, speak tonight to Mr uh, Speaker and congratulations on your, uh, on your position. Uh, the World uh, Coal Shoveling Championships was held in my electorate uh, last weekend. But being and, 8 uh, p.m., regrettably, uh, I must was able to shovel uh, half a ton of the question, the question is that the House should now adjourn. Those with that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning.